And then that was when he got on top of me and held like my mouth open and was just like drooling into my mouth. And I was gagging and like, try, I was like trying to fight him off me, but he's laying on top of me. So I can't, like my limbs are trapped underneath him. Well, in a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted that his relationships have always been consensual. Amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks, are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. Well, in other news, American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of this year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken back in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. And finally, a second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder. That's after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys aged 13 and 14 are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. His family has described him as very kind, caring and always thinking of others. This is GB News across the UK on television, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now it's time for our headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, the show where comedians talk about tomorrow's top news stories while trying not to get sued. I'm Nick Dixon, the People's Host, and I'm joined by two comedians you won't see on Channel 4, which turns out to be a good thing. It's Josh Howey, there he is, relieved, and Cressida Wetton. In a very nice red dress. So, Don't what? what are you oh, yeah, doing? what am I doing? What am I thinking? Have you not learned any lessons? Josh is in a very nice whatever he's wearing. Okay, that's it's completely fine. equal. Thank you very much. Phew. <laughs> Got away with that We're one. Be all right. It's going to be a perfectly <laughs> fine show. Mate. Are we both well, apart from just every, the stress of live TV? I don't find it stressful. Do you find it stressful no, anymore? No, no, it's, it's working with you. Um, <laughs> all right, Fair let's enough. have a quick look at Sunday's front pages then. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse, which, of course, he has denied. The Observer, Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. That's a quote, of course. The Sunday Express, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. The Daily Star has The End Is Nigh, which is to do with skiving off work by citing the apocalypse. And those were your front pages. So we have the big story about Russell Brand, of course, but all we can really give at this stage are the facts. So what are those, Josh? Well, Sunday Times and uh, Channel 4 have sort of joined together to uncover... So, what well, uncovers? So there were some interviews with former people that he was in a relationship with, it seems like. And, um, and yeah, uh, with a bunch of different claims, one of them um, being rape, but uh, someone, a 16 year old who was in a relationship, said he groomed her. And um, this is all between 2006 and 2013. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, there's a lot, it, there's a many, many pages of information. They, I believe the documentary is literally, whilst we were Prepared. here, mm -hmm. the documentary went out, so I haven't seen it yet, but it seems to be somewhat of a Rorschach test to people's reaction to this story. I see what well, you mean. Well, and importantly, he's denied all the allegations, hasn't he? I mean, like, yeah. I saw the video that he put out, um, and he's... He uses his adamant, hands very, very well. Yeah. Absolutely adamant that... He's denied it on his own uh, YouTube channel. All right, so what's the next story? Do you want to do this Liz Trust one? Yeah, uh, Trust to criticise Sunak's 35 billion of overspending since being PM. So I really don't feel like Liz Trust should be just getting involved. I think she should have just sort of sauntered off and take whatever her... Um, 
retirement would be and, and take her pension, pr Prime Minister's pension, for a month's work. Uh, but now she's criticising and basically saying that Sunak, over the two years that he's been Prime Minister, or were expected to be Prime Minister, will have spent £35 billion more. But Tory, other Tories have come out and said, well, if we'd followed some of her plans, like a flat tax, that would have basically cost us £41 billion. Let's just not forget that she cost us about £6 billion just in the few weeks by going with the policies that she did in terms of the, the, what happened to our guilds. So, I... Well, some people don't blame that on her, actually. Some people say it wasn't actually her fault. Some quite economic expert people, I, I don't know. I don't She's know the one who kicked it off, uh, and it was under her watch. She started that policy that then massively Well, some claim that it was already due to... It would already have gone that way from things that the Bank of England had already done. Though everyone seems to agree that she certainly didn't communicate very well, the, the well, budget. Whatever, anyway. anyway. But the point is, why she's getting involved is ridiculous. And also that she's sort of saying, I wouldn't spend any money on anything. I'd do all these cutbacks. <laughs> it's like, well, guess what? Things happen. Like, suddenly we've just discovered, 12 years ago, that uh, there are all these schools that are falling apart and need to be rebuilt and hospitals. And they, the government has to spend money. The question is, how do they spend money? And more importantly than that, do we get good value for it? Yeah, OK. Well, Josh saying that she shouldn't be getting involved, Cassa, but she's got to do something with her time. What, what well, do you think? Sick. Oh, it's, it's like when you go to a comedy club and there's no one there and the promoter says, oh, it was full last week, you should have seen it. It's like, <laughs> it's competing with the dead, isn't it? Um, I don't know. This says it's going to reopen wounds within the Conservative Party, which is just what they need, isn't it? Um, they already seem quite open as well, don't they, at this stage? They do, so I don't know. I don't know what difference. This isn't her trying to stage a comeback, is it? No, no, I mean, she, she's just sort of in, she's involved with this sort of growth group, so her thing is always to talk about growth and a more Thatcherite approach. And the crit criticism of Sunak is always that he spends too much, but then he says, well, I'm just being fiscally conservative, and you look all unrealistic. And that's basically the debate. Probably yeah. done enough on that. Let's move on to the. Let's go back to Russell Brand. <laughs> let's, do the, uh, let's do the Observer question. Uh, Labour wants new EU links in a reset of British foreign policy. Uh, so. Ties with Europe are a top priority, says uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy. Well, we sort of know that, don't we? Um, that that Labour would like to uh, have more to do with Europe. Um, he's suggesting regular meetings, uh, and he thinks that the international community wants us back. They're missing yeah. us. Do you think Lammy's going rogue here? Because Lammy said closer links with the EU are the number one goal, as you say. But this was before the election. Do you think Starmer's like, wait till after the election to tell them we're going back in well, the EU, he, David? He's been very, very clear here. They're not, we're not talking not. about about joining the EU. And all the way through the whole referendum and Brexit and all of that side, everyone, all the Brexiteers have been very clear. We're not saying that we don't like Europe. We're not saying we don't want to be friends of Europe. So it makes sense to... We're not part of Europe. We're not going to rejoin the EU. But we certainly should have good, strong ties with our closest economic partner. And that's all he's saying. Economic, uh, security and various other things. There's sure. nothing wrong with that. As he says here, what, what kind of Britain are we? Are we the Britain, this little England looking inwards? Or are we part of... Uh, Global stuff. Well, we're trying to sort things out with India, aren't we? We're busy. We've got lots, yeah, good of, old India. lots of meetings to have. Yeah. At but, the but moment. Be, let's be very honest, though. Do you think he will try and rejoin? Maybe, maybe it's over 10 years. Because a lot of people in the what I call the extended blob, uh, people I speak to in various positions, I won't reveal, but they, 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 a lot of people believe, hardcore Remainers believe that he will take us back. And it's their religious it's, narrative. It's, it's wishful will, thinking. They, you think they, so? they, absolutely. They won't. They know it's a toxic issue. It's happened now. Best we can do is make the best of it. No one, the talk we certainly haven't been able to do that. Let's get Labour in there and see if they can at least mend some fences, get some economic back and flow, and get back to some level of what we were before, if, without the EU controlling us. Over the long term, I can see the argument. I can see the argument of Labour saying, look, it didn't work. We're the people that got you back in. Meanwhile, the EU can say, look how badly they did without us. And, and then yeah, they but can we never go. We never get offered the same. We had, the deal that we had was yeah, phenomenal. Maybe so we never, we never get that. One day we I'm not saying I want this. This is what I think will happen. OK, well, let's move on and have a look at the Express. Them. Yeah, uh, Russell Brand denies rape. Oh, no, not that one. Okay. Uh, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. Patients forced to spend life savings to avoid record weight for treatment. Now, this is, of course, damning, damning to the Tory government that's been in control now for 13 years. Uh, having a million people basically going, having to go to private health care when they have paid into a system through their lives, paid into the NHS. Because they, because the queues are, are too long, people are waiting up to a year. I think is is disgusting. But there uh, is that. Sorry, there's, there is that argument that if you try to stop private, all you do is actually punish the NHS. You know what I mean? Because it's probably better to accept. I'm not saying that we need to stop the private, right. but I'm just saying the fact that it's got to this kind of situation yeah. is is ridiculous. What do you think, Christina? Well, yeah, exactly. It, it illustrates the point that we've had time and time again on this show, doesn't it? The, every, the waiting lists are longer. 
And, and also, you know, we've, it's this thing about the ageing population, isn't it? We've got more technology to fix more things, so the budget is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more old people to spend it on. And people aren't always looking after their health. Mm. So mm. We've got an obesity. Actually, solution. You sound like you went a bit conservative there, Cressy. You were saying the solution is personal responsibility, I could hear. No, you saw well, I thought you yeah. were sounding like Logan's Run. <laughs> you just want to, people get to 39 or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they need to be killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, right. That would be. We've agreed she's going pretty far, right? Can I just say. <laughs> far right. I'm saying. Can I say, Chris, that's a beautiful dress? <laughs> And a great, uh, whatever Josh is wearing, the suit, the shirt. Um, OK, well, let's get to the really important story tonight. What have the star gone with, Cressida? Workers skiving off in fear of the apocalypse. Um, obviously, I work with Lewis Schaefer, so I thought that was quite a reasonable position um, to take. Mm. Uh, but no, apparently, apparently people, youngsters specifically... Oh, youngsters. Uh, the youngsters, uh, they're staying home because they fear the end of the world. I've had enough of these youngsters, Josh. I don't know about these <laughs> climbing off work, uh, throwdowns. What are they up to, these Generation Zs? Well, that's it, Zs. They're scared of zombies, they're scared of whatever, mental they health scared issues of zombies, and wellness. Yeah. It is a great new excuse. I have heard it. We did a story on eco-anxiety, didn't we? And mm. they're all scared about the environment, which makes sense, because the fear's been drilled into them relentlessly by yes. the mainstream media. But zombie anxiety is a, is a new one on it's me. It's a new one, yeah. But, I mean, first of all, it's good that they have jobs. Maybe this is a good way of keeping people at home. And maybe also it's a positive sign that people are more religious, that they believe in the apocalypse. Why would you want to keep people at home? Well, I wouldn't like to, but, you know, your lot always going on about it, innit? The 15-minute no, cities no. and whatnot. No, that's not my lot. No, no, oh, but, like, oh. the, the dangers of it or oh, that, that uh, people okay, are pushing. Yeah. OK, I, was yeah. I knew I was being insulted, but I couldn't figure out how <laughs> for a second there. All right, well, that's the Daily Star. I mean, I think we've got, given that on probably enough time. That is pretty much it for part one. But coming up, well-managed dogs and poorly managed borders. See you in two minutes. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with Josh Howey and Cresta Wetton. All very glad we're on GB News and not Channel 4. It's the best place to be. So let's continue with our stories. And the eye has amnesty will let owners keep well-managed American bully dogs. But do we really need well-managed owners, Josh? I've heard that's the debate. Is it the owners? No, it's not the owners. It's the dogs, because it yes. turns out... Let me read the headline. American XL bully ban... Chief Vet says Amnesty will let owners keep well-managed dogs. Now, this is... There's going to be a year um, amnesty period, basically, where during that time, if you have a dog and you treat it well, and it's well-treated and behaves well, it, 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 you can get it neutered and muzzled, and then it'll be fine. After that, um, it's... it's go but I say that out-of-control dogs obviously should be... Well, out-of-control dogs should be killed now. But um, I, I just don't know why they're waiting the year. But the point is that they're saying that 50% of all the dogs in this country come from a dog called Killer Kimbo, who was so inbred and it had li was linked to... And, and its offspring are linked to multiple deaths. There's just no need for this I dog. I completely that... disagree. I think this is such a sensible it's thing. It's killed ten, do 10 people in this yes, country in the last they're year. they're not saying, let's have this dog running around the public. They're saying... Because a lot of these dogs will be beloved family members. Don't pets. care. Well, I mean, this beloved is an violent excellent... family members. Yeah. I think this is a really good solution, because it gives the people that genuinely want to look after their pet a bit of time to get it neutered, so I guess it means it's the end of the breed, but nobody's going to be heartbroken in trying to tell their seven-year-old the dog's gone to a farm in the sky. Um, it's... I mean, it, and I love regulation around pets, right, because dogs are a luxury product. You know, some of these dogs cost a fortune, so if you can afford to have a dog, you can afford to look after it properly. And when you get regulation, you get the end to what we call greeders, who... those us that like dogs, breeders that are breeding for money. Mm. I think this is great. It gives it it's giving it a bit of exit time and, and then. So kill them all now. Yeah, you're, so you're full coal now, and Cluster is like amnesty period of a year, which is what they're saying, then an outright ban. That does seem reasonable. Yeah, that's reasonable. I'd say, I don't care. I'd just kill them all. And, okay. and five children, yeah, and all lovely stuff. But some people are very emotionally dependent on their pets. And the idea that you just take them away, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit much, isn't it, to take away a well behaved. I, don't, I can't understand why people bought these dogs in the first place. Yeah. They're killer dogs, literally. It Makes is, yeah. no they're sense. They're not, though, are they? On, for the most well, they are part. literally. This, and they're from killer dog. Uh, killer, killer Kimbo. Killer Kimbo. He was a killer. Killer it's in Kimbo. The name. But yeah, no, it, 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 I mean, I do see the point. And some people are squeamish about sort of government involvement, but there is a libertarian yeah. case for it, which is you're not supposed to harm other people. And, you know, even with your freedom can't encroach upon other people's freedoms. Yeah. So the freedom to own a dangerous dog obviously encroaches if, if it's hurting and killing people. Of course, yeah. of course. And, and these dogs that are in... I mean, I've watched some of the clips, cos I sort of made myself, cos I'm a bit sort of, oh, I can't imagine. And I watch them and, OK, yeah, I mean, the dogs come from nowhere. I totally accept that. Um, I'm not saying it can't be dangerous. Yeah. And I think muzzles in public is a great idea. Yeah. Why yeah. don't we just get into that culturally? It's a brilliant idea. Muzzles for people, in well... some cases. Some <laughs> of the people yeah. attack us yeah, on yeah. Twitter. And I, but I like that dress. Muzzle them. <laughs> and it's a nice uh, jacket. So, Thank you. Thank you. That, let's leave the <laughs> Telegraph them. And Labour's private school's tax raid will make education more elitist. Doesn't it sound like Starmer's Labour, Cressida? Um, no, it doesn't, does it? Uh, <laughs> Labour's private schools tax raid will make education more elitist. Um, so Starmer's talking about adding VAT, basically, to private school fees, which would raise £1.6 and he's saying he can put that into state education. So he's mm. robbing the rich to pay the poor. Um, but, of course, all the schools are panicking and saying, no, don't do that, we'll lose all our pupils. Everyone will, or some people will leave. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know... I, I suppose the point is that the, the really elite people won't leave however expensive it is. In fact, they'll probably quite like it if it gets a bit more expensive. Ooh, um, yeah, good point. And that's yeah. it. And these people aren't necessarily rich. They're not fabulously wealthy, as it says here. It puts more pressure on comprehensives. I mean, a lot of things Labour have done have been well-intentioned but been disasters. Like, for example, the whole comprehensive school project that replaced the grammars was done by lefties. One of them was a Communist Party member. And it was... A, it, it's, it's, I wish the grammar schools had never been destroyed, but, hey, I've always gone about that. What do you think of this, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a strange hill for... He's not... It's not that he's dying on it as such, but... To I just think neon. To really... Yeah, to, to fight for, because he's also saying, but I really support independent schools and what you do, but arguably it will harm them. But then at the same time, some of the fees, if they're 6,000... If you can afford £6,000 a year, imagine you can afford seven and a half or whatever the difference would be. Um, so I, I think it's like, I'm not going to feel... You're either wealthy or you're very wealthy. Mm. And well, I'm he's not, talking I about can't... the people in the, in the seam, isn't it? Yeah, Whenever you but raise they're, a price they're wealthy. A... They're, you know, if you've got that kind of... Uh, some of these schools are £13,000 a year or something. If you've got spare thirteen k a year, 
and you've got to pay 15 I've instead. Got, I've got that, but that's because I have no children, so that's <laughs> yeah, the paradox. That's, that, there we go. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it, they need money from somewhere, and it's an easy win for Labour because it's private schools, and yeah. someone hears that on the Labour side and goes, yeah, private schools, let's take that money. But it is, it's a contradictory message. I don't think it's the fi finest movement. I don't think it's going to solve the country, so I, they, and it'll get a lot more publicity than it should. Um, and I think there are a lot of things that need to be fixed before that. OK, yeah. they should run with that slogan, Labour, solve the country. But yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't think they will either. But um, OK, let's do the Times then. And the number of benefit claimants too ill to work has passed a million. Why couldn't just one of those been Lewis Schaefer, John? <laughs> just one of the million. <laughs> not saying I want him to get ill, I'm just saying... I just want him to not be around me. Just kidding, Lewis, really? we love you. Um, really? I, I, love, um, I, love, I love his dresses. He's brilliant. Uh, number of benefit claimants too ill uh, to work past a million. Uh, it's jumped 300,000 in a year. So this is quite interesting because if you are unable to work, and there are some very serious conditions as to why you wouldn't be able to work, which are things like incontinence, um, and uh, not being able to be around people and mental health issues and whatever. Now, some of them are obviously medical, some of them might be. And this is, this is the interesting part, is the government seem very unwilling to get, call them skivers or anything. But the fact is that if you have this inability to work, or you, and 80% of people who go for this claim get it, you get double the amount of money. So there is a yeah. massive financial incentive to go down that route. But like I said, the government's been very clear that they're, they're trying to be like, no, it's not about strivers and whatnot. We're just but trying to halving get... halving your income would give you a mental health problem, wouldn't it? I think that's that a would. fair... But what they're, so what they're trying to do instead is, is sort of say, no, we don't think you're strivers, but, you know, you could work from home. You could do... I think that's yeah. how this, the problem yeah. started, sending everybody home for two years. Well, yeah. Lockdown, drinking more, not running around. Not, I mean, no wonder everyone's got depression. And their solution is work from home, which is... Yeah, I would never call them skivers. They're scroungers is the word. It's scroungers, <laughs> everyone knows. No, I mean, look, I, I know what the benefit system's like, and it's terrible. It, the, the problem is, it is a perverse incentive, as you said. They should just make work pay. No-one's been able to crack it, ever, how to just make work pay. There was a scheme Labour had at one point where you got paid... For the first year you return to work, you still got your benefits, and that was scrapped. Mm. Because when you're going to punish people, if, if people are in a tough situation, then they're in a kind of survival situation, of course they're going to choose what gives them the most money. It's not reasonable to expect people to go for less money. But the, but the only thing, to give the other side, I am a bit suspicious that it's, it's so many people. Can mm. that many people really be ill suddenly? That's the question. I don't well, know, but the lockdowns can't have helped, can yeah, they? But, Adding uh, body weight to people and... Yeah, no, absolutely. And what, but they, it's very clear, they, they don't know what, what these extra people are ill from. Particularly, long is, is it that they've expanded the definition of mental health illness, or is it, or is it actual physical illnesses? Well, it includes. Well, it actually both says of us. they don't know. <laughs> They don't okay. know, yeah. They oh. don't know they don't is know. the answer. But they've got to stop. Yeah, but they, I do sympathise with people on the benefits trap. Let's do another one in the Times and Labour are doing a deal with the EU on free movement. I feel like we've been here before, Cressida. <laughs> Labour would bring child refugees to be with family. So Labour are suggesting that they would offer to resettle child refugees in the EU with families in the UK as part of a migrant returns deal. Um, but Yvette Cooper is specifically saying we are not proposing joining the EU's asylum quota scheme. Because mm. um, I think we'd be looking at 120,000 people then. Yeah. And that's not good. Yes, um, and they're not looking at doing that. Now, what um, people have said is it's similar to the Dublin Convention. And actually, Darren was talking on this channel earlier tonight about the Dublin Convention. Apparently, we tried to get about 8,500 people, more than that, over to the EU. They took 105, while we took almost 900. So the, the argument is we're going to get into another similar mess like that where we actually can't get rid of people. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, conversing very small numbers, really, here. The two big things that you take from the story is, first of all, that, that as, as opposed to the Tories going, that means we're getting 100,000 people coming over. That's just not true. As they, as the Labour said, that's just a lie. What they are talking about, and I think there's actually a clever idea, is particularly children who have family members over here being able to come over here and then allow some kind of reciprocal relationship. And the reason why that is good is because if they have family here already, it's going to cost taxpayers less. They're going to have homes set up for them. They're going to have a certain amount of support already built into because mm -hmm. of coming through their family. That makes sense. I'd rather take people who have connections to this country already and send back the people who don't, who we're having to pay for everything, that but makes more you, financial sense to me. How are you picking out the people that are going back? Well, that's not my job, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... Where, I'm going to get Leo Curse. <laughs> He's just going to get there and point at people. He would love that. Where yeah. does this uh, 120,000 figure come from, then, when it says it will require some member states to resell up to 120,000 migrants from elsewhere in Europe? Tories. 
by the time. <laughs> so where are they getting it from? Are you saying it's like a side of the bus? Well, they're NHS looking at thing? existing EU policies, whatever, but that's not what Labour's talking about signing up to. Okay. They're talking about this very specific thing. So Do you trust that, Cressida? Because I think this is Josh, well, Josh Labour mean... propaganda a little bit. I'm <laughs> no. not sure. It might, it might, well, that's what the article... Right, I'm just saying what the article says. OK. Yes. Well, but the Times is the also facts. Josh propaganda. It's all... It's all pop OK, everyone's no, propaganda. I'm just both sides. OK, but I, I, I didn't know where the 120,000 came from. But OK, I think we've... I think there was quite an adult discussion on that one, which is good. Okay. Let's do the I. And Iranian women are continuing to defy the hijab rule, Josh. Yeah, we won't back down. Iranian women defy the hijab rule despite arrests, beatings and rape. Uh, it's been a year since um, Nadar, uh, f uh, the, the Kurdish Iranian woman, she took off her um, uh, hijab yeah. and she was murdered, uh, then inspiring uh, a lot of protests and bravery from women in Iran. And even though those protests, even though the, 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 the onslaught that they've received from uh, their government, they are still fighting and they are still protesting. And it's incredibly inspiring. And um, It's really moving, isn't it? Yeah. Hearing some of the... And, you know, like, she, she's talking about taking off her hijab and walking down the street and the fear that she felt. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I remember when I started to say I'm not wearing a face mask anymore. And I felt very self-conscious on the tube, you know, in the beginning when it was kind of just kicking off. And, I mean, that's nothing, is it, in comparison? I'm not going to get put in prison and, and attacked for it. Um, and, and it's eventually... nasty looks in Sainsbury's. Well, exactly, mm. exactly. That's about the limit of it. And she says, you know, we, we felt fear, but we've no other choice. And I, I just think it's really moving and we've got a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. The only thing I've never understood is this is obviously brave, but that weird thing where people say the hijab in the West is uh, is celebrating diversity and multiculturalism, it's great, but over here it's obviously bad. I mean, it's pretty much... Isn't it the same everywhere, or is it context-dependent? No, it's context, isn't it? It okay. depends. Well, they have a choice. I guess it's about choice, isn't it? Yes, and over there they don't thing. have a choice. And I say, sorry, it was Mahasa Gina Amini, that was a woman who was killed and, yeah. and started all of this, and just uh, respect to these women, some of the bravest women in the world. Absolutely. That is it for part two. But coming up, mothers are erased, women Women force their way into male spaces, and a comedian is forced to make up stories about racism. See you in a minute. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. Those are increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so there will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
the Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wilson, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Sorry. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with The Times and a radical new plan to actually catch shoplifters, Cressida. Sounds like it. Uh, scan faces of every shoplifting picture, police told. Uh, so, uh, do they need to do it? I thought all these kids were putting themselves on TikTok when they were shoplifting. Um. Can't you just download that? Um, but anyway, police have been told uh, to scan every shoplifting CCTV image reported to them um, because only one in seven uh, shoplifting uh, occasions are, are being charged at the moment. So, the, the, this is the drive to investigate more crime. Um, but yeah. wouldn't you have thought that this is what they do anyway? If you had any images of, of yeah. this suspect... It's weird, isn't it? We've yeah. sort of been just letting people get away with shoplifting. Two-thirds of cases are thrown out. And then now we're going the other way, and we're just going to scan everyone's face. It's like, isn't it a happy medium? But, yeah, we already have so many cameras anyway. Yeah. I mean, what so do you think? One they use to do something with it. Yeah, sorry, police is charging someone with 4.5% of these cases. So... Uh... Well, were you going to say Cumbria managed 24%? Hey! Come on, in. Yeah. Wow. Winning again. Uh, but, again, number one is, <laughs> why is this not already in place and secondly you know why has it taken so long to even just get to this point discuss it it seems like a no-brainer of course that's what you would do is you would have these things we have all this technology now of course I appreciate there are freedom concerns um, and privacy concerns uh, but at the same time these are criminals it's usually comes down to a handful in terms exactly. of committing 90% so of these crimes a database it yeah. might help and the thing about the face is, I don't like having my face scanned when I'm in the supermarket because I haven't done anything wrong yet. Right. That's the thing. Yes. Do. Why do you say yes? Well, because who knows? Um, oh, no, yeah. but I'm not planning to. But I, yeah, these people, I mean, come on, don't you give up your right to privacy when you nick people's stuff? That's the thing. You yeah. feel it's this kind of a narco tyranny people talk about. The innocent citizen feels constantly harassed and punished. Those mm. ridiculous cameras. Yeah, they shouldn't really have a camera when you're just buying your stuff. I don't know what that's all about. Just, they shouldn't be able to do that. But then again, we, like you said, we, London's one of the most surveilled places in the world, and yet we're not managing to get any, any yeah. shoplifters. And the, the other weird thing is now, is you, you've seen these scenes in sort of South San Francisco and places like this. 
people just looting the entire store. Yeah. And now, as we saw with this recent case, if you do anything, the, you, you get in trouble for it. The, the shopkeeper gets in trouble. There's been a few cases where shopkeepers have rebelled, and mm. then they're the ones that get in trouble and told they've overreacted. Yeah, no, it's crazy. And yesterday we did a story about the uh, the Iceland boss who said that they weren't allowed to share. Normally, that's what they used to do. They would have like a billboard of photos and say, watch out for this person. And now they're supposedly yeah. are not allowed to do that because of these privacy concerns. It seems ridiculous. They're criminals. I'm from a small town and we used to do, not we, not me, but the pub landlords, if you were a badly behaved person in the pub, they'd bob you, which means behave will be banned. And all the landlords would have access to these photos and you couldn't drink in any of the local pubs. Unless you were wearing a very bright dress. Yes. Um, I take back what I said about dress, but I've learned and grown since then. It was, uh, I've changed as a person, it was wrong. You said I was being sexist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but I've learned and changed and grown since 10 minutes ago. All right, yeah. let's do the Times. And the last male safe space is about to be violated, Josh. Yeah, the law that could get women into the Garrett Club after 98 years. So, because within their founding document it says something like, he must, if someone must, he must be proposed by another member, a lawyer who, who's obviously a member there has sort of said, well, it lays it all out, essentially, and also because uh, part of it is also they calls for gentlemanly accomplishment and scholarship. This member, this lawyer, lawyer member has um, since then, sort of, because it turns out there's some legal thing from 1925 where he could be she within contracts, they've changed their opinion and said, actually, legally, this could open us up to be sued. Um, one of the interesting things to come relating to the whole trans debate is I have come very much pivoted on this thing and think, yeah, there do need to be male, men's spaces. Oh, male spaces. wow, I thought you weren't going to say that. Yeah, I don't think this is about legal loopholes at all. Mm. It's just... It's just a cultural thing, isn't it? Eventually, it probably will... There'll be no more male spaces. And we hear lots about women's spaces, don't we? But I don't think... I don't think, why, I mean, are, why do women want to get into male you know, spaces? I've been thinking that, reading this, I thought, who are these women and why do they want to be in there? Well, no, I mean, they want to be in there because a lot of them, it's, there's con connections, business, a lot of shady dealings or whatever it is, and women want to be part of they that. They think I it's access I think, to power, yes. Yeah, and that's fair enough. There is an argument that male spaces are healthy and men don't want to go into women's spaces with some very high-profile exceptions, but the, mm. these high-profile exceptions become global talking points because mm -hmm. they're so controversial because some creeps want to get into women's spaces. Yeah. But in general, why do we want to get into each other's spaces? Men need to have their own spaces. Yeah. Play football, do whatever it is men do. Yeah. I have a football team. Men need to be... Know. I play football every yeah. week. There's, there's not an official ban on women in the game, but there are no women in the game. That's no, all and, I've just, and there is a difference when women aren't around. That's all it is. But I understand yes. that for women's spaces, obviously, the need is much greater because we are talking about um, sexual assault and safety, yeah, personal yeah. Well, that's space. that's interesting whatever. that you said that about power. I hadn't... I'm so daft, I hadn't made that connection. Well, we had a um, meeting about it, Nick and I, with the other blokes the other day. We did. Uh, yeah. no, but you're, we, you're we absolutely right. To keep you out. Warren yeah. Farrell writes about this. Men need places to go and do men's stuff. Yeah. Thank and you. we're worried about men's mental health until it's inconvenient, aren't we? Yeah. And then it's... And that's yeah. what me and Josh were doing in the cupboard before men's <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's our space. <laughs> when you walked in on us, OK? <laughs> Let's do the telegraph, then. And the General Medical Council has removed all mention of the word mothers from a staff document. So, basically, women should be allowed in men's clubs, and yet they don't exist, Cressida. Is exactly. that right? Exactly. Uh, GMC removes all references to mother from maternity documents. So, yeah, you've pretty much... You've pretty much just said it. And, and the GMC are the General Medical Council and they serve as the independent regulator for doctors and aims to improve medical education and practice across the UK. So that's, that's reassuring, isn't it? They're the people saying that, uh, that we can't use the word mother. They don't want gendered language in these documents. Mm. But the fact is, yeah, sorry. Well, but they're documents about, you know, women's health. About so... particular, yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. A maternity. I mean, only women give birth. That's just a scientific fact. The fact that these documents were changed in May of this year, when arguably the wheel has turned, when other NHS organisations and, and, and other com in companies as well have been criticised and been told off for, make, for exactly. bringing in this kind of language. Timing. It's like. How captured are these institutions that it's still happening when they when other people get exposed when it's on front pages of newspapers and they get criticised and then they still go on and they do it? I know, it's shocking. And we've had it with the menopause. It says the average age for a person to undergo the menopause in the UK is 51, so I look forward to that. Yeah, a person, yeah. But also it does say here people will be affected in different ways. And to be fair, men are definitely affected. We are affected. Uh, but, but it's about men, yet again. Yeah. Husbands. Let's, let's do the yeah. Sunday Telegraph again. And the EHRC... It admits it was wrong about LGBT, Josh. There's a lot of an acronym to know, on here. I did it. Uh, well done. Uh, Trans guidance for teachers was wrong, says Watchdog. So there are two things in this article. The equalities regulator is basically saying, first of all, get on with it. 
Teachers need guidance. Publish what you have, publish what we, they, they advise the government. They said you need to put that out there because it's very confusing for everybody. So that's the first thing they're saying. The second thing that they're saying is that they had previously advised wrong that if you weren't to affirm a child who's basically a boy who says they're now a girl. If, you ha if a teacher hadn't gone down with that, then they could be open to, to discrimination claims under the Equality and Human Rights Act. Turns out that's not true. They've made that very clear now. And that was advice from 2014, but things have changed and there's been a conflation between gender and sex and whatnot. So they've been very clear now um, that, that actually you wouldn't necessarily be open up to these discrimination claims, although you would have to maybe explain why you might be doing it. Yeah, and but what's not clear to me is what the new guidance will be. I'm like saying they need to rush it, it needs to go through, but I'm not quite clear what it will actually be, but it will be not that, but what will it replace it with? Krista, what well, do you I think? Well, I think it might even be that they're going to say you can't, you can't socialise, so, what's the right term? Socially transition. Socially transition at school. So it's actually going to be banned. It's a complete 180, isn't it? That's well, I think I don't I don't think they're going to go that far because there's a bit of infighting amongst the Tories about who's on the right side of history on this matter. Right. But certainly parents should be the people who have control over what's going on here what's with their own me? children. So yeah, this came from the Labour Equalities Act and no one's ever, it's always been in 13 years they haven't undone any of these acts and this idea they want to seems to be a fiction. We want, they might finally before they get out of government do this one thing. Yeah, but this but this one because most of it is actually a, a good act, but it's this it's this conflation of gender and sex because at the time there wasn't this big issue of the Okay. Well, let's quickly before the break do this one. The Mail and a comedian has admitted making up stories of racial discrimination for his Netflix special. Sounds like the race grifter industry needs some, needs some new material, Cressida. Would He's have a... been a good joke if I didn't ruin it, ironically. <laughs> He's an industry all on his own. Uh, comedian Hassan Minaj admits to making up stories of racial discrimination for Netflix special, including daughter's exposure to a white powder. It's mm. pretty dark, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit like the Jesse Smollett uh, case, but it's not quite as serious. He's, yeah. he's just having a laugh. So, essentially, uh, they've, they've looked into some of the claims he makes on stage, and obviously all comedians could embellish the truth. Some, you know, or if you're like a, a one-liner like Tim Vine, presumably it's all made up, isn't no, it? I don't have five kids, so I'm not Jewish. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Yeah. And, like, I mean, yeah, there's comedians like Theo Vaughan, he's very good, I support him on tour, he struggled to follow me. Anyway, he's good, but he obviously is embellishing his stories and you sort of know it's part of the joke. But the problem with this is, some of them are quite serious, They're like about Jared Kushner sitting on a yeah. seat that was reserved for sort of the Saudi delegate or something, but it actually we all didn't happen. No, an imprisoned Saudi activist, but it didn't happen. And, and there's also the element of, is it adding to this racial grievance culture where he's making up instances of racism that didn't happen? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. He's saying that he's been a victim of racism and his excuse is, oh, well, it reveals some emotional truth. But he's talking about being sort of going up to a, um, to a girl on prom night, uh, to a house and her not being there, assuming for ra racist down. reasons. But actually, turns out they were good friends. She'd rejected his advances before that day, so he didn't turn up to us. And also, she was then engaged to an Indian man. So the idea, and it ruined her life because yeah, of her... Yeah, she's been docked. Yeah, docked by this, whatever. So, yeah, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound moral, but uh, look, all comedians embellish and exaggerate and whatnot, but when it's about this kind of very serious stuff and you're holding it out to as truth... Yeah. in today's world, as reflective of today's world. I'm sorry, emotional truth doesn't cut it. Right, yeah, there's definitely a line there. All right, good stuff. That is it for part three. But coming up in the final section, the bravery of Jonathan Ross. Shoplifters film themselves stealing. And can humans survive on Mars? See you in a minute. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get into it with the mail. And Graham Linehan has praised the bravery of Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross for backing his new book, which probably means we can expect their apology in about the next half hour, Josh. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they're going to back down. Graham Linehan praised bravery of the IT crowd, Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross, for backing his new book about being cancelled uh, for criticising trans rights movement. Uh, Graham Linehan is, is in Ireland at the moment, uh, attending the Let Women Speak uh, event uh, with lots of um, anti uh, gender critical people oh, there dumb. protesting them and whatnot, and was asked about this because it's been a big for He released the cover of his book, and on the cover are these two very complimentary quotes from Jonathan Ross and uh, Richard Ayoade. Uh, and uh, am I pronouncing that right? Ayoade, I believe. Ayoade, sorry. Uh, I just know him as Richard. And um, a very nice man. And very funny. And but basically, yeah, that's just kicked off. And as soon as he did that, the, all these sort of trans activists are like, oh, well, he was never funny. Oh, he, he's rubbish. <laughs> I, I can't stand him. And all that. I'm oh, very disappointed and stuff like that. And it's like, what are you doing? But the, but the good thing is that the more that this happens, the more that normal people see this kind of censorious behaviour, this basically this fascistic shutting down, uh, the more and the more it doesn't affect people, like Roshi Murphy, her album going to the top of the charts the two, and whatnot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you know, we're, then, we're then the wheels to that turning. point, aren't we? Yeah. The tipping point. And you can't cancel Jonathan Ross, can you? I've, I've tried. He was semi-cancelled, ironically, about the Russell Brand incident in 2008 when they with the mm. Saxgate thing. But yeah, yeah, but he didn't get cancelled, did he? He's no. here, so he's here. He knows what he's doing. I, I agree. It might be a turning point. It's so interesting because Graham has been treated so appallingly, mm. Mm. but now he might be the hero because he's now is coming around. Big people are praising him, yeah. and he treated some people badly as well, which he's admitted when he was sort of a bit ideological. Mm. But but it's, yeah, he's but sort of a fascinating. It, though, he's become a pivotal yeah. figure in the culture like, war. If yeah. we can have the beginning of people being allowed to apologise and it being accepted, that's quite yeah. revolutionary. I mean, obviously. A lot of people so, know Graham from being on Headliners twice. What was that? They would know Graham Linehan from being on Headliners twice. Yeah, exactly. Twice. That's, what he's, that's his main work. That's his main work. He's also he did, did like some IT, some and, yeah, some other stuff. But being on Headliners <laughs> twice is the big, the big one. That's the pinnacle. Well, well done, Graham, and I look forward to reading that book. Let's do the mirror. And a treasure hunter who's been looking for a gold mine for 23 years says he's getting close. I mean, you'd hope so, Cressida. You would hope years. so. But you'd also hope you wouldn't put it on the internet. Uh, treasure hunter getting close to unearthing mythical lost gold mine worth billions. Um, so this guy, Adam Palmer, for. He's been searching for Slumux Lost Mine in the Canadian wilderness for 23 years. Uh, and he thinks he's getting closer and closer because he's found a sort of an abandoned old gold mine. Um, <laughs> well, that would do it. 
Fair enough. It, might, still <laughs> might, not be, it might not be the one. It could just be a rubbish gold mine that didn't do very well. Oh, I see. Um, okay. He's looking for this particular one that supposedly got nuggets, nuggets. of gold. Big nuggets. Right. Tell, you what, tell you what, it's a gold mine, this story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, but we, we've got to cover it, apparently. Um, Josh, any thoughts on this guy? Does he also believe in a lot less monster, this guy? He, uh, pr probably, but yeah, that's been his life mission. Maybe, maybe he will turn up this gold and everyone will have the last laugh. But, uh, it's a big risk when it's 23 years of your life, isn't it? Yeah, but well. I like it. You get to the end of it, it's the Sunday Mirror, and then you get to the end. Uh, Mr. Palmer's Hunt has been televised for this documentary soon to be released the second season. It's like, oh, so the whole thing was basically an advert. It's a prof piece, it's a yeah. doc, it's a little loud. OK, let's do the mail then. And the police are to start tracing burglars' digital footprints. You can file this on the stuff I thought the police were doing already, Cressida. Yeah. What are they doing? What of course they doing? What are they doing? Uh, High-tech police are on the trail of burglars' digital footprint that they leave behind at the scene, yes. We can't yeah. believe they're not doing this. But it, it turns out officers, uh, they, they've been told to track offenders by tracing the property they steal, such as mobile phones and cars. Oh, my. I mean, we've got a system for that, haven't we? Cars have got number plates. That helps. We can record them. What's your number plate? I'm... Oh, I do have a number plate, but not on a car. Um, oh, okay. Will That's they good. digitally not show up at your house still? I mean, they, <laughs> what's the, I mean, what is this, Josh? Well, what's did done? you know that if you visit a home that has a router, your phone will get picked up and they, the well, information... I know this because I watch lots of true crime stuff oh, on YouTube and, and these people, they murder somebody and then they go and bury them in the woods and, and all the cell phone towers are pinging okay. and that's, it's always how they get... Always caught. turn your... You, hear, you heard it here from headliners first, <laughs> turn your phone off. Yeah. That's, okay. There we go. Of course, Chris, you live at sea, so it cuts off all signal and that's how you escape. Genius. But the other thing is, oh, that now they're going to make it policy where they have to turn up every time to the house. And the other thing is that they, if there is a reasonable lead, because you hear all these things, or you see these things online, sorry, that quick say, um, oh, we have a picture of this guy or someone was on the bell camera or whatever it is, and then the police don't follow up. Now, if you have some tangible evidence for the police to follow, they have to follow it. Okay. Whereas before, they just ignored it. All right, now let's do the mail very quickly. And NASA makes enough oxygen on Mars for humans to survive, brackets for a few hours, Josh. This is huge. This is, this is like mm -hmm. terra terraforming, you know? Uh, you ever see, like, in Aliens, you, they've got those big machines when they arrive on that planet, and it's basically turning in an inhospitable, oxygenless envi oxygen environment and creating oxygen. So now they could do their, their little uh, rover moxie instrument there. It created enough oxygen to, for a human to survive for a few hours. But if they can do this and show it in concept that they take in the, the Mars, nat, the gas, the carbon monoxide, and they turn that into oxygen, that's terraforming, well, essentially. So you've still got to have the stuff, the raw material. Yeah, I you've thought, got to send the stuff, I but thought this still. was big for the Titan subtypes who could go... But that wouldn't work underwater. They need to... Uh... No, but the idea is, the point is you could send these machines on a different scale to these places planets, it would take the indigenous air or whatever, the, the gas, well, gas in the environment, and turn it into oxygen. That's huge. Okay. See amazing. you next year on Mars. And also, there's I, a board game I play called Terraforming Mars, which I love, which is all about this. Sorry, I got very excited. Okay. I just think it's funny nope. that it's such a specific nope. amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But, all right, speaking of a specific amount of time, we have to go. Fair. Great oh. dress, Cresta. We've got to go. <laughs> the show is nearly over, so let's have a quick look at Sunday's front pages again. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse. What do you think about that? He, well, he's, he's <laughs> denied it, of course. The Observer has Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. The Sunday Express has Million Ditch Crisis Hit NHS and Go Private. And the Daily Star with a very important story, The End Is Nigh, which is about skiving off due to the apocalypse. That's it for tonight's show. Thanks to Josh and Cressida. Not Josh all the time, but at times. <laughs> Headline is back tomorrow at 11pm. And if you're watching at 5am, then stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's good night, good morning, and God bless. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night. Two 
to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern Isles, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well, and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good evening, fellow travellers. I am Neil Oliver, and this is live on GB News TV and on radio. As a 19-year-old girl reportedly dies in hospital after being denied the choice of undergoing experimental treatment, what on earth happened to personal sovereignty in the face of the state? Questions over the drug midazolam, used as part of what is called end-of-life care. Many are questioning why their elderly loved ones were administered the drug, particularly during the pandemic. I'm joined by Andrew Bridgen, MP for Reclaim UK, and also by Emma, who believes her dad died 
as a result of midazolam. I'll also be speaking to General Practitioner Dr Malcolm Kendrick in the search for answers. And finally, we'll be talking about an 8,500 year old stilted village dated to many, many millennia before the birth of Christ that's been discovered submerged in a lake near Greece with some remarkable engineering and interesting defence mechanisms. I'll be joined by a professor researching the lost town to learn more about the extraordinary find. All of that and more coming up, but first an update on the latest news from Ray Addison. Thanks, Neil. Our latest stories this hour. The actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse. That's according to a report in The Times. Now, he's denied the allegations and is due to perform in London this evening. Our national reporter, Theo Shikomba, has been outside Wembley Park Theatre. Comedian and actor Russell Brand took to his Twitter or X profile and YouTube where he has millions of subscribers highlighting some letters he's received from the mainstream media. GB News now understands that this was from the Channel 4 programme Dispatches and the Sunday Times which they highlight a number of allegations from four women which allegedly took place between 2006 and 2013 when he was a presenter on Radio 2 and an actor in Hollywood films. Now, he's gone on to say he strenuously denies these allegations and refutes them, but he is due to perform at this theatre in North London this evening, where some are still expecting him to attend. In other news, American XL bully dogs will not be culled. Now, that's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of the year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty will be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. Conservative MP Kit Malthouse told us owners need tougher consequences. They absolutely have to... Uh, deal with uh, irresponsible owners and you know a decade ago or so more we campaigned also for greater consequences for owners the sentencing was raised I mean I think you can get up to 14 years if your dog kills somebody right so we that is absolutely part of the mix but we have to recognize there are certain types of dog that are more capable than others of inflicting harm and damage Meanwhile, a man who was arrested in connection with a fatal dog attack in Staffordshire has been released on conditional bail. Ian Price, who was 52, died after he was attacked by two dogs believed to be XL bullies. Police say a 30-year-old man from the Litchfield area has been interviewed and has been released pending further inquiries. A second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys, aged 13 and 14, are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. Greater Manchester Police have imposed a Section 60 order which gives them greater stop-and-search powers until this evening. Now, police searching for a missing ex-British soldier have been informed by Ukrainian authorities that they found a body. 36-year-old Daniel Burke from South Manchester was reported missing on the 16th of August. His family had not heard from him and believed that he'd travelled to Ukraine. Greater Manchester Police is working to carry out a formal identification and bring his remains back to the UK. Thefts and verbal abuse in shops have increased by 25% over the last 12 months. The Federation of Independent Retailers say the rising cost of living is causing an increase in the shoplifting of everyday products such as tinned food. The group also says social media trends are encouraging young people to post videos of themselves stealing on sites such as TikTok. It comes after the John Lewis boss described rising rates of shoplifting as an epidemic. Well, a man has been arrested in the Royal Mews area next to Buckingham Palace. Scotland Yard saying that officers responded after a person climbed the wall earlier this morning. A 25-year-old was detained outside of the stables. He's been arrested on suspicion of trespassing on a protected site and taken into custody. Police say at no point did the man enter Buckingham Palace. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now let's get straight back to Neil.
She is dead. The girl who wanted to live in defiance of a rare genetic condition. The girl who fought in the end to live in defiance of NHS doctors and a judge who declared and ruled that she should just lie down and die is gone now. We were not and are not allowed to know her name. Her grieving family are still barred by the court that condemned their daughter to death from naming her in public. We have been allowed to know her only as ST, which is coincidentally shorthand for saint. Saints are remembered long after they are gone. This is where we are now. A sovereign individual says she wants to live, asks the state to help her stay alive, makes clear her intention to exercise her God-given free will to seek potentially life-saving treatment elsewhere, Two psychiatrists listened to the 19-year-old while she lived and concluded that she was of sound mind and able to make her own decisions regarding her treatment. Other sovereign individuals stood ready to help the girl to finance her proposed trip to Canada for experimental treatment. Despite all that, in sullen defiance of all that, NHS doctors decided her unwillingness to accept her death was inevitable made her delusional. Everyone's death is inevitable. Are we to accept that each one of us is delusional if we seek to fight death every inch of the way? A judge agreed ST was deluded and the die was cast. Now she is dead, as prescribed by the state. This is where we are now, <clears throat> confronted at every turn by an overmighty, overweening state that has assumed the ultimate power over sovereign individuals. Somewhere along the line, at some point, most of us overlooked, myself included, Sovereign Britain was subverted or otherwise replaced by corporate Britain, in which a board of corporate types assumes the authority to make all decisions on our behalf. I say this is unlawful in every way that matters. It's also monstrous and just plain wrong. Too few people know, remember, far less celebrate what it is to be sovereign. We're not taught any of this at school, which is hardly surprising given the recent context. But the truth is that we are born sovereign, and to be sovereign is to have absolute authority over our own bodies. We are subject to the common law of the land, which we break only when we harm others, damage their property, steal what is not ours, or behave fraudulently in our dealings with others. Every other attempt by the state to interfere with our freedom to go about our lives unmolested is the stuff of statute, which is the legislation, acts and bills drawn up and passed by Parliament. Legislation has power over us only if we consent to it. Rules and regulations defined by statute are said in dictionaries of law to acquire the force of law only, only when we grant our consent a fact of being sovereign is that if we withhold or withdraw our consent, that is the end of the matter. And deep down where the state and all its little wizards would prefer we did not look, the state knows this too. Over and over again, it has been necessary to pull the state up by the scruff of its scrawny neck and remind it of the limits of its power and to have it acknowledge instead the supreme power of the sovereign individual. Magna Carta was the consequence of one of those times when an overmighty king had to be reminded that, like everyone else, he was subject to the law of the land. King John wriggled on that hook, but it was swallowed deep. Parliament would prefer Magna Carta did not exist, but it does exist and always will, and it burns the state like holy water thrown in a demon's face. If the state could destroy Magna Carta, unmake it, then it surely would. The state seeks to dismiss it, to paper over it, to distract us and have us look the other way, to persuade us the Great Charter's power is gone long ago like that of a battery run flat. But deep down, the state knows the law of the land still thrums with power over them. The fact, the inconvenient truth, is that the law of the land is older than Parliament. Magna Carta, which only restated and reaffirmed the ancient common law was sealed before Parliament even existed, and so is literally beyond Parliament's remit. The unwritten constitution for which Magna Carta speaks is likewise out of Parliament's reach. The law of the land just is. We all know without having to be told that it's wrong to kill, to do harm, to steal, to lie. Parliament, government, the state 
are no more and no less than creations of human beings. That which is created by human beings stands beneath human beings, is subordinate to human beings, serves and does not rule human beings. Remember that too when talk turns to artificial intelligence. Nefarious types in the state know the inalienable rights of people are constant as the North Star. Many of the state's minions may have chosen to forget as much. Plenty of Parliament's wizards are, like so many other people, genuinely unaware of the truth of the law. Lack of knowing is of no significance. The truth is the truth, whether it's known or not. Magna Carta was the restating of truth, restating of the common law that by the time of the sealing of that charter was old beyond the reach of memory. The Nuremberg Code, born in the dark shadow of World War II and all its attendant horrors, was another time when some people had to be reminded of that which is true, which is that the individual, every individual, is sovereign, having absolute authority over his or her flesh and blood, and that nothing, nothing at all might be done to a sovereign individual against their will without their consent. The code is primarily for the attention of physicians, and point number one states, quote, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. The Nuremberg Code is not binding in a legal sense, but which decent human being would dispute the thinking and intent at the heart of its matter? How much of the Nuremberg Code was ignored during the Covid debacle? How much is still being ignored while I speak these words? There is much debate over whether or not the state uses what are called legal fictions to gull us into submitting to its legislation. There are those who argue that our birth certificates and the registering of our births are part of a legal process, legal and not lawful by which a corporation is created in each of our names as it appears on our birth certificate and then by the process of the registering of the birth, that corporation is handed off to the state to do with as it pleases. That legal fiction has been described as being like an overcoat tailored by the state and offered to each of us for wearing. If we don the coat, the thinking goes, we unwittingly accept the rules of the game the state is playing. Be that as it may, entertain the speculation about legal fictions and straw men, or don't. But the fact remains that the power of the state, a creation of man, over any of us is only that which any of us consents to give. And yet the 19-year-old girl ST is dead now, without her consent, despite her spoken determination to fight for life. This is where we are now, and this is why I ask whether it's time for the call for change that is described by some as revolution. Last week, I put a couple of lines on social media, wondering if anyone else was thinking about revolution. Last time I checked, each of the messages had been viewed over a million times. I've been contacted by people from all over the West, saying their thoughts chime with mine. I hear especially from Americans looking on in desperation while their country floods from the South with millions of newcomers of unknown provenance and intent. I live in a world of unanswered questions. I want to know the truth of the products pushed as vaccines. I want to know how many people were killed or hurt by those products. I want to know why hundreds more people are dying every day in this country than might have been estimated based on previous years. That's the equivalent of an unexplained passenger plane crash every day. Why are those people dying? I want to know what happened in the care homes into which vulnerable elderly people were herded from their hospital beds. So many died, many alone and in circumstances of abject misery. I want to know exactly how those elders died. I know that many of their loved ones want to know those details too. Yet again, we have plainly reached a point when the state must be reminded who's in charge, which is to say we are in charge, the sovereign individuals of this land. This is where we are now in the West. The state is making no secret of the further powers it would award itself, fantasising about kicking down our doors and stamping on our lives. 
But we are sovereign people in sovereign nations watching the day-by-day -day reality of a corporate takeover of our very existence. Authority over our lives, our way of life, unlawfully assumed by corporations. Corporation, there's another word worth paying attention to. It means to make or fashion into a body, a whole composed of united parts. If a corporation isn't a Frankenstein's monster, that unhappiest of creations and capable of inflicting terrible harm upon those it has come to despise, then I don't know what is. Here's the thing, I have no interest in pitchforks and flaming torches. The killing of people and the destruction of property and infrastructure are the activities of government and the state, and I want no part of that. What I do want is to talk about the need and desire for change felt by millions, many millions, I say every politician who pushed lockdowns, mandates and experimental medical procedures, not to mention the net zero suicide note, might usefully be walked out of the Palace of Westminster and sent home. We're past the time when reform was possible. It's time now for something new, something clean. Is it just me or is there something in the wind? That's just me, of course. You can disagree. Keep your tweets and emails coming through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk and you can tweet me at gbnews and I'll try and get to comments later in the show. I'm joined now by broadcaster and lawyer Andrew Eborn. What do you make of it all, Andrew? Well, it's certainly not just you, Neil, as your um, call to arms, if you like, for let's start a revolution was, was clearly evident. Um, fundamental human right is the right to choose, isn't it? The right to life and, and what happens with that life. And it's always very difficult with the medical profession where we've become a nation of experts, haven't we? Where all of a sudden we're all virologists and we work on that sort of basis. We're all constitutionalists and so on and so forth. The reality is this, we're drowning in a sea of disinformation. And the more, it's a very diseased information age that we're living in. And we're right to question it. And the more that people try to shut down those questions, the more that it festers suspicion. What, what do you think of my f fundamental contention? And I'm not alone in saying it, that the institutions upon which we have depended seem to me so corrupted, so captured by ideology, that they cannot be cleaned out and reformed. And that we have, however difficult, no option but to start again. Yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? I, I, I've spoken beforehand about this, that uh, basically trust comes in on foot and leaves on horseback. And the more you see these institutions basically abusing that trust, the less trust that there is. So we're very suspicious and we have a vacuum of information. Our questions are not being answered. And as a result of it, conspiracy theories are rife. What we need to do is sit down with the experts, uh, and they're different experts all the time, and basically try to get to the basic sort of fundamental answers. I, I I fundamentally question when you evoke the thought of conspiracy theories because it's so pejorative. I fundamentally believe that it is simply people asking legitimate questions, often based on legitimate research. Yeah. And because it runs counter to an official narrative, it's dismissed as conspiracy theory. Yeah. I mean, you could, re you could, you could raise the, the spectre of, of JFK's assassination, which for the longest time was the original, it was the original conspiracy theory that it was, that it, what had happened there was other than the lone shooter. Yeah. And yet, broadly speaking, that is in the public domain. You're, you're, you're <laughs> that you're it so wasn't right. the lone shooter. Yeah. And so conspiracy theory yes. is, is a, is a completely devalued and, and deliberately so, isn't it? So you're, you're turning around, if people want to dismiss an argument, what they do is they rubbish it with words. And you're absolutely right, conspiracy theory demeans whatever argument there might be, and there are legitimate concerns that should be answered. So I think you're right. Let's look at those conspiracy theories and let's rebrand them, if you like, and say, look, if they're genuine concerns, then we should look at it. And I think any question that's unanswered by the relevant experts is, uh, is something we should look at. What do you, and you obviously, you, you, I, raise, I raise openly the, the, the notion of revolution. And people will say, have all sorts of connotations that they attach to that word. But by it, what I mean is that we need something new. 
Do you, do you agree or do you think we can reform what we I, have? I think we need to get trust back with everybody. We need to have sensible discussions. At the moment, what's happening, and people are sort of working in a vacuum where they confirm their own prejudices and people are being alienated on both sides. What we need is sensible discussions where you get the experts in who set out the evidence, as you would do in a court of law, and give us those facts. I'm not a doctor. I don't know the right prescription, the right medication, the right treatment for people. What I do know is that people who have suffered as a result, are not getting the answers they deserve. What you do know is what you want to know. Yes. And I, I you are entitled right. to yeah. have answers yeah. to the questions. We're all entitled to answers. That you are. And we're entitled to question everything. We're on a break already, after which, well, questions about the use of midazolam. I'll be joined by Andrew Bridgen, MP for Reclaim UK, and by a lady who believes her father died after being administered the drug. We'll talk as well at the same time for balance to a GP and we'll all be in search of answers. I'll be back in a moment. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, have you heard of the drug midazolam? Midazolam was and is used as part of what is called end-of-life care. Precisely how and why it was prescribed during the past three years has preoccupied the minds of many people. Those whose loved ones were given midazolam, in care homes especially, want to know more about how and why the decision was taken to prescribe that drug. Joining me now to air the topic is Reclaim UK MP Andrew Bridgen and also Emma, who questions the part played by midazolam in her dad's death. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, if I can come to you first of all, what is it that you are being asked about midazolam and by whom? 
Well, I have concerns, Neil. Um, I'm one of the MPs who voted in 2014 to get rid of the livable care pathways being uh, harmful and, and unsuitable. And in April 2020, uh, Matt Hancock and the NHS authorised NG, NICE Guideline 163, which since then, uh, relatives who've lost their parents and loved ones have come to me and said they believe those guidelines, the prescription of midazolam and morphine, uh, a respiratory suppressant, to people who were already suffering uh, depressed respiration, that it uh, accelerated or caused their death. I held an event in June where 70 bereaved relatives came and a lot of them had a chance to give very harrowing accounts of their experiences of their relatives' end of life in hospital. And uh, the government don't seem to want to talk about it. I, I wrote to the government reasonably, I thought, some reasonable questions. One of them was how many elderly vulnerable people were moved out of hospital into care homes to make way for the expected first wave of COVID patients in early 2020. And how many of those had sadly died within seven days, 14 days, 28 days, 56 days, etc., of A, COVID-19, B, other causes. And the government wrote back and said they don't hold that data. So they ha they're telling me they have no idea who they moved out of hospital and what happened to them. Which seems and extraordinary. Very extraordinary. And Emma's here to tell her story about her father. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I've heard far too many of these stories over the last uh, 12 months. Emma, if I can come to you, what is the story that you would like to be more widely known about your dad? Well, first of all, um, Neil, I'd like to thank you so much for taking this opportunity to have me on. Um, I'm here representing all the people who haven't had a voice so far, and this is the story about my dad. Um, I've written it in note form because it's obviously a very emotional subject for me. Um, he was an extremely fit 83-year-old, 84 when he died, he loved walking, he, he lived for life. Um, he did sport his entire life. The, the year beforehand, we went to the Lake District and we climbed Scarfell, which took us seven hours. Um, that Christmas time, 2019, he outdanced everybody at the community centre. Everybody was just loving it. He, he just had a, such a fantastic afternoon. When it came to looking for a care home in the January, it was really important to us that we sourced um, a, a, a home that could cater for his activity so that he could remain in his walking groups. Um, that, and they assured us that he could. He wanted to remain active and keep on about his daily routines. During his time there, which was 10 months, he inexplicably deteriorated. By the 2nd of December 2020, I went to see him and I was absolutely heartbroken and shocked. I'd seen him three times that year and this time, this man who'd been walking, could outwalk anybody. He was wheeled out in a wheelchair. He was absolutely slumped down with his head just fallen. And he was wheeled towards me and I was sat there and he lifted his head up, which was really difficult. And he saw me, tried to lift his arms. And the assistant manager said, no, Jack, sit down. You know, you're not allowed to hug anybody and wheeled him straight past me. And I was in absolute devastation at that point um, and this this to me was um, it took about 10 months for this to happen and to me this he looked heavily sedated and I made it clear the next day when I rang up I made a complaint and um, I, I said what have you done to him he looks heavily sedated um, I was expecting a call back but I didn't get a call back from anybody um, until his main carer actually gave me a call and I wasn't expecting her. And I got on really well with this particular lady and I really felt that she was trying to tell me something because out of the blue she said, Emma, I really hate to say this, but your dad's very, very ill and he needs to be in hospital and I'm going to be really honest with you, I don't think he's going to make Christmas. Now this was, uh, this was the 4th of December. Um, and I didn't know how to take that bit of news. I mean, it's not the sort of thing that you take lightly, and I don't think it's the sort of thing that she would have said lightly over the telephone if she didn't knew it to be true. Um, she also said it's been a pleasure looking after him and that she'll miss him. He got transferred to a hospital the following day, um, on the 5th of December, but this wasn't even the hospital that he's used to be going to. It was a completely different hospital, 27 miles away, and... The pathway that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later, um, this is where that pathway was created. 
The following week, they wouldn't let me in at all. Um, despite all my efforts, I kept told, I kept being told, no, he's not end of life, he's not dying. But I kept thinking that his carer wouldn't have just said that, you know. Um, they kept, they kept, wouldn't let me come in. And then they kept using this word agitated. He's in for agitation. And I'm like, why do you get sent to hospital with agitation? It just didn't make sense. And they stuck to it over and over. Finally, after about a week of trying to get into with my dad, I spoke to a sympathetic nurse on, by now, this was the 11th of December, who agreed that I could finally come in and see my dad. He said, I think it will be good for you and I think it will be good for him. I was absolutely shocked when I saw him. It, even worse than before. What part do you, at what point do you think med medazolam was playing a part in what was happening with your dad? I didn't know at that point anything. Um, his speech had completely gone. His mouth was covered in blood, his jaw was just rolling around. Um, he had bumps and scratches all over the place where he'd had lots of falls. And that's um, specific with a lot of the, um, those types of medications because they affect your central nervous system. Um, so he'd, he'd had a lot of falls, so he had bumps and scratches, a bit of a broken nose, black eyes. He was in a terrible state. And also 10 kilograms lighter as well. And that would have had a huge effect on the medications that they gave him um, in the next couple of days. Can I just, can I just pause you there? while I bring in the doctor, mm -hmm. you know, because I think it's, I think it's a, a, appropriate that we bring in Dr Malcolm Kendrick, uh, GP. Uh, you know, you're, li you're listening to this, uh, Dr Kendrick. Um, uh, you, uh, can I just, you know, segue, bring, bring in your contribution at, at this point. How, how were elderly people in care homes being treated? You know, were, were GPs readily admitted during the time of lockdown to see patients face to face? Well, a lot of um, doctors didn't go in to see people face to face. I, I worked in a number of care homes and also in working with the elderly and saw approximately, I think, 36 of people that I was involved in did die of what is, was probably COVID. Um, but but uh, yes, quite often and during this situation, um, a lot of people were prescribed things without necessarily being seen by the GP. So so that, that would be the case, yeah. So. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the case that, as one might expect in the case of the care of a loved one, that a GP was intrinsic to that process, that, that, that treatment was being uh, administered by, by people who weren't general practitioners? Well, it would normally, well, saying they didn't go in, they, they would have been uh, communicated with sometimes over Zoom calls or whatever. So there would have been a decision made by a doctor somewhere that, that the patient was approaching end of life um, and that therefore if they could put them on to what are called the end of life medications yeah, must take, that would be a medical decision sorry it must surely take a great deal of wisdom you know to be looking at an, an elderly patient who, who let's say has a respiratory ailment that's making it hard for that person to breathe how do you how would a decision be made about whether or not to treat that person and keep them alive or on the contrary, to prescribe a combination of drugs, including midazolam, which suppress breathing. Yeah, well, the, I mean, these are difficult decisions. They are very tricky things, obviously, because you are at a stage where you're saying to relatives that we believe that, you know, your, your loved one is actually getting worse, is not going to recover, and therefore we need to try and make them as comfortable as possible. You wouldn't necessarily be put on midazolam, you would be it would be what they call a you know a, a drug if if someone did become agitated terribly agitated they would be given midazolam that was the case before covid it's still the case i mean i still see elderly people who reach a point where you think this person is at if you like within days of of probably dying and we withhold withdraw kind of the, the standard treatments but you know the midazolam is is widely it's it's still widely used i mean it is, it is but it's all, always used i mean if someone was being given it months and months before their death uh, that you know obviously i can't comment because i can't because i don't know the case but uh, it, you would be thinking that is probably premature if that was happening um uh, you know and as andrew bridges said well the end of life the liverpool care pathway uh was got rid of but the end of life pathway, which I don't like calling it a pathway because it does sound a bit like you're on a path and it's a conveyor belt and it's almost, it, it, some people did see it that way, unfortunately. The, the basic treatments that are given 
if appropriate, are really just to try and make people as comfortable as possible. Doctor, I have to I have to just get to a break at the moment. After which, we'll all be we'll all be staying here for more of this discussion about midazolam. Uh, so bear with me. Coming back in a couple of minutes. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. Those are increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night. Two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern Isles, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well. And low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. 
Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. We've been talking about midazolam and how it was used uh, in care homes uh, during the time of lockdown. Andrew Bridget, if I can come back to you, what is the key point that you feel needs to be made about this subject at this time? Well, following concerns raised to me by my constituents and others, I've done some digging on this. I spoke to a uh, Professor Sam Ahmedzai, who he worked on the replacement for the Liverpool Care Pathway. It was Nice Guideline 31, and he is now retired. But he raised his concerns as a top palliative care expert about NG163, uh, which was brought in uh, at the beginning of the, the COVID uh, pandemic, that it was dangerous. Um, NG163, say, well, it, it, I've sent you a copy of it. It says, you know, in, in, do not be worried uh, if uh, of this um, use of midazolam and morphine uh, being a respiratory suppressant, even if the patient is already respiratory suppressed. Now, we know from minutes uh, in Hansard of the uh, Health Select Committee meeting in early 2020 that Matt Hancock had already ordered all the midazolam. Um, if it was only being used in normal usage for agitation, you would have had to order a large amount of the antidote, which has to be available, which can completely reverse the effect of midazolam, flamazonil. There was no orders for that. This, this was for end of life. NG163 was replaced by... It was only 24 pages. It was replaced by NICE Guideline 191 in March 2021, which is about 350 pages. And Medaslam is, is hidden uh, in, the, in the detail. There's a lot of questions to be asked about how... And this is still going on today, Neil. And I think anybody who's watching this programme has concerns about what happened to their relatives in care homes or in hospitals during the pandemic. They need to raise these issues with their members of and we need to discuss this openly. There are too many topics at the moment we can't discuss in the mother of all uh, parliament. It's, it's got to be it... right to ask those questions that we Absolutely. said at the top of the show. Um, Dr Malcolm Kendrick, he talked about uh, end of life and so on and so forth, and basically easing that sort of side. To what extent were you consulted and kept informed that that was the pathway? Um, I wasn't informed at all. Um, I, get, I kept getting told that he was agitated. This went on, he, so he went in on the 5th. By the, uh, by the 14th, I was told to come back in because your dad is dying now. Um, um, after being told that he was agitated, he was brought in for agitation, to suddenly he was dying. When I turned up, he was in a side room. He was breathing so heavily, and I had to listen to that for 11, 12 hours. I'm later told that that's actually called air hunger, and it was him, literally, struggling to breathe because of um, the midazolam that he'd been given. Um, when I'd obtained all the hospital records from the care home, the GP and the hospital, um, it turns out that on the 4th of December that he was admitted, the GP had, had actually prescribed 2.5 uh, MGs of midazolam, syringe drivers, and I wasn't told at all. On the 9th, they started administering um, uh, to him, and that went on till the, uh, to the 14th, and that's when he went into a coma, and he started choking at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and I, I pulled the emergency alarm quickly because he'd been breathing so badly. The nurse runs in, uh, runs straight out again, comes back in with a needle, injects him, didn't explain anything, and he died shortly after that. Turns out, from the medical records, it was midazolam and alfentanil. In that, in that, in, yeah, in that the last syringe. injection was alfentanil. So that's midazolam plus and, opioid. And bear in mind, Neil, this is midazolam is the drug that they use on death row to humanely to, kill to sedate yeah. people before. But he was the... agitated. No, no it's, it's, mm. it's, it's the, the lethal Do injection in America. Doctor. Dr Kendrick, you, you, listening to that, it, it, it's, it's impossible to listen to that without feeling emotion. Are, are people right to be concerned and to be asking questions uh, individually and collectively about the, the way in which the elderly were treated in care homes during the pandemic? Well, I, I absolutely and completely believe. I mean, I, I have written and, and, and objected myself to, to the way that patients were... Um, sent out of hospital and into care homes who almost certainly did uh, have uh, have covid and I, I was i was very vocal about this um and i think there was there were not enough staff in a lot of the care homes they, they weren't properly supported uh there, there was much that went on during this time that i do think we should be asking questions about absolutely and i'm certain that there will be individual cases 
um, obviously they have to be looked into, where people were not treated um, as well as they could be. I, I, I don't. I mean, it's always difficult to say this because you sound like you're, you're saying your colleagues didn't treat people properly, but the situation was was very difficult. But does allow when I when I when I if say use it myself, I, I don't really tend to use it myself, but it's one of the drugs for the end of life. It would normally be someone who is it would rarely be causing their breathing difficulty, although in some cases, obviously, it can and could. Uh, I think calling it a drug used in death row is, is kind of sort of ridiculous because, yes, if you prescribe too much of anything, you're going to kill somebody with but, but no, um, but none, it. But nonetheless, but nonetheless that, is is, that is another context in which that particular product is, is used. Th thank you, I mean, thank you, Dr Kendrick. But, Emma, you're the heart of the story here tonight, mm. obviously. What, where do you go from here? And what question do you continue to demand an answer well, for? Well, after I'd found out that he'd been on midazolam and alfentanil, and that was the last things that he had that, that killed him, and I saw him suffer, rapidly trying to breathe and choking, it was horrendous. The next document that I found was this, and this is called The Use of Appropriate Chemical Restraint in the Management of Agitated Patients on General Wards and in Accident and Emergency. Within this document, it turns out, and this is my, my father's, this was made for my father, made in 2017, renewal 2020, November, three years before his death day, and he was put on what's called a rapid tranquilization pathway. Can you hear how horrendous that sounds? Rapid tranquilization. Now, when I equate that to what happened during lockdown and how quickly he deteriorated, that makes total sense to me. But he, and we didn't even know about his kidney situation until a year later than 2017. Why was my dad put on? This pathway, and this pathway is literally the same as um, uh, NG163 and the abolished Liverpool Care pathway. Emma, the, the question that you ask has to be left hanging in the air. I don't think any of us are able to answer it. But, but thank you so much for, for coming forward with this. Andrew, again, thank you for, for airing this important topic. And, and, and Andrew as well. I'm sorry I haven't been able to, to come with you, but we'll be back in a moment for the final story of the night. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. It's been a very uh, uh, emotional uh, conversation that we've been having here about Midazolam. Uh, uh, Andrew's still with me. Andrew, um, what do you what do you make of that testimony? Well, I, I thought Dr Kendrick was very measured. I, I was expecting a big fight between Andrew and Dr Kendrick. There wasn't. Um, begs all sorts of questions. And what, what I love about, say, as you started the show, we sort of turned around and said, look, I don't understand what the procedure is at the moment. We talk about end of life. And basically, doctors are there to do no harm. Um, but we need to know what the procedure is. What I found shocking, and genuinely shocking, is that Emma sat there and I said, to what extent did you know what was going on or were you given, asked to give consent? And she said she wasn't told at all. And all that happened is she went to see her relatives slumped over and it was going on for a very long period of time. That lack of communication has obviously created all sorts of issues along the lines. And what I love about this show is we, we try to shine more light mm -hmm. and less heat on the topics. But to do that, we need to continue the discussion. Let's make sure we have further conversations with Dr Kendrick, because I thought he was very amenable to say, let's listen to this. He admitted yes. not everything had been done perfectly. Yes. And let's work out what those problems are. Part of the problem is communication. Yes. We need to know in what circumstances this was prescribed and what happens as a result. What, what I find very frustrating and I felt that um, Andrew Bridgen uh, articulated the same frustration that I feel, that he's obviously being spoken to by many people who have simply got concerns, yes. to, to, put, uh, you know, to put it mildly, and that there has been an abiding atmosphere in which, oh, don't talk about certain things, including the use and, and uh, uh, potentially the misuse of midazolam. But it, it's a subject that has to be aired. Absolutely. And, and there's Emma sitting there, one amongst, I don't know how many, Andrew talked about 70 people that yeah. came to an event. That needs to be put out into the sunlight where uh, people can discuss it. Uh, with, without a doubt. And we, we always talk, we get numbed by statistics. But when you personify tragedy, that's when people sit up and take notice. And I think... Uh, being brave and talking about her own personal journey and this tragic circumstance when she lost her own father um, brings it all to light. And I think those questions, what we need to do is continue examining that. And the trouble is when you start clouding it in emotive words, I mean, yes. Andrew has brought in all sorts of comparisons in the past which got him into trouble. I think the reality is we need to ask the questions without that emotive language. If we can shine the light and say, look, this is very logical, help us make informed decisions, but yes. tell us these procedures, then we're going to be able to make informed decisions accordingly. And it's, it's perhaps one of the most um, emotive subjects for people and one of the most desperate experiences for so many people that their, their loved ones in the most vulnerable of circumstances were out of their reach. Yeah. This, Emma and others found themselves in situations where they knew that their loved ones were, were struggling yeah. and weren't able to be with them. Yeah. And that's a story that repeated and repeated yeah. and repeated with or without the, the, the presence and, and of, it of emphasizes the grief and accentuates that as well. And uh, in all due respect to the medical professionals, I'm sure that they want to do their best and trying to work out what is the way that they can do that. But we need to get clarity on both sides. There needs to be much better communication to make that make sense. Yes. Where do you think we need to go now as a as a as a community? I think we need to have rational discussions in the way that we have. Let's not the war, jaw, jaw, not war, war. And people just accusing each other doesn't really help. What we need to do is make sure we improve communications on that sort of premise. I find it a huge relief. You know, I feel that that word midazolam is out there. And yes. I feel a great relief in it, in it having been spoken tonight. But 
once again, Andrew, we have run out of time. That is it from me this evening. Uh, thanks, uh, obviously, to my guests, Andrew Bridgen, MP for Reclaim UK, to Emma, who spoke so emotively and so movingly about her dad, to Dr Malcolm Kendrick, and, of course, to Andrew Eborn for that insightful consideration. Next up, it's the Common Sense Crusade, and I will see you next Saturday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so there will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside, from Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation, it's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. 
is the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's Saturday night and this is the Saturday Five. I'm Darren Grimes along with Albie Ammon Corner, Emily Carver, Benjamin Butterworth and Leo Curse. Tonight on the show, forget the XL bully, Starmer wants us to be Brussels lapdog. People crying racist about the Peckham hair shop incident are totally wrong. I find, found myself in support, in agreement with the union leader of the GMB. Why pensioners demanding triple lock pension payouts are immoral. Banning XL bullies is just racism for doggies. It's 8pm and this is the Saturday Five. Welcome to the Saturday Five. We may be out of control and dangerous, but no one is muzzling us here. So you can expect your usual hour of forthright debate. I'm here with Albia, Emily and Benjamin as usual, and tonight we'll be discussing shocking news that has shaken the world of comedy to its foundations. Yes, that's right, Leo Curse is back on the Saturday Five. <laughs> <laughs> now, the premise of the show is simple. Each of us gets around 60 seconds to outline our argument about any chosen topic, then we all pile in and it falls apart faster than Labour's plan to tackle small boats. <laughs> and of course we want to know your views as well. Please do get in touch by emailing gbviews at gbnews.com. But before we start rubbishing Benjamin, um, I mean openly debating <laughs> the big issues of the day, it is your Saturday Night News with Ray Addison. Thank you and good evening. Our top story, the actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse, according to a report in The Times. The alleged incidents against four women reportedly took place between 2006 and 2013. That was while he was a presenter on BBC Radio 2, Channel 4 and a Hollywood actor. The identities of the women who do not know each other have not been revealed by the paper. In a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted his relationships have always been consensual. Amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. 
These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of this year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. Well, meanwhile, a man who was arrested in connection with a fatal dog attack in Staffordshire has been released on conditional bail. Ian Price, who was 52, died after he was attacked by two dogs believed to be XL bullies. Police say a 30-year-old man from the Litchfield area has been interviewed and has been released pending further inquiries. A second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys aged 13 and 14 are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. In response, Greater Manchester Police imposed a Section 60 order which temporarily gave them greater stop and search powers. And police searching for a missing ex-British soldier have been informed by Ukrainian authorities that they have found a body. 36-year-old Daniel Burke from South Manchester was reported missing on the 16th of August. His family had not heard from him and believed that he travelled to Ukraine. Foreign Office spokesperson say they're supporting the family. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get back to the Saturday Five. Thanks, Ray. It's Saturday night. You are with the Saturday Five. I'm Emily Carver. And you need to forget about the Rugby World Cup and scrum down with us for an hour as we debate all the week's big talking points. So let's crack on. Now, we're going to kick off with grime time and not having discussed it much in the past, Darren thought our wonderful viewers might like to get his take on migration. <laughs> off you go, Darren. Yes, that's right, ladies and gents. Brace yourselves. Sir Keir fence-sitter Starmer has finally made a move. He's dismounted his splintered backside to grace us with Labour's so-called master plan to halt the migrant boats. And who's by his side? None other than Yvette Refugees Welcome, just not in my house, Cooper. Now hold on to your hats because you won't believe this. They want to resurrect a Dublin Convention style deal with Brussels. The good old family reunion scheme where asylum seekers ping pong between Britain and the EU like a bureaucratic game of hot potato. But let's rewind to 2020, shall we? Under that same Dublin Convention, Britain tried to offload a whopping 8,502 illegal migrants back to EU countries. And guess how many Brussels accepted? A measly 105. Meanwhile, I'm sure you can guess this next bit, Soft Touch Britain, the world's most generous doormat, rolled out the red carpet for 882 asylum seekers from the EU. So let's get this absolutely straight. I didn't vote leave and campaign for it for Sir Wishy-Washy Keith to drag us back into the EU's bureaucratic quagmire. If this is Labour's grand idea, then I've got a bridge to sell you, and it's not the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> Frankly, I don't want my country to become a dumping ground for any <clears throat> boat migrants. You heard that right, any. What planet is Starmer living on with a housing crisis, with a healthcare crisis, with an education crisis, and this clown wants to make them worse? Wake up. Britain, Starmer's offering empty promises and red tape, all designed to make us Brussels' obedient lapdog on a very short EU leash. <laughs> Benjamin Butterworth, I'll start with you. I'm assuming you looked at that and thought it was the best plan you'd ever heard. Well, at least it actually is a plan rather than the bluster and piffle that Suella Braveman comes out with. You know, she came up with Rwanda. Cost us a fortune, about 120 million quid. Nobody's gone there. She never shuts up about stop the boats, stop the boats. The boats are still coming in greater numbers. All it took was, was some sunny weather and thousands of them came over and risked their lives and risked our security in just a few days. So Keir Starmer has come forward and say, actually, let's be adults, right? 
right, let's talk to the French, let's talk to the EU, let's come up with a deal which says how many people we take and how many people we're going to send back. Now, the idea that you're sitting down, say, oh, that doesn't work, we'll take all these immigrants. Mate, we're taking all the immigrants already. At least he's got an idea. <laughs> exactly. So I don't want us to take any of them. But so then what do you do land. for you people just, like us? You, you, just, you can't just force them back to France because it, the real world doesn't work like that. Australia I, did. I know you supported Brexit, so you love your fantasies. But in reality, you but can't Benjamin, just fly thousands of people Benjamin, to Paris. I'm sorry, the plan that Keir Starmer has come up with, he talks about talking to the French, negotiating a returns deal, um, being at the heart of Europol, having a, a connected relationship and all of that stuff. These are all things that the government is either already doing or is trying to do. The only difference between Keir Starmer's plan and what the government are trying to do is that the government also wants a deterrent in the, in the form of the Rwanda plan and they don't want to be part of Europol. Well, that clearly Otherwise, didn't work. Yeah, but the point is the difference between the plans also, is nothing. Also, so can what's I, your issue with the government's plan? Can I just say that there is the minor issue that is to say that the European Union don't want to negotiate in this way with the UK government. Officials have already said that it's delusional that Keir Starmer wants to negotiate to sort of rejoin some kind of EU resettlement scheme. If you know what's going on on the continent at the moment, you've got Poland who want a referendum on the migration schemes, on these quotas for asylum seekers. You've got Germany backing out of the resettlement yeah. scheme because they don't want to take too many people from Italy exactly. because Italy aren't uh, playing, you know, in, in the, the same... They're not doing what Germany want, essentially. There really is a huge battle going on on the continent that Keir Starmer seems naive to, ignorant to, I don't know what's going on, but we don't want to be joining that scheme again, that's for sure. It's an absolute mess. And the thing is that you bitch and moan about the fact that we've got no houses in this country and that old people are millionaires or whatever rubbish you're going to spout later on, when actually we've got nowhere to house these people, Benjamin. So where are you going to put them once you vote for your Labour government? Can they yeah, but, stay with but, you in your lovely little home in London? Darren, you're the one that's being delusional because you're, you're, saying, you're saying that any of these governments actually want less migration. That's an absolute nonsense. It's a, th th illegal immigration is a very convenient thing for the Tories and for Labour. That's why they're not doing anything to stop it. They're dependent. This country's economy is dependent on basically unfettered illegal immigration and legal migration uh, because we're not having enough children and children are very expensive to, to raise. So why not just import workers when they're already fully grown? Dependent and what worries, me, what worries me about that is that actually the, the fact of the matter is we are going to poison democracy in Britain because yeah. people keep voting for border controls and they keep being rejected by the political class. Across Europe as well. In, in Italy, they, they voted for an apparently far-right fascist leader who's going to close the borders and, if anything, she's opened them further. Well, we're stuck in a cycle, aren't we? People aren't having children partly because of the housing crisis and then we make that uh, crisis even worse by having such large-level immigration. So we are stuck in a bit of a... Uh, but the, well, a bizarre cycle, aren't we, really? I, I just think there's an audacity to say that a Labour government is going to... Because the Labour government has said, Keir Starmer has said, that they will ha allow for a quota of migrants to come into the country as part of doing a deal. I think it is misleading to try and claim that that puts Britain with more refugees or migrants than it would now, when the numbers now are, you know, over a 1,000 a day in some cases. This is just being more honest. But Benjamin, well, about the estimates... Being, about, sorry, Albie, being more honest... I think actually you should be honest with our viewers and be clear that actually, Sir Keir Starmer, this is all just a plan to take us back into the EU. Well, yeah. I mean, you wish he was going to say that because it would make your life much easier. The truth is he's been absolutely crystal clear that that's not going to happen and I think it'd be a waste of time. Well, to his shadow foreign secretary hasn't been so clear. David Lammy has made it very clear that what he wants to do is renegotiate our entire trade deal and find closer and closer economic ties with the European Union. Well, I think that Keir Starmer, he resigned from Jeremy Corbyn's cabinet, shadow cabinet, because he said that Brexit was an unmitigated disaster you, for everyone. Do you Emily, think he's changed his mind? Emily, I, I can understand it because Brexit's going so well, everything is so wonderful, the milk and honey flows everywhere since we left the EU. Why would anyone want Can to go back in? Can Conservatives also be honest that we have failed on migration? I oh, think well, it's I don't one disagree thing, with that. Darren, yeah. to say that you think Keir Starmer's plan for migration is bad and won't work. Well, guess what? Our plan for migration isn't working either. So I think we've got to stop this ping-pong of 
you're awful and then you say we're awful back. We're all awful. We need to come up with a solution to the migrant crisis and I don't think either of the parties really have a clue what they're doing. Well, it would help if the solutions got through the courts, I'll just say Well, that. exactly. Leave the ECHR, there's the solution. <laughs> now, anyway, up next, it's Albie, and he thinks that this week's Peckham protests are ridiculous. Albie, the floor is indeed yours. This week, racial tensions in inner-city London reached fever pitch when an altercation between a shopkeeper and a customer in London's Peckham went viral on social media. A would-be customer attacked a shopkeeper after a dispute believed to be over some hair products and the shopkeeper defended himself by briefly holding the woman in a chokehold. Black Lives Matter-style protests erupted on Peckham's Rye Lane outside the shop afterwards, and anti-racist commentators and organisations like the Runnymede Trust were saying that this was an example that Britain is institutionally racist. London Mayor Sadiq Khan even chimed in to say that he knew Londoners were concerned about the incident. Now, I'm concerned about the incident, but I'm not sure what an altercation between a shopkeeper and a customer has to do with racism. In my opinion, the woman behaved absolutely appallingly. Who settles any disagreement by starting a fight with someone? The man, the shopkeeper, the Asian shopkeeper, defended himself quite rightly, in my opinion, but he was very heavy-handed in his response. He should not have held the woman in a chokehold, although it was very brief. I'm really quite disturbed by this trend which has emerged where black people defend appalling behaviour by crying racism like the boy who cried wolf. Are they seriously saying that because we're black, if we attack someone, they can't defend themselves, otherwise we're going to call them racist? <clears throat> that's totally absurd and that's absolutely no way for a functioning society to work. My grandfather turned 91 this week. When he moved to this country, black people were not presenting television shows, they weren't in Parliament, and they were denied homes and jobs just because of their race. Now, this country has made a lot of progress. It's no longer like that in Britain today. And the simple fact of the matter is there are still racists in Britain today, unfortunately, but none of them were involved in the incident in Peckham earlier this week. So, Leo Kurs, have I got this totally wrong? Yes. Why? So, I don't know if you saw the signs that were being stuck to the shop mm. after the incident, but if a white person had stuck those signs about an Asian shopkeeper, uh, they would be condemned as some sort of 70s National Front throwback. Uh, and I don't think that pe people should be excused from racism uh, just because they themselves are an ethnic minority. But was this a racist incident, in your opinion? The incident itself uh, wasn't, wasn't racist. I mean, there may be underlying tensions uh, between, between communities. We've seen uh, in other parts of England, uh, Leicester, for example, we've seen uh, ethnic rivalries uh, flare up. Uh, this particular thing uh, looked like a straightforward case of, of shoplifting, although, you know, the woman might have needed those wigs to feed her children. Benjamin Bushworth, do you think that the shopkeeper would have treated the customer the same way if the customer was a white male, for example? I was just going to say, I, I don't think the woman was, was shoplifting. It was a dispute over the returned item for a hair product that they wouldn't accept. Um, but the truth is that while clearly what that video appears to show uh, is appalling behaviour on both parts of those two people, I would really question whether that Asian shopkeeper, had it been a white man who had behaved in that unacceptable way, would he have choked them? And I really don't think he would have done that. And I think the fact that it was a black woman is a part of why he felt able to put his hands on her and to behave with that level See, of violence. Emily, was it that if it was a, a white man or indeed a black man, he would be worried about being punched in the face back? Well, you know what? I think that we can't say. We don't know. We don't know what the particular dynamics would have been if someone was a, of a different colour on both sides of this. And what I hate is how people jump to so many conclusions as soon as they see a viral social media post. As soon as they see a clip, they say, oh, well, if this person was white, or if this person was black, or if this person was Asian, and they try to think of an alternative scenario, when actually we have no idea what the case would have been. We have no idea if there were underlying racial tensions in this 
shop. We don't know if the shopkeeper is racist. He could be. We don't know if the black woman is racist towards Asians. What we do know, judging by what we've seen since in terms of the protests, in terms of the signs that have been stuck on this man's shop, is that there is clearly some intercommunity tensions and there is a racial element to that because some of those signs are pretty atrocious. I mean, what well, I was just going to say, I suspect if anybody recognises what racism looks like, it's an Asian shopkeeper, mm. right? You know, they are yeah. often on the forefront. Sorry? Especially when he's doing it. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not. I, well, I, I just think that you know he would he would be a face of racism as she would be, and so I think they're two people that ought to be more sensitive to these issues. Darren Grimes, I know you're quite passionate about Britain's communities and immigration. Is this is this proof that multiculturalism doesn't work? Well, I, I think the protests that we saw outside of that shop, where people were blaming it on whiteness or white people, how the hell can you blame white people <laughs> when there was no white person involved? It just shows that the you, they, these activists often speak of a psychosis. They're the bloody psychos, if you ask me. <laughs> and I think, ultimately, this says that we do have a problem in this country. We have a problem with crime spiralling out of control. And I'm afraid to say, Albie, that the crime seems to be coming from certain communities in parts of London. And to speak about that, to say that, you're accused of racism and dog whistle racism and all the rest of it, when actually it's just common facts. It's plain and simple fact. I saw one video of this woman stealing a wig where she rammed it down her trousers. <laughs> I would have said to her, you can keep that wig. I won't be having that back after it's been down there. That technically, technically becomes a merkin. Well, oh, yeah, it does. That actually. was a different I suppose it does. A different that was woman. A different, yeah. I think it was actually in the States that video. Um, but Benjamin Butterworth, is there a problem with left-wing anti-racist activists calling things racist when they're just not racist? Well, I mean, look, this wasn't fuelled by white left-wing anti-racist people, which is, I suspect, is what you're getting. No, at. I'm talking about the, black left-wing anti-racist activists. This was the black community act actually. in that Peckham area, in that part of South London, right? So that suggests that they feel that at a very real level. And what is definitely the case is that I think black women, more so than many other descriptions of minorities, face a level of abuse of people feeling like they can take advantage or judging them or putting their hands on them. And I think this became a, a boiling point for a general reception that those people in that community your face. Well, she didn't feel any sign of oppression or anything when she was nicking goods from a shop, did I she? Think, I, I think we can all that. agree that some people love an excuse to get out on the streets and protest, even when they don't know the details of what actually happens. Anyway, still to come, tonight Benjamin cheerfully decides to launch intergenerational warfare and Leo says the planned ban on American bully XLs is racism against dogs. Don't tell us we don't have something for everyone. <laughs> but next, it's the Carver Palava and I'll be in full agreement with a union leader. You don't hear that much. You're with the Saturday Five live on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
people in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now, and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel, and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Your emails are flying in as usual. Claudine says, I think it's remarkable to ridicule Labour's potential lack of ability to stop the boats when we have a Conservative government who've proved themselves to be spectacularly useless <laughs> and incompetent regarding stopping the boats. Yes, but my point is, Labour don't even want to stop the boats. They're saying, come on, come all. But Alan says, Starmer is having his kinnock moment. The tide will turn against him. Oh dear, Benjamin Butterworth will cry. <laughs> Lena says, regarding the Peckham protest, Emily is right. Stop mm -hmm. playing the what-if game with racial tensions. She was wrong to <gasps> assault the shopkeeper, and that's that. Well, now it's time for our next debate. Up next it is Emily, and Carver is in quite the palaver about the race to net zero. She thinks that none other than the GMB union are on the right lines. Off you go, Emily. Yes, you'll be surprised to hear, perhaps, that I haven't always been the loudest supporter of union demands, but tonight that all changes. Gary Smith, the General Secretary of the GMB Union, has said three things that sound rather a lot like common sense to me. So, in a warning to Keir Starmer, he said the following. One, voters will not accept economic destruction to achieve net zero. Two, abandoning oil and gas too quickly would be a disaster. And three, that the blind rush to net zero is harming those who can least afford it. In fact, he went as far as to say, we've cut carbon emissions by decimating working class communities. And what did he point to to justify these claims? Well, green levies for a start. They add about £170 a year to every household bill. A modern day poll tax, mm. he said. Lack of green jobs for working class communities. Yes, we've been promised by successive governments, government after government, that there will be all these green jobs. There will be this green revolution. But no, he says they are severely lacking. And what I want to know is that even if you think it's absolutely essential that we decarbonise our whole economy immediately and show the world our noble example, how much will it all cost? Because I think our leaders have been a little less than open about the costs and I think we need to know them and then let the people decide. You see, when you ask the public, are you in support of net zero, the majority do say yes. But when you ask whether they want to ban petrol and diesel, that falls to less than half. When you ask whether they want taxes on airfares, that falls to 37%. Yes, Benjamin. Increasing fuel duty, 27%. Restricting meat and dairy consumption, well, a measly quarter of us would like to see that happen. And then, of course, there's the cost of replacing your boiler, ripping out your hob, re-insulating your home. Energy intensive industries, either they or the taxpayer will have to stump up the cost of decarbonising. I note we're all stumping up the cost £500 million to fuel Tata Steel's green transition. And there's also the small issue of shutting down our gas grid, which would cost a total of £65 billion, and that's according to a National Infrastructure Commission report. Now, in 2019, when the UK became the first country to legally commit ourselves to reaching net 
zero. The Treasury's best estimate of the cost was between one and two trillion pounds. Now, I think we can guess where that cost will fall. I say let's be honest about the cost and let the public decide whether it's worth it. Right, Darren, do you agree with me? Oh, my God, I absolutely agree. That's like music to my ears, Emily, every single word. Listen, I actually think I'm more of a Marxist than Benjamin Butterworth is because I agreed with everything that the GMB union leader said there and actually the defence of the working class, the defence of Labour is what the Labour Party is supposed to be about. You know, it wasn't always for the uh, champagne swilling flights like you wouldn't believe every mm. two minutes like that over there. And <laughs> it's a shame. I think it's a shame. So I actually, I really commend hearing voices like this of old Labour that used to speak up for the workers of this country, Emily. Well, Leah, I'm interested to hear your opinion on something that uh, Gary Smith, I think his name is, said. He said that net zero is a middle class debate. It absolutely is. I mean, the middle classes can afford to have a few more quid on their heating bills or pay for a ULEZ charge, but these charges are actually really regressive. They're, they're the opposite of what left-wing socialists should be putting through. Uh, if the, the ULEZ was scaled in accordance with how much you earned, then, then maybe it would be a bit, a bit fairer. But at the moment, the, the burden falls heavily on the shoulders of the working classes. And could it be that the cost of not achieving net zero outweighs the cost imposed on us now to achieve it? Absolutely. I mean, the exploitation of fossil fuels throughout the, throughout the Industrial Revolution has led to just insane advances in longevity and living standards and the luxury that we No, we but enjoy. could the cost of not achieving net zero outweigh, you know, all the, our efforts? No, I think, I think the, uh, the cost of not achieving it, we're, we're basically chasing uh, whatever it's a paid scientist is telling us we need to, we need to chase. So I, I don't believe any of it. I think that... I just, uh, I hate all of this negativity about net zero. I mean, Emily, you just listed there just a list of bad things without actually talking about the positives of renewable energy. Renewable energy is actually the cheapest form of energy at the moment. If we can, if we can build nuclear power stations, if we can build onshore wind, if we can store energy property, build enough electric chargers for electric cars, living can actually be cheaper and better for people. And these are things that can happen. It is government in action which is holding us back from the, from the benefits of a green transition. And I hate all of this what negativity. Do you, what do you say to the green jobs point, though? Because Gary Smith said, it's all well and good talking about green revolution and all the jobs that come from renewables. Absolutely fantastic. But he says, we're not actually seeing those in working class communities. Instead, we're importing our energy infrastructure from countries like China, actually, countries like Indonesia. Do you understand that point? I understand the point, but if you talk to other people, they will say completely different things. Like, if you, if you speak to the mayor of Tees Valley, the Conservative mayor of Tees Valley, Ben Hoochin, I think now Lord Hoochin, he talks about how the green jobs revolution in the northeast of England has been providing lots of jobs. And what Simon kind Clark, of jobs? Jobs building wind turbines and gigafactories for electric cars opening up in the northeast of England. So there are opportunities associated with the green transition. We've just got to be bold enough to take them. And one word to Benjamin. Only one. Uh, you're wrong, would be what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> the cost of not doing this is far greater than any of these individual costs because it's the end of the planet as we know oh, it. Come and on. that's already evident in parts of the world. Many of those are in the Commonwealth. When are you next going on holiday? <laughs> Tomorrow. How are, you getting there? <laughs> How are you getting there? I'm getting there on a flight, on a flight to South Korea, Darren. But that is the real answer. And this is where he this is where this fella has a point, which is that it should be an advancing technology to make things like cars, electric cars, to have airplanes that are much less polluting. That is the real answer. And because we are highly educated educated workforce. I think we can lead the world in that. And I think you are being We are leading the world in it. I agree with you on that, Benjamin. It is advancing technologies that will make this world greener. Hmm. Well, yes. Anyway, still ahead, Leo's going to explain how the scourge of racism is now sadly impacting the dog community. <laughs> but first, let's get your latest weather. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Still ahead, Benjamin's going to be winning friends and influencing people by saying hard-working elderly people now enjoying the fruits of their retirement are actually disgraceful perpetrators of economic immorality. <laughs> You're with the Saturday Five, live <laughs> on GB News. <laughs> The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. At so Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. You love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back to the Saturday Five. Now, we've had plenty of emails coming in tonight. Bryony said, aiming for net zero is like a life insurance policy. We all hope the planet does not become too hot, but if that is a danger, it would surely not hurt to try and do something about it. I agree with you. I just think the way we're going about it is wrong. Adrian said, the majority of us don't want electric cars. There's nowhere to park them, never mind charge them. Anyway, it's time for our next debate. Yes, indeed. Up next, it's Benjamin, unfortunately, and he's going to tell us why it's immoral to have so many millionaire pensioners. It's time for the politics of envy, otherwise known as <laughs> Benjamin's bugbear. Oh, look, Darren, I don't think I envy benefit scroungers, to be honest with you. Now, look, <laughs> pensioners... <laughs> yes, that's alienated you already. Pensioners are set to get a 10% rise in their pensions. That's more than inflation. It's going to cost the taxpayer about £11 billion more this year. That takes the total annual cost of pensions to £110 billion. That's more than education, defence and the Home Office combined every year. Almost 20% of people in Britain are living on a pension. This is unsustainable. And that's why the triple lock, which guarantees these various forms of rises in pensions, needs to go. It's wrong that people who are out of work should be getting bigger pay rises than people who are working. A quarter of pensioners are millionaires. This is an absurd situation. And no, it's not just that their house is worth a fortune. They've had their disposable income rise twice as fast in the last decade as people who actually turn up to work. <laughs> They've benefited enormously from house price rises. In fact, loads of people have seen the value of their house increase tenfold compared to when they bought it, if that were 40 or 50 years ago. And then you say to pensioners, all right, you've got a million quid house out of nowhere. Why don't you pay a bit of that for your health care when you need a care home? And they say, no, we won't do that. And then who has to pay the bill? Young people. Now, look, this generation often talks about the wartime spirit when everyone pitted in together. Well, I tell you what, when young people and people who are turning up to work and fueling this economy are having a cost crunch bigger than anybody in work has seen, then why don't pensioners do their bit, show that wartime spirit and stop taking so much money from the state when they don't all need it? Benjamin, yes. you do know a lot of pensioners stay in their homes so that they, in the hope that they can pass them on to their children, to their grandchildren, because they're very aware of the pressures on working people. They're not sat there hoarding their money, counting their money. Well, not the majority anyway, there will be some who are, but the majority of pensioners have worked very hard during their life and the state pension isn't exactly very generous compared to other countries. So I think it's a bit, a bit much to say, do away with it. Is that an argument not... to say we should spend more on the state pension? Well, maybe, for some. I do agree to an extent that it should be means-tested, so, but again, I'm not sure if that would well, be too well, difficult hang on. to administer. On that point, our lovely producer has this lovely graph which shows, actually, where Britain is, how the UK compares to other countries uh, on as far as pensions are concerned. And the UK's on 58%, and then you've got Italy on 52%, 82. France and G Germany are on 70%, France on 74%. And you're making out, Benjamin, that every pensioner in this country is sat there like Lord Sodden Sugar, when actually they're <laughs> sat there like Barbara Bolton from Greater Manchester, who last year froze to death because she was too scared to put her heating on. And that is exactly... Exactly why those greedy, wealthy pensioners who are demanding a triple lock when they don't need it should show some compassion. When I say that the triple lock should go, I am not pretending that you should forget about the fifth of pensioners who do live in poverty. What I'm saying is that the quarter who are millionaires demanding a 10% rise, more than our doctors or nurses or teachers get, are taking money from their poorer comrades who are struggling to put the heating on. And I think that is unsustainable. You cannot have a situation where we magic up 110 billion quid. And let me just say one other thing. It is a myth that the money pensioners take out is what they put in. Quite yeah. obviously it's a myth. Inflation and the level, the long time that people spend as pensioners makes that obvious. We pay for pensioners and there should be a bit more moderate attitude. But a lot of these pensioners are millionaires on paper because the price of their house has gone up mm -hmm. a lot. Largely 
simply because they've created an economy... And that's, that's why I can't afford one. Well, yeah, there, there are other benefits as well. But, uh, but I mean, to say that they should be turfed out of their houses to realise that, that money, those are their homes. You can't throw somebody out of their homes. And also, if you hate pensioners so much... I don't why, hate pensioners. Why do you dress like one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's rich in that jacket. Um, you know what, Benjamin, when he gets to, you know, the age, age of a pensioner, whatever, the uh, pension age, you will be lapping up all of those I've freebies. Got to You'll I've be got like, to be, I've got to be oh, look at this. Happy. I'll get my TfL bus pass I at am... 60. Lock step behind you on this, Benjamin. I think it is absolutely absurd that there are a quarter of pensioners who are millionaires who are taking handouts from the state, essentially. On paper. It's socialism for pensioners and yes. capitalism for everyone else. And I don't think it is conservative at all to be spending money that we don't have on people who don't need well, we it. B we basically have a universal basic income for anyone over the age of 66. It's £8,000 a year. And, I, and hang on, those, yeah. But the... Hang on, can I just say, when you compare what pensioners get to other countries, the way we calculate it is slightly different to them. Our private pensions are often more generous. And the average pensioner has £27,000 a year once you take in their two pots of money coming in, right? That's more disposable income than workers in their 20s who don't have any of the financial security of a million quid house. Well, I've got here that the average pensioner is left clutching 349 quid a week but in Darren, 2022. we're not talking about taking away money from those pensioners. We're talking about taking away the state pension from pensioners who are millionaires, well, which is scrappy. A triple lock. You're saying to scrap the triple lock. I'll be. You've had us scrapping the triple lock. You've had us spending more money on wind turbines and solar panels. A lot of that I comes mean, from private where, investments. Where, no, it yes, not. it does. No, it does of not. Of course, it does. It's taxpayer it comes subsidy. From private it's the taxpayer. But, you but Benjamin, pay. you wouldn't be able on 359 quid a week. You wouldn't be able to go on all your jollies abroad, would you? So but you I, make out that these pensioners are living the large life when actually they're not. A lot of people are struggling. But you're taking an example of a pension that is not the most common. 20 years ago, pensioner poverty was a huge problem in this country. That's why the triple lot was introduced in 2010-11, right? Because it, and it's managed to eradicate, in large part, the poverty of that. But they never introduced this, which means that it increases either in line with wages or inflation or 2.5%. That never imagined the crazy scenario we've had in the last couple of years. And it's amazing how, with everything else, people quite understandably say, where will you get the money from? And yet, 11 billion quid magicked up every year it's not sustainable. Why don't we try to focus on this supply side reforms that might actually make the cost of living cheaper for working people? That might mm. be a nice place to start. Right, still ahead, it's Leo and this week he is lamenting the sickening racism suffered by American bully XL dogs. <laughs> You're with the Saturday <laughs> Five live on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the Saturday Five. As you'd expect, our emailers are getting right behind Benjamin. Only joking, they're <laughs> up in arms. Maria says, hi all, I believe Benjamin was brought up by his grandma. I was. Who is maybe a pensioner, or at least on her way to being one. She needs to give him a clip around the ear hole. Well, there Whoa. you go. Strong stuff. She's Jay dead, so it's not likely. But, Goodness uh... me. Well, there you go. <laughs> not possible. Jason says, here we go again. Mr Butterworth saying we are immoral. Let's see how he feels when he's done over 50 years of work and then gets a pension of £200 a week to live on. Well, there you go. But Jenny says, no doubt Benjamin will be widely derided, but he is raising the single biggest issue this country faces. We have to help our youngsters get on the housing ladders, just for starters. Well, yes, that's very true indeed. But it is time for our next debate, and we are finishing on a high. Yes, indeed. Up next, it's Leo Curse, and he thinks that actually the planned ban on American bully XLs is racism entering the dog community. This should get a few tails wagging. Take it away, Leo. <laughs> the ban on American XL bullies is just racism for doggies. People want to ban them because they say they're overrepresented as perpetrators <laughs> of certain types of violence. Well, where have we heard that before? We've heard it from racists. That's right, and racism is bad. We know that certain races are overrepresented in, in certain crime categories. Uh, I spent the morning shooting heroin and begging aggressively. It's just what Scottish people do. But racists take these facts and spread them in a racist way. For example, in America, white supremacists take the 1352 meme and share that around. The, the 13 uh, relates to the proportion of the population that is African American, and the 52 relates to the proportion of violent crime that they commit. That is so similar to, to what's being done with uh, American bully XLs. I've already seen memes relating to them. Uh, uh, so saying that some dog breeds are overrepresented as violent, uh, violent criminals biting people, killing people, it might be true, but it's also racist and it's giving fuel to racists. Frankly, it's a dog whistle and we should ignore it for the good of diversity. <laughs> mm. Where did we find you? Honestly? <laughs> it's all facts. Look, I think it's it's a pretty interesting debate because a friend of mine has one of these uh, XL American bullies, and I was shocked when I found that out because her dog is so placid, so well behaved, and so to say that just because they are that breed they must behave that way, I think you know is is a judgment that's not necessarily fair. Now I was terrified of dogs until a few years ago because I had an incident with one when I was very young. Now, that was a, a Labrador. So, are we going to ban every dog that could behave aggressively? I think there's something to be said that it's the owner, not the dog, that's the problem. Well, you bring a very uh, strong point there, Leo, in terms of we shouldn't generalise about specific breeds like we shouldn't generalise about different races. Mm. I think that's a very smart, intelligent, well-thought-out point, actually. It's ridiculous to discriminate against, uh, against an entire race of people just because of how uh, most of them behave. Uh, are you saying most black people behave poorly? No, that's not what I was saying. I was actually referring to Scottish people. Right. Are you saying most Scottish people behave poorly? Yes. Well, they do. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I think I would disagree with that. Look, and I would disagree on the points made about the American Bully XL. Look, I'm a dog sceptic. I realise this isn't a popular position in Britain, but... My mother hates dogs, and I'm very similar to my mother, so I, inha I inherited all of that characteristic. I hate all dogs. Hang on, can we and just get... Can, sorry to interrupt, yes, but Emily, can we just get, dog, can we just get a up. picture of my dog up, please? 
Can we? There he is. Now, this dog, you're telling me you hate this dog. Bobby, Bob, the Bobmeister, whatever I'd rather you want to call him. To be him. quite frank, I'd rather it was a cat. Look, the point is that I think all dogs, which could potentially kill a human, apart from working dogs, should actually be banned. Why does someone need a Doberman or a Rottweiler or a German Shepherd if it's not a working dog? I think if you're, you're having your small little... What is it, a cockapoo? A like, cockapoo, that's fine. Yes. Rel relatively innocuous, harmless. I can deal with it like a small irritant. But those big dogs, terrifying. Ban them. You don't want a cockapoo? No, Can I don't. I, just say, I think, obviously, he was slightly tongue-in-cheek, or maybe you really believe that. It's hard to tell most weeks. <laughs> but what I would say is there is a level of sort of classism in this, because a Rottweiler or other massive dogs like that are very expensive to keep. So you mm. get quite a few middle-class people for whom that's their dog of choice, because it's, it's really not cheap. But a dog like this, which is often among sort of, you know, they're popular among some working-class men on some council estates, is it a judgment about whether they really deserve to have the pleasure of a dog or whether they can be trusted in a way that my friend who has one, who's a, a posh woman in West London, I suspect no one's ever thought of her like but that. But this is a 60-kilogram pure muscle-killing machine. I mean, this... Me or the... <laughs> 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 this, uh, I mean, these American Bully XLs, they're, they're pretty horrific dogs and 50% of all deaths from dog attacks in the last couple of years have been from this particular breed of dog, which makes up just 1% of the dogs in the UK. It's, it's kind of crazy. Absolutely. I think the government ages ago should have said it, we must wear muzzles, th those dogs, not we, <laughs> this, this panel. <laughs> that would make for a very well, short show. I think show. half the owners should be wearing muzzles, to be honest. I'm more intimidated by the owners that I've seen. Well, yes, and, and bringing back dog licences as well. That I, agree I think with. that absolutely should have happened a long mm. time ago because a lot of people are saying, look, it's even Boris Johnson wrote his column this week saying, look, we, and it's amazing, isn't it, to think that for three years we had a columnist for the Daily Mail as Prime Minister, but there we are. <laughs> and he was saying, look, it's the owners, it's not the dogs. Well, I say, well, actually, what are we going to do about that? And that, the answer to that has to be bringing back licences and making dogs that could be dangerous wear muzzles when they're out and about and making you wear a muzzle when you're out and about because your gob's dangerous as well, Benjamin. <laughs> Won't it just be like smart drugs, though? They'll just tweak the molecules in the dog so it looks like an American American Bully XL does all the things that an American Bully XL does, but fails that swab. Well, maybe, yes, but uh, who knows but what's going to happen what and they'll do, just breed something else. What do we do about the Mer American Bully XLs that are around at the moment? Well, that's a do good you, question. Do you think the government policy that is being proposed is actually strong enough? Some people want them all to be culled tomorrow. Is that right? I think muzzling and neutering them, I mean, that, that means that uh, they're, they're not going to be aggressive and they're not going to be able to do any damage. So that seems like a good interim measure until they're phased out. And let's just be honest. Very briefly. These people buy them as status symbols. If they can't have that dog, they'll get another dog. They'll train it in the same aggressive way. You're back to the first post. Mm. Okie doke. Well, we'll have to leave it there. But, folks, thank you very much to our brilliant guest tonight, Leo Curse. Angela's written in and Angela says, Benjamin, you talk a load of rubbish. <laughs> but, don't, but don't listen to Leo. Your dress sense is always fantastic. <laughs> oh, right. Are you sure? You've been tuning into the show. <laughs> Angela loves spec savers. No, Angela. <laughs> James says, your dog looks amazing, Emily. Let's have him on the show as a Benjamin replacement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. It'll bark less. Next up, <laughs> it's the brilliant Mark Dolan. Cheers very much for watching at home. We'll see you again next week. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to 5 degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern hours, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well, and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good evening. Headliners is up next. I'm Ray Addison with our latest news headlines. Our top story, the actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse in Channel 4's documentary Strand Dispatches. Now, warning for those of you watching on television, the following footage contains flashing images. Mr Brand was greeted by cameras tonight as he arrived at London's Troubadour Wembley Park Theatre for his stand-up show amid the unfolding allegations. During the show, he told audience members there were things he could not discuss. In Channel 4's Russell Brand, in plain sight, four women alleged sexual assaults between 2006 and 2013, when he was at the height of his fame. Alice says that she was 16 years old when she started a relationship with Brand. Now, warning, some viewers and listeners may find the following clip distressing. He didn't care about hurting me physically or emotionally or any of it. He just was... It took me, I was like, I know that it shouldn't take you having to punch someone and to win them. To get them off you, it shouldn't be a physical fight. 
After that, I just said that I wanted to go to sleep. So I just like laid on one side of the bed. And then that was when he got on top of me and held like my mouth open and was just like drooling into my mouth. And I was gagging and like, try, I was like trying to fight him off me, but he's laying on top of me. So I can't, like my limbs are trapped underneath him. Well, in a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted that his relationships have always been consensual. Midst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. Well, in other news, American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of this year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken back in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. And finally, a second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder. That's after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys aged 13 and 14 are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. His family has described him as very kind, caring and always thinking of others. This is GB News across the UK on television, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now it's time for our headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, the show where comedians talk about tomorrow's top news stories while trying not to get sued. I'm Nick Dixon, the People's Host, and I'm joined by two comedians you won't see on Channel 4, which turns out to be a good thing. It's Josh Howey, there he is, relieved, and Cressida Wetton in a very nice red dress. So, what? what are you oh, doing? Oh, yeah, what am I doing? What am I thinking? Gee, have you not uh, learned any <laughs> lessons? Oh, and Josh, my. Is in a, and Josh is in a very nice whatever he's wearing. Okay, that's it's completely fine. completely equal. Thank you very much. Phew. Got away with that We're one. Be all right. It's going to be a perfectly <laughs> fine show. Mate. Are we both well, apart from just every, the stress of live TV? I don't find it. Do you find it stressful no, anymore? No, no, it's, it's working with you. Um, <laughs> all right, Fair let's enough. have a quick look at Sunday's front pages then. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse, which, of course, he has denied the Observer. Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. That's a quote, of course. The Sunday Express, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. The Daily Star has The End Is Nigh, which is to do with skiving off work by citing the apocalypse. And those were your front pages. So we have the big story about Russell Brand, of course, but all we can really give at this stage are the facts. So what are those, Josh? Well, Sunday Times and uh, Channel 4 have sort of joined together to uncover so, what well, uncover? So there were some interviews with former people that he was in a relationship with, it seems like. And, um, and yeah, uh, with a bunch of different claims, one of them um, being rape, but uh, someone, a 16 year old who was in a relationship said he groomed her. And um, this is all between 2006 and 2013. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, there's a lot, it, there's a many, many pages of information. They, I believe the documentary is literally, whilst we were Prepared. here, mm -hmm. the documentary went out, so I haven't seen it yet, but it seems to be somewhat of a Rorschach test to people's reaction to this story. I see what well, you mean. Well, and importantly, he's denied all the allegations, hasn't he? I, mean, like, yeah. I saw the video that he put out, um, and he's... He uses his hands adamant, very, very well. Yeah. Absolutely adamant that... He's denied it on his own uh, YouTube channel. All right, so what's the next story? Do you want to do this Liz Trust one? Yeah, uh, Trust to criticise Sunak's 35 billion of overspending since being PM. So, 
I really don't feel like Liz Truss should be just getting involved. I think she should have just sort of sauntered off and take whatever her um, retirement would be and, and take her pension, pr Prime Minister's pension, for a month's work. Uh, but now she's criticising and basically saying that Sunak, over the two years that he's been Prime Minister, or were expected to be Prime Minister, will have spent 35 billion more. But Tory, other Tories have come out and said, well, if we'd followed some of her plans, like a flat tax, that would have basically cost us 41 billion. Let's just not forget that she cost us about 6 billion just in the few weeks by going with the policies that she did in terms of the, the, what happened to our guilds. So, I... Some people don't blame that on her, actually. Some people say it wasn't actually her fault. Some quite economic expert people, I, I don't know. I don't She's know the one who kicked it off, uh, and it was under her watch. She started that policy that then massively Well, some claim that it was already due to... It would already have gone that way from things that the Bank of England had already done. Though everyone seems to agree that she certainly didn't communicate it very well, the, the budget. Whatever. Anyway. Anyway, but the point is why she's getting involved is ridiculous. And also that she's sort of saying, I wouldn't spend any money on anything I'd do all these cutbacks it's like well guess what things happen like suddenly we've just discovered 12 years ago that uh, there are all these schools that are falling apart and need to be rebuilt and hospitals what they the government has to spend money the question is how do they spend money and more importantly that do we get good value for it yeah okay well Josh saying that she shouldn't be getting involved Cassa, but she's got to do something with her time what, what well, do you think it, isn't it oh it's, it's like when you go to a comedy club and there's no one there and the promoter says oh it was full last week you should have seen it it's like <laughs> it's competing with the dead isn't it um, I don't know this says it's gonna reopen wounds within the Conservative Party which is just what they need isn't it um, they already they seem quite open as well, don't they, at this stage? They do, so I don't know, I don't know what difference. This isn't her trying to stage a comeback, is it? No, no. I mean, she, she's just sort of in, she's, she's involved with this sort of growth group, so her thing is always to talk about growth and a more Thatcherite approach. And the crit criticism of Sunak is always that he spends too much, but then he says, well, I'm just being fiscally conservative, and you look all oh, unrealistic. And that's basically the debate. Probably yeah. done enough on that. Let's move on to the. Let's go back to Russell Brand. <laughs> let's, do the, uh, let's do the observer question there. Uh, Labour wants new EU links in a reset of British foreign policy. Uh, so ties with Europe are a top priority, says uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy. Well, we sort of know that, don't we? Um, that that Labour would like to uh, have more to do with Europe. Um, he's suggesting regular meetings, uh, and he thinks that the international community wants us back. They're missing yeah. us. Do you think Lammy's going rogue here? Because Lammy said closer links with the EU are the number one goal, as you say. But this was before the election. Do you think Starmer's was like, wait till after the election to tell them we're going back in the uh, EU, he, David? He's been very, very clear here. They're not, we're not talking not. About, about joining the EU. And all the way through the whole referendum and Brexit and all of that side, everyone, all the Brexiteers have been very clear. We're not saying that we don't like Europe. We're not saying we don't want to be friends with Europe. So it makes sense to... We're not part of Europe. We're not going to rejoin the EU. But we certainly should have good strong ties with our closest economic partner and that's all he's saying economic uh, security and various other things there's cool. nothing wrong with that as he says here what what kind of britain are we are we the britain this little england looking inwards or are we part of uh global stuff well, we're trying to sort things out with <laughs> india aren't we we're busy we've got lots, yeah, good old of, india. lots of meetings to have yeah. at but the but moment. Be, let's be very honest though do you think he will try and rejoin maybe maybe it's over 10 years because a lot of people in the what i call the extended blob who people I speak to in various positions, I won't reveal, but they, 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 a lot of people believe, hardcore Remainers believe that he will take us back, and it's their religious it's, narrative. It's, it's wishful will, thinking. They, you they, think so? They, absolutely. They won't, they know it's a toxic issue. It's happened now. Best we can do is make the best of it. No one, the Tories certainly haven't been able to do that. Let's get Labour in there and see if they can at least mend some fences, get some economic back and flow, and get back to some level of what we were before, if, without the EU controlling us. Over the long term, I can see the argument. I can see the argument of Labour saying, saying, look, it didn't work, we're the people that got you back in. Meanwhile, the EU can say, look how badly they did without us. And, and then yeah, they but we never go, we never get offered the same. We had, the deal that we had was yeah, phenomenal. Maybe so we never, we never get that. One day we I'm not saying I want this, this is what I think will happen. OK, well, let's move on and have a look at the Express then. Yeah, uh, Russell Brand denies rape... Oh, no, not that one. OK. Uh, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. Patients forced to spend life savings to avoid record weight for treatment. Now, this is, of course, damning. Damning to the Tory government that's been in control now for 13 years. Uh, having a million people basically going... Having to go to private health care when they have paid into a system through their lives, paid into the NHS, because, they, because the queues are, are too long, people are waiting up to a year... 
I think, is, is disgusting. But there, uh, is that, sorry, there's, there is that argument that if you try to stop private, all you do is actually punish the NHS, you know what I mean? Because it's probably better to accept... I'm not that saying that we need to stop the private, right. but I'm just saying the fact that it's got to this kind of situation yeah. is, is ridiculous. What do you think, Cressida? Well, yeah, exactly. It, it illustrates the point that we've had time and time again on this show, doesn't it? The, every, the waiting lists are longer. And, and also, you know, we've, it's this thing about the ageing population, isn't it? We've got more technology to fix more things, so the budget is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more old people to spend it on. And people aren't always looking after their health. Mm. So mm. We've got an obesity. I solution. Think, you sound like you went a bit conservative there, Cressida. You were saying the solution is personal responsibility, I could hear. No, you saw well, so, I yeah. thought you were sounding like Logan's Run. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to, people get to 39 or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they need to be killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, right. That would be. We've agreed she's going pretty far, right? Can I just say. <laughs> far, right? I'm saying. Can I say, Chris, that's a beautiful dress? <laughs> And a great, uh, whatever Josh is wearing, the suit, the shirt. Um, OK, well, let's get to the really important story tonight. What have the star gone with, Cressida? Workers skiving off in fear of the apocalypse. Um, obviously, I work with Lewis Schaefer, so I thought that was quite a reasonable position um, to take. Mm. Uh, but no, apparently, apparently people, youngsters specifically... Oh, youngsters. Uh, the youngsters, uh, they're staying home because they fear the end of the world. I've had enough of these youngsters, Josh. I don't know about these climbing <laughs> off work, uh, pronouns. What are they up to, these Generation Zs? Well, that's it, Zs. They're scared of zombies, they're scared of whatever, mental they health scared issues of zombies, and whatnot. Yeah. It is a great new excuse. I have heard of... We did a story on eco-anxiety, didn't we? And mm. they're all scared about the environment, which makes sense, because the fear's been drilled into them relentlessly by yes. the mainstream media. But zombie anxiety is a, is a new one on it's me. It's a new one, yeah. But, I mean, first of all, it's good that they have jobs. Maybe this is a good way of keeping people at home. And maybe also it's a positive sign that people are more religious, that they believe in the apocalypse. Why would you want to keep people at home? Well, I wouldn't like to, but, you know, your lot always going on about it, innit? The 15-minute no, cities no. and whatnot. No, that's not my lot. No, no, oh, but, like, oh. the, the dangers of it or oh, that, that uh, people okay, are pushing yeah. it. OK, yeah. OK. I, was yeah. I knew I was being insulted, but I couldn't figure out how <laughs> for a second there. All right, well, that's the Daily Star. I mean, I think we've got, given it on probably enough time. That is pretty much it for part one. But coming up, well-managed dogs and poorly managed borders. See you in two minutes. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to. 
by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with Josh Howey and Cresta Wetton. All very glad we're on GB News and not Channel 4. It's the best place to be. So let's continue with our stories. And the eye has amnesty will let owners keep well-managed American bully dogs. But do we really need well-managed owners, Josh? I've heard that's the debate. Is it the owners? No, it's not the owners. It's the dogs, because it yeah. turns out... Let me read the headline. American XL bully ban... Chief Vet says Amnesty will let owners keep well-managed dogs. Now, this is... There's going to be a year um, amnesty period, basically, where during that time, if you have a dog and you treat it well and it's well-treated and behaves well, it, 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 you can get it neutered and muzzled and then it'll be fine. After that, um, it's... it's go but I say that out-of-control dogs obviously should be... Well, out-of-control dogs should be killed now. But um, I, I just don't know why they're waiting the year. But the point is that they're saying that 50% of all the dogs in this country come from a dog called Killer Kimbo, who was so inbred and it had li was linked to... And, and its offspring are linked to multiple deaths. There's just no need for this I dog. Completely that... disagree. I think this is such a sensible it's thing. It's killed ten, do ten people in this country yes, in the last they're year. they're not saying, let's have this dog running around the public. They're saying... Because a lot of these dogs will be beloved family members. Don't pets. care. Well, I mean, this is an violent excellent... Family members. Yeah. I think this is a really good solution, cos it gives the people that genuinely want to look after their pet a bit of time to get it neutered, so I guess it means it's the end of the breed, but nobody's going to be heartbroken in trying to tell their seven-year-old the dog's gone to a farm in the sky. Um, it's... I mean... It, I, and I love regulation around pets, right, cos dogs are a luxury product. You know, some of these dogs cost a fortune, so if you can afford to have a dog, you can afford to look after it properly. And when you get regulation, you get the end to what we call greeders, who... those us that like dogs, breeders that are breeding for money. Mm. I think this is great. It gives it it's giving it a bit of exit time and, and then. So kill them all now. Yeah, you're so you're full coal now, and Cresta is like amnesty period of a year, which is what they're saying, then an outright ban. That does seem reasonable. Yeah, that's reasonable. I just and say I don't care. I just kill them all. And, okay. and five Literally. children yeah, and, all and that lovely stuff. But some people are very emotionally dependent on their pets. And the idea that you just take them away, I mean it's a bit it's a bit much, isn't it, to take away a well behaved I don't I can't understand why people bought these dogs in the first place. Yeah. They're killer dogs, literally. It makes is, yeah. no they're sense not, to me. Well, they're on, for the most well, they are part. literally. This, and they're from Killer do uh, killer, killer, Kimbo. killer Kimbo. Killer Kimbo. He was a killer. killer it's in Kimbo. the name. But, yeah, no, it, 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 I mean, I do see the point. And some people are squeamish about sort of government involvement, but there is a libertarian yeah. case for it, which is you're not supposed to harm other people. And, you know, even with your freedom can't encroach upon other people's freedoms. Yeah. So the freedom to own a dangerous dog obviously encroaches if, if it's hurting and killing people. Of course, yeah. of course. And, and these dogs that are in... I mean, I've watched some of the clips, cos I sort of made myself, cos I'm a bit sort of... Oh, I can't imagine. I watch them and, OK, yeah, I mean, the dogs come from nowhere. I totally accept that. Um, I'm not saying it can't be dangerous. Yeah. And I think muzzles in public is a great idea. Yeah. Why yeah. don't we just get into that culturally? It's a brilliant idea. Muzzles for people, in well... some cases. Some <laughs> of the people yeah. attack us yeah, on yeah. Twitter. And I, but I like that dress. Muzzle them. <laughs> and it's a nice uh, jacket. So, thank you, thank you. That, let's do the <laughs> Telegraph then. And Labour's private school's tax raid will make education more elitist. Doesn't it sound like Starmer's Labour, Cressida? Um, no, it doesn't, does it? Uh, <laughs> Labour's private schools tax raid will make education more elitist. Um, so Starmer's talking about adding VAT, basically, to private school fees, which would raise £1.6 and he's saying he can put that into state education. So he's yeah. robbing the rich to pay the poor. Um, but, of course, all the schools are panicking and saying, no, don't do that, we'll lose all our pupils. Everyone will, or some people will leave. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know... I, I suppose the point is that the, the really elite people won't leave however expensive if it is. In fact, they'll probably quite like it if it gets a bit more expensive. Ooh, um, yeah, good point. And that's yeah. it. And these people aren't necessarily rich. They're not fabulously wealthy, as it says here. It puts more pressure on comprehensives. I mean, a lot of things Labour have done have been well-intentioned but been disasters. Like, for example, the whole comprehensive school project that replaced the grammars was done by lefties. One of them was a Communist Party member. And it was... A, it, it's, it's, I wish the grammar schools had never been destroyed, but, hey, I've always gone about that. What do you think of this, Josh? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a strange hill for... He's not... It's not that he's dying on as such, but... To I just think neon. To really... Yeah, to, to fight for, because he's also saying, but I really support independent schools and what you do, but arguably it will harm them. But then at the same time, some of the fees, if they're 6,000... If you can afford £6,000 a year, imagine you can afford seven and a half or whatever the difference would be. Um, so I, I think it's like, I'm not going to feel you're either wealthy or you're very wealthy. Mm. And well, I'm he's not, talking I about the people in the, in the seam, isn't he? Yeah, Whenever you but raise they're, a price they're wealthy. Of they're, you know, if you've got that kind of... Uh, some of these schools are £13,000 a year or something. If you've got spare 13k a year and you've got to pay 15 I've instead... Got, I've got that, but that's because I have no children, so that's <laughs> yeah, the paradox. That, there we go. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, they need money from somewhere, and it's an easy win for Labour because it's private schools, and yeah. someone hears that on the Labour side and goes, yeah, private schools, let's take that money. But right? it is, it's a contradictory message. I don't think it's the fi finest movement. I don't think it's going to solve the country, so I, they, and it'll get a lot more publicity than it should. Um, and I think there are a lot of things that need to be fixed before that. OK, um, they should run with that slogan, Labour, solve the country. But yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't think they will either. But, um, OK, let's do the Times then. And the number of benefit claimants too ill to work has passed a million. Why couldn't just one of those been Lewis Schaefer, John? <laughs> <laughs> just one of the million. <laughs> not saying I want him to get ill, I'm just saying... I just want him to not be around me. Just kidding, Lewis, really? we love you. Um, really? I, I, love, I, love, I love his dresses. He's brilliant. Uh, number of benefit claimants too ill uh, to work past a million. Uh, it's jumped 300,000 in a year. So this is quite interesting because if you are unable to work, and there are some very serious conditions as to why you wouldn't be able to work, which are things like incontinence, um, and uh, not being able to be around people and mental health issues and whatever. Now, some of them are obviously medical, some of them might be... And this is, this is the interesting part, is the government seem very unwilling to get, call them skivers or anything, but the fact is that if you have this inability to work or you, and 80% of people who go for this claim get it, you get double the amount of money. So there is a yeah. massive financial incentive to go down that route. But like I said, the government's been very clear that they're, they're trying to be like, no, it's not about strivers and whatnot. We're just but trying to get... But halving your income would give you a mental health problem, wouldn't it? I think that's that a would. fair... But what they're, so what they're trying to do instead is, is sort of say, no, we don't think it's strivers, but, you know, you could work from home. You could do... I think that's yeah. how it's, the problem yeah. started, sending everybody home for two years. Well, yeah. Lockdown, drinking more, not running around. Not, I mean, no wonder everyone's got depression. And their solution is work from home, which is... Yeah, I would never call them skivers. They're scroungers is the word. It's scroungers, <laughs> everyone knows. No, I mean, look, I, I know what the benefit system's like, and it's terrible. It, the, the problem is, it is a perverse incentive, as you said. They should just make work pay. No-one's been able to crack it, ever, how to just make work pay. There was a scheme Labour had at one point where you got paid... For the first year you return to work, you still got your benefits, and that was scrapped. Mm. Because when you're going to punish people, if, if people are in a tough situation, then they're in a kind of survival situation, of course they're going to choose what gives them the most money. It's not reasonable to expect people to go for less money. But the, but the only thing, to give the other side, I am a bit suspicious that it's so many people. Can mm. that many people really be ill suddenly? That's the question. I don't know, but the lockdowns can't have helped, can yeah, they? But, Adding body weight to people and... Yeah, no, absolutely. And what, but it's very clear, they, they don't know what, what these extra people are ill from. Particularly, is, is it that they've expanded the definition of mental health illness, or is it, is it actual physical illnesses? Well, it includes. Well, it actually both says they don't know. They don't okay. know. Yeah. They oh. don't know. They don't is know. the answer. But they've got to stop. Yeah, but they, I do sympathise with people on the benefits trap. Let's do another one in the Times and Labour are doing a deal with the EU on free movement. I feel like we've been here before, Cressida. <laughs> Labour would bring child refugees to be with family. So Labour are, are suggesting that they would offer to resettle child refugees in the EU with families in the UK as part of a migrant returns deal. Um, but Yvette Cooper is specifically saying we are not proposing joining the EU's asylum quota scheme. Because mm. um, I think we'd be looking at 120,000 people then. Yeah. And that's not good. Yes, um, and they're not looking at doing that. Now, what um, people have said is it's similar to the Dublin Convention. And actually, Darren was talking on this channel earlier tonight about the Dublin Convention. Apparently, we tried to get about 8,500 people, more than that, over to the EU. They took 105, while we took almost 900. So the, the argument is we're going to get into another similar mess like that where we actually can't get rid of people. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, conversing very small numbers, really, here. The two big things that you take from the story is, first of all, that, that as, as opposed to the Tories going, that means we're getting 100,000 people coming over. That's just not true. As, they, as the Labour said, that's just a lie. What they are talking about, and I think there's actually a clever idea, is particularly... 
pe children or pe who have family members over here being able to come over here and then allow some kind of reciprocal relationship. And the reason why that is good is because if they have family here already, it's going to cost taxpayers less. They're going to have homes set up for them. They're going to have a certain amount of support already built into because mm -hmm. it's coming through their family. That makes sense. I'd rather take people who have connections to this country already and send back the people who don't, who we're having to pay for everything. That but makes more financial you, sense to me. How are you picking out the people that are going back? Well, that's not my job, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... Well, I'm going to get Leo Curse. <laughs> He's just going to get there and point at people. He would love that. Where yeah. does this uh, 120,000 figure come from, then, when it says it will require some member states to resell up to 120,000 migrants from elsewhere in Europe? Tories. But, the <laughs> but where are they getting it from? Are you saying it's like a side of the bus? Well, they're NHS looking at thing? existing EU policies, whatever, but that's not what Labour's talking about signing up to. Okay. They're talking about this very specific thing. So, Do you trust that, Cressida? Because I think this is Josh, well, Josh Labour I mean... propaganda a little bit. I'm not <laughs> sure. It might, it might well, that's what the article... Right, I'm just the saying article. what the article says. OK. Yes. Well, but the Times is the also facts. Josh propaganda. It's all... It's all pop OK, everyone's no, propaganda. I'm just both sides. OK, but I, I, I didn't know where the 120,000 came from. But OK, I think we've... I think there was quite an adult discussion on that one, which is good. Okay. Let's do the I. And Iranian women are continuing to defy the hijab rule, Josh. Yeah, we won't back down. Iranian women defy the hijab role despite arrests, beatings and rape. Uh, it's been a year since um, Nadar, uh, f uh, the, the Kurdish Iranian woman, she took off her um, uh, hijab yeah. and she was murdered, uh, then inspiring uh, a lot of protests and bravery from women in Iran, and even though those protests, even though the the, the, the onslaught that they've received from uh, their government, they are still fighting and they are still protesting, and it's incredibly inspiring. And um, it's really moving, isn't it? Yeah. Hearing some of the and you know, like she, she's talking about taking off her hijab and walking down the street and the fear that she felt. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I remember when I started to say I'm not wearing a face mask anymore. And I felt very self-conscious on the tube, you know, in the beginning when it was kind of just kicking off. And, I mean, that's nothing, is it, in comparison? I'm not going to get put in prison and, and attacked for it. Um, and, and it's eventually... nasty looks in Sainsbury. Well, exactly, mm. exactly. That's about the limit of it. And she says, you know, we, we felt fear, but we've no other choice. And I, I just think it's really moving and we've got a lot to be grateful for. Yeah, the only thing I've never understood is this is obviously brave, but that weird thing where people say the hijab in the West is uh, is celebrating diversity and multiculturalism, it's great, but over here it's obviously bad. I mean, it's pretty much, isn't it the same everywhere, or is it context dependent? No, it's context, isn't it? It okay. depends. Well, they have a choice. I guess it's about choice, isn't it? Yes, and over there, the they don't thing. have a choice. And I say, sorry, it was Mahasa Gina Amini, that was a woman who was killed and, yeah. and started all of this. And just uh, respect to these women, some of the bravest women in the world. Absolutely, that is it for part two. But coming up, mothers are erased. With Women force their way into male spaces, and a comedian is forced to make up stories about racism. See you in a minute. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News.
The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Sorry. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with The Times and a radical new plan to actually catch shoplifters, Cressida. Sounds like it. Uh, scan faces of every shoplifting picture, police told. Uh, so, uh, do they need to do it? I thought all these kids were putting themselves on TikTok when they were shoplifting. Um, Can't you just download that? Um, but anyway, police have been told uh, to scan every shoplifting CCTV image reported to them um, because only one in seven uh, shoplifting uh, occasions are, are being charged at the moment. So the, the, this is the drive to investigate more crime. Um, but yeah. wouldn't you have thought that this is what they do anyway? If you had any images of, of yeah. this suspect... It's weird, isn't it? We've yeah. sort of been just letting people get away with shoplifting. Two-thirds of cases are thrown out. And then now we're going the other way, and we're just going to scan everyone's face. It's like, isn't it like a happy medium? But, yeah, we already have so many cameras anyway. Yeah. I mean, what so do you think? One they use to do something with it. Yeah, sorry, police is charging someone with 4.5% of these cases. So... Uh, well, were you going to say Cumbria managed 24%? Hey! Come on, get in. Yeah. Wow. Winning again. Uh, but, again, number one is, <laughs> why is this not already in place and secondly you know why is it taken so long to even just get to this point discuss it it seems like a no-brainer of course that's what you would do is you would have these things we have all this technology now of course I appreciate there are freedom concerns um, and privacy concerns uh, but at the same time these are criminals it's usually comes down to a handful in terms exactly. of committing 90% so of these crimes a database it yeah. might help and the thing about the face is, I don't like having my face scanned when I'm in the supermarket because I haven't done anything wrong yet. Right. 
That's the yeah, case. Why do you say yes? Well, because who knows? Um, no, but I'm not planning to. But I, yeah, these people. I mean, come on, don't you give up your right to privacy when you nick people's stuff? That's the thing. You yeah. feel it's this kind of a narco tyranny people talk about. The innocent citizen feels constantly harassed and punished. Those mm. ridiculous cameras. Yeah, they shouldn't really have a camera when you're just buying your stuff. I don't know what that's all about. They shouldn't be able to do that. But then again, we, like you said, we, London's one of the most surveilled places in the world, and yet we're not managing to get any any yeah. shoplifters. And the, the other weird thing is now is you, you've seen these scenes in sort of South San Francisco and places like this. People People just looting the entire store, yeah. and now, as we saw with this recent case, if you do anything, the, you, you get in trouble for it. The, the shopkeeper gets in trouble. There's been a few cases where shopkeepers have rebelled, and mm. then they're the ones that get in trouble and told they've overreacted. Yeah, no, it's crazy. And yesterday we did a story about the uh, the Iceland boss who said that they weren't allowed to share. Normally, that's what they used to do. They would have like a billboard of photos and say, "Watch out for this person." And now they're supposedly yeah. are not allowed to do that because of these privacy concerns. It seems. Ridiculous. They're criminals. I'm from a small town, and we used to do, not we, not me, but the pub landlords, if you were a badly behaved person in the pub, they'd bob you, which means behave will be banned, and all the landlords would have access to these photos, and you couldn't drink in any of the local pubs. Unless you were wearing a very bright dress. Yes. Um, I take back what I said about dress, but I've learned and grown since then. It was, uh, I've changed as a person, it was wrong. You said I was being sexist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, but I've learned and changed and grown since 10 minutes ago. All right, yeah. let's do the Times. And the last male safe space is about to be violated, Josh. Yeah, the law that could get women into the Garrett Club after 98 years. So, because within their founding document it says something like, he must, if someone must, he must be proposed by another member, a lawyer who, who's obviously a member there has sort of said, well, it lays it all out, essentially, and also because uh, part of it is also they calls for gentlemanly accomplishment and scholarship. This member, this lawyer, lawyer member, has um, since then, sort of, because it turns out there's some legal thing from 1925 where he could be she within contracts, they've changed their opinion and said, actually, legally, this could open us up to be sued. Um, one of the interesting things to come relating to the whole trans debate is I have come very much pivoted on this thing and think, yeah, there do need to be male, men's spaces. Oh, male spaces. wow, I thought you Absolutely. weren't going to say that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think this is about legal loopholes at all. Mm. It's just... It's just a cultural thing, isn't it? Eventually, it probably will... There'll be no more male spaces. And we hear lots about women's spaces, don't we? But I don't think... I don't think, why, I mean, are, why do women want to get into male you know, spaces? I've been thinking that reading this, I thought, who are these women and why do they want to be in there? Well, no, I mean, they want to be in there because a lot of them, it's, there's con connections, business, a lot of shady dealings or whatever it is, and women want to be part of they that. They think I it's access I, I think, to power, yes. Yeah, and that's fair enough. There is an argument that male spaces are healthy and men don't want to go into women's spaces with some very high-profile exceptions, but the, mm. these high-profile exceptions become global talking points because mm -hmm. they're so controversial because some creeps want to get into women's spaces. Yeah. But in general, why do we want to get into each other? Other spaces. Men need to have their own spaces. Yeah. Play football. Do whatever it is men do. Yeah. I have a football. Team. Men no, need to be. I play football every yeah. week. There's, it's not an official ban on women in the game, but there are no women in the game. That's no. All and I've just and there is a difference when women aren't around. That's all it is. But I understand yes. that for women's spaces, obviously the need is much greater because we are talking about um, sexual assault and safety. Yeah, personal yeah. space. Well, that's interesting that you said that about power. I hadn't. I'm so daft. I hadn't made that connection. Well, we had a um, meeting about it, Nick and I, with the other blokes the other day. We did. Uh, yeah. No, you're, we, you're we agreed right. to keep you out. Warren yeah. Farrell writes about this. Men need places to go and do men's stuff, yeah. and you. we're worried about men's mental health until it's inconvenient, aren't we? Yeah. And then it's... And that's yeah. what me and Josh were doing in the cupboard before men's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our space. <laughs> when you walked in on us, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the telegraph, then. And the General Medical Council has removed all mention of the word mothers from a staff document. So, basically, women should be allowed in men's clubs, and yet they don't exist, Cressida. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, GMC removes all references to mother from maternity documents. So, yeah, you've pretty much... You've pretty much just said it. And, and the GMC are the General Medical Council and they serve as the independent regulator for doctors and aims to improve medical education and practice across the UK. So that's that's reassuring, isn't it? They're the people saying that uh, that we can't use the word mother. They don't want gendered language in these documents. Mm. But the fact is, yeah, sorry. Well, but they're documents about, you know, women's health. About so... particular, yeah, but, uh, yeah, exactly, uh, maternity. I mean, only women give birth. That's just a scientific fact. The fact that these documents were changed in May of this year, when, arguably, the wheel has turned, when other NHS organisations and, and, and other com and companies as well have been criticised and been told off for, make, for exactly. bringing in this kind of language. It's like... 
how captured are these institutions that it's still happening when they when other people get exposed when it's on front pages of newspapers and they get criticized and then they still go on and they do it i know it's shocking and we've had it with the menopause it says the average age for a person to undergo the menopause in the uk is 51 so i look forward to that yeah a person, you... yeah but also it does say here people will be affected in different ways and to be fair men are definitely affected we are affected but, but it's in about a... men yet again yeah. husbands let's, let's do the yeah. sunday telegraph again and the ehrc it admits it was wrong about LGBT, Josh. It's a lot of an acronym to on here. I did it. Uh, well done. Uh, trans guidance for teachers was wrong, says Watchdog. So there are two things in this article. The Equalities Regulator is basically saying, first of all, get on with it. Teachers need guidance. Publish what you have. Publish what we they, they advise the government. They said you need to put that out there because it's very confusing for everybody. So that's the first thing they're saying. The second thing that they're saying is that they had previously advised wrong that if you weren't to affirm a child who's basically a boy who says they're now a girl, if, you ha if a teacher hadn't gone down with that, then they could be open to, to discrimination claims under the Equality and Human Rights Act. Turns out that's not true. They've made that very clear now, and that was advice from 2014, but things have changed and there's been a conflation between gender and sex and whatnot, so they've been very clear now um, that, that actually you wouldn't necessarily be open up to these discrimination claims, although you would have to maybe explain why you might be doing it. Yeah, and but what's not clear to me is what the new guidance will be. I'm like saying they need to rush it, it needs to go through, but I'm not quite clear what it will actually be, but it will be not that, but what will it replace it with? Krista, what well, do you I think? I think it might even be that they're going to say you can't, you can't socialise, so, what's the right term? Socially transition. So Socially transition at school. So it's actually going to be banned. It's a complete 180, isn't it? That's well, I think I don't I don't think they're going to go that far because there's a bit of infighting amongst the Tories about who's on the right side of history on this matter. Right. But certainly parents should be the people who have control over what's going on here what's with their own me? children. So yeah, this came from the Labour Equalities Act. And no one's ever, it's always been in 13 years. They haven't undone any of these acts. And this idea they want to it seems to be a fiction. We want, they might finally, before they get out of government, do this one thing. Yeah, but this, but this one, because most of it is actually a, a good act. But it's this, it's this conflation of gender and sex because at the time there wasn't this big issue of the. Okay. Well, let's quickly before the break do this one. The mail and a comedian has admitted making up stories of racial discrimination for his Netflix special. Sounds like the race grifter industry needs some needs some new material. Cressida would have yeah. been a good joke if I didn't ruin it. Ironically. <laughs> He's an industry all on his own. Uh, comedian Hassan Minaj admits to making up stories of racial discrimination for Netflix special, including daughter's exposure to a white powder. Which is mm. pretty dark, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit like the Jesse Smollett uh, case, but it's not quite as serious. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's just having a laugh. So, essentially, uh, they've, they've looked into some of the claims he makes on stage, and obviously all comedians could embellish the truth. Some, you know, or if you're like a, a one-liner like Tim Vine, presumably it's all made up, isn't no, it? Look, I don't have five kids, so I'm not Jewish. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Yeah. And, like, I mean, yeah, there's comedians like Theo Vaughn, he's very good, I support him on tour, he struggled to follow me. Anyway, he's good, but he obviously is embellishing his stories and you sort of know it's part of the joke. But the problem with this is, some of them are quite serious, They're like about Jared Kushner sitting on a yeah. seat that was reserved for sort of the Saudi delegate or something, but it actually we all didn't happen. No, an imprisoned Saudi activist, but it didn't happen. And, and there's also the element of, is it adding to this racial grievance culture where he's making up instances of racism that didn't happen. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. He's saying that he's been a victim of racism and his excuse is, oh, well, it reveals some emotional truth. But he's talking about being sort of going up to a, um, to a girl on prom night, uh, to a house and her not being there, assuming for ra racist down. reasons. But as she turns out, they were good friends. She'd rejected his advances before that day, so he didn't turn up to house. And also, she was then engaged to an Indian man. So the idea, and it ruined her life, because yeah, of she's her, been docked, yeah, docked, docked by this, whatever. So yeah, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound moral. But I, I, look, all comedians embellish and exaggerate and whatnot. But when it's about this kind of very serious stuff and you're holding it out to as truth. Yeah. in today's world, as reflective of today's world. I'm sorry, emotional truth doesn't cut it. Right, yeah, there's definitely a line there. All right, good stuff. That is it for part three. But coming up in the final section, the bravery of Jonathan Ross. Shoplifters film themselves stealing. And can humans survive on Mars? See you in a minute. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News.
Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing, with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get into it with the mail. And Graham Minahan has praised the bravery of Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross for backing his new book, which probably means we can expect their apology in about the next half hour, Josh. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they're going to back down. Graham Minahan praised the bravery of the IT crowd, Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross, for backing his new book about being cancelled uh, for criticising trans rights movement. Uh, Graham Minahan is, is in Ireland at the moment, uh, attending the Let Women Speak uh, event uh, with lots of um, anti uh, gender critical people oh, there double. protesting them and whatnot, and was asked about this because it's been a big for He released the cover of his book, and on the cover are these two very complimentary quotes from Jonathan Ross and uh, Richard Ayoade. Uh, and uh, am I pronouncing that right? Ayoade, I believe. Ayoade, sorry. Uh, I just know him as Richard. And um, a very nice man. And very funny. And but basically, yeah, that's just kicked off. And as soon as he did that, the, all these sort of trans activists are like, oh, well, he was never funny. Oh, he, he's rubbish. <laughs> I, I can't stand him. And all that. I'm very disappointed and stuff like that. And it's like, what are you doing? But the, but the good thing is that the more that this happens, the more that normal people see this kind of censorious behaviour, this basically this fascistic shutting down, uh, the more and the more it doesn't affect people like Roshi Murphy, her album going to the top of the charts and, and whatnot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. we're, then, we're then getting the wheels to that turning. point, aren't we? Yeah. The tipping point. And uh, you can't cancel Jonathan Ross, can you? I've, tr I've tried. He was semi-cancelled, ironically, about the Russell Brand incident in 2008 when they, with the mm. Saxgate thing, but yeah. Yeah, but he didn't get cancelled, did he? He's no. here, so He's here. he knows what he's doing. I, I agree, it might be a turning point. It's so interesting, because Graham has been treated so appallingly, mm. Mm. but now he might be the hero, because he's now he's coming around, big people are praising him, yeah. and he treated some people badly as well, which he's admitted, when he was sort of a bit ideological, mm. but... But he's, yeah, he's but sort of a fascinating, now, he's become a pivotal it? figure in the culture like, war. If yeah. we can have the beginning of people being allowed to apologise and it being accepted, that's quite yeah. revolutionary. I mean, obviously, a lot of people so... know Graham from being on Headliners twice. 
What was that? There were no Graham Linehan from being on headlines twice. Yeah, exactly. Twice. That's, what he's, that's his main work. That's his main work. He's also he did, did like Irish some IT some and yeah, some other stuff. But being on headliners <laughs> twice is the big, the big one. <laughs> that's the pinnacle. Well, well done, Graham. And I look forward to reading that book. Let's do the mirror. And a treasure hunter who's been looking for a gold mine for 23 years says he's getting close. I mean, you'd hope so, Cressida. You would hope years. so. But you'd also hope you wouldn't put it on the internet. Uh, treasure hunter getting close to unearthing mythical lost gold mine worth billions. Um, so this guy, Adam Palmer, for. He's been searching for Slumux Lost Mine in the Canadian wilderness for 23 years. Uh, and he thinks he's getting closer and closer because he's found a sort of an abandoned old gold mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that would do it. There you go. It, might, still might, not be, it <laughs> might not be the one. It could just be a rubbish gold mine that didn't do very well. Oh, I see. Um, okay. He's looking for this particular one that supposedly got nuggets, nuggets. of gold as big as walnuts. Tell you what, where's a gold mine? This story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, but we, we've got to cover it, apparently. Um, Josh, any thoughts on this guy? Does he also believe in a lot less monster, this guy? He, uh, pr probably, but yeah, that's been his life mission. Maybe, maybe he will turn up this gold and everyone will have the last laugh. But, uh, it's the, a big risk when it's 23 years of your life, isn't it? Yeah, but well. I like it. You get to the end of it, it's a Sunday mirror, and then you get to the end. Uh, Mr. Palmer's Hunt has been televised for this documentary, soon to be released the second season. It's like, oh, so the whole thing was basically an advert. It's a prof piece, it's a yeah. doc, it's a little loud. OK, let's do the mail then. And the police are to start tracing burglars' digital footprints. You can file this on the stuff I thought the police were doing already, Cressida. Yeah. What are they doing? Well, of course they do. What are they doing? Uh, High tech police are on the trail of burglars' digital footprint that they leave behind at the scene. Yes. We can't yeah. believe they're not doing this. But it, it turns out officers, uh, they, they've been told to track offenders by tracing the property they steal, such as mobile phones and cars. Oh, my. I mean, we've got a system for that, haven't we? Cars have got number plates. That helps. We can record them. What's your number plate? I'm... Oh, I do have a number plate, but not on a car. Um, oh, okay. Will they digitally not show up at your house still? I mean, they, <laughs> what's the, I mean, what is this, Josh? Well, did you know that if you visit a home that has a router, your phone will get picked up? And they, the well, information... I know this because I watch lots of true crime stuff see, on YouTube. And, see, and these people, they murder somebody and then they go and bury them in the woods and, and all the cell phone towers are pinging. Okay. And that's, it's always how they get... Always caught. turn your... You, hear, you heard it here from headliners first. Turn your phone off. Yeah. That's, there we go. Of course, Chris, you live at sea, so it cuts off all signal and that's how you... Escape. Genius. But the other thing is, oh, that now they're going to make it policy where they have to turn up every time to the house. And the other thing is that they, if there is a reasonable lead, because you hear all these things, or you see these things online, sorry, that quick say, um, oh, we have a picture of this guy or someone was on the bell camera or whatever it is, and then the police don't follow up. Now, if you have some tangible evidence for the police to follow, they have to follow it. Okay. Before they just ignored it. All right, now let's do the mail very quickly. And NASA makes enough oxygen on Mars for humans to survive, brackets for a few hours, Josh. This is huge. This is this is like ter mm -hmm. terraforming, you know? Uh, you ever see, like, in Aliens, you, they've got those big machines when they arrive on that planet, and it's basically turning in an inhospitable, oxygenless envi oxygen environment and creating oxygen. So now they could do that. Their little uh, rover Moxie instrument there, it created enough oxygen to, for a human to survive for a few hours. But if they can do this and show it in concept that they take in the, the Mars, the gas, the carbon monoxide, and they turn that into oxygen, that's terraforming, well, essentially. So you've still got to have the stuff, the raw material. Yeah, I you've thought, got to send the stuff, I but thought still. this was big for the Titan subtypes who could go, but that wouldn't work underwater. They need to... Uh... No, but the idea is, the point is you could send these machines on a different scale to these places Planets, it would take the indigenous air or whatever the, the gas, well, gas in the environment and turn it into oxygen. That's huge. Okay. See amazing. you next year on Mars. And also, there's I, a board game I play called Terraforming Mars, which I love, which is all about this. Sorry, I got very excited. Okay. I just think it's funny nope. that it's such a specific nope. amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But, all right, speaking of a specific amount of time, we have to go. Fair. Great oh. dress, Cressida. We've got to go. <laughs> the show is nearly over, so let's have a quick look at Sunday's front pages again. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse. What do you think about that? He, well, he's, he's <laughs> it, of course. The Observer has Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. The Sunday Express has Million Ditch Crisis Hit NHS and Go Private. And the Daily Star with a very important story, The End Is Nigh, which is about skiving off due to the apocalypse. That's it for tonight's show. Thanks to Josh and Cressida. Not Josh all the time, but at times. <laughs> Headliners is back tomorrow at 11pm. And if you're watching at 5am, then stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's good night, good morning, and God bless. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's the increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night. To 5 degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern hours, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well. And low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is a Mark Dolan tonight special. Now a warning of flashing images coming up. 
Russell Brand has been subjected to astonishing accusations of sexual assault and rape. Here he is in exclusive pictures recorded for Mark Dolan tonight, arriving at a gig that was scheduled in Wembley, and the gig has happened. He's gone on stage, he's received a rapturous reception from his fans, and there he is arriving at the venue tonight. So, after 10, I'll be dealing with this extraordinary story, a set of allegations against the comedian Russell Brand, allegations of a sexual nature which could destroy his career and shatter the world of showbiz. We'll get reaction from key figures in the entertainment industry and we'll bring you up to speed with the latest on this developing story. That is all coming up after 10. But in the first hour, in my big opinion, Rishi Sunak is sticking with a ban on new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. Whether it's 15-minute cities, ULEs, ridiculous 20-mile-an-hour zones everywhere, or eye-watering parking charges, it's time to end the war on motorists. You won't believe this story as Princess Anne's former all-girls school say that gender is on a spectrum and as the General Medical Council removes all mentions of the word mother from a maternity document, is gender ideology here to stay? Will this woke madness be with us forever? A top international columnist weighs in as tonight's newsmaker. So we'll be dealing with the Russell Brand story at 10 o'clock with some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry. Two hours of big opinion, big debates and a bit of entertainment along the way. Lots to get through first. The news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark, and good evening. Our top stories tonight. Well, as we've been hearing, the actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse. That's according to a report in The Times. Now, a warning for those of you watching on television. The following footage contains flashing images. Mr Brand was greeted by cameras tonight as he arrived at London's Troubadour Wembley Park Theatre for his stand-up show. That started an hour late and comes just hours after The Times reported allegations made by four women relating to incidents which allegedly took place between 2006 and 2013. In a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted his relationships have always been consensual. Midst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies, and as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent, and I'm being transparent about it now as well. American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of the year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. Well, meanwhile, a man who was arrested in connection with a fatal dog attack in Staffordshire has been released on conditional bail. Ian Price, who was 52, died after he was attacked by two dogs believed to be XL bullies. Police say a 30-year-old man from the Litchfield area has been interviewed a number of times and now been released pending further inquiries. A second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys aged 13 and 14 are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. In response, Greater Manchester Police imposed a Section 60 order, temporarily allowing them to have greater stop and search powers. And finally, police searching for a missing ex-British soldier have been informed by Ukrainian authorities that they have found a body. 36-year-old Daniel Burke from South Manchester was reported missing on the 16th of August. His family had not heard from him and they believed that he had travelled to Ukraine. A Foreign Office spokesperson saying that they are supporting the family. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get straight back to Mark.
Thanks, Ray. We'll see you in an hour. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, Rishi Sunak is sticking with a ban on new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. Whether it's 15-minute cities, ULEZ, 20-mile-an-hour zones, or eye-watering parking charges, it's time to end the war on motorists. As Princess Anne's former all-girls school says that gender is on a spectrum, and as the General Medical Council removes all mention of the word mother from a maternity document, is gender ideology here to stay? Will this woke madness be with us forever? A top international columnist weighs in as tonight's newsmaker. Are the left-wing American press turning on Joe Biden? I'll be asking the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, live from the US. And after 10, I'll be dealing with an extraordinary and shocking set of allegations against the comedian and actor Russell Brand. Allegations of a sexual nature which could destroy his career and shatter the world of showbiz. We'll get reaction from key figures in the entertainment industry and bring you up to speed with the latest on this developing story. That is all after 10. We've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Christopher Biggins, Ingrid Tarrant and Lisa McKenzie. Good luck telling Biggins what to say. Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits with offences through the roof, has shoplifting effectively been decriminalised? Can 16-year-olds be trusted with the vote? And are Marks and Spencers right? to bring back paper carrier bags. Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. And let's be honest, tonight isn't going to be boring, is it? A big two hours to come. Happy Saturday, one and all. Pop open something cold and fizzy from the fridge or fire up the kettle and let's get to work. The war on cars in this country is so organised and so comprehensive, it makes the conflict in Ukraine look like a minor scuffle. Why is the motor car such an affront to the authoritarians who now govern us? Well, because it represents individual autonomy, freedom of movement. It represents fun. And none of that will wash in the brave new world of climate communism. Which is why it's so disappointing that the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has decided to stick to the bonkers target of banning the sale of new petrol and diesel engine cars by 2030. Even the EU, who have been drinking the climate Kool-Aid for years now, have pushed the target back by five years, following pressure from, you guessed it, the German car industry. No such luck here in the UK, where Sunak is going to saddle hard-pressed Brits with the eye-watering extra cost of an electric vehicle. The problem is, when you buy one, it looks like a worse investment than a pool queue for Stevie Wonder. The This Is Money website have revealed that used electric cars have seen their value drop by as much as 40% over three years. With all 20 of the second-hand cars that have seen the biggest drop in a year across all fuel types being EVs. EV stands for electric vehicles. The value doesn't hold and neither does the battery. Roger Torbloke, who follows me on Twitter, said the following. He said, I asked how much a replacement battery for a Nissan Leaf was after the eighth year or 100,000 miles elapsed. I was told I could not be told. Well, eventually I found out from a Nissan dealer and the price of a new battery, £14,300 plus fitting plus VAT. Unbelievable. So I will not be getting one of these cars. There's no proper charging infrastructure. We have about 40,000 outlets at the moment. We need at least 300,000 when this ban comes into place. Who's going to pay for that? The cars are heavy, which means that when you brake, they emit more brake pad particles than a regular car into the air. And the tyres shed harmful airborne material as well. Again, exacerbated by the sheer mass of these electric vehicles. Some car parks may need to be reinforced to carry the weight of these machines. The precious minerals to put in these batteries are finite, 
and are often acquired via modern-day slavery in countries like the Congo, with teenage kids knee-deep in orange mud for 12 hours a day, mining for lithium so that we can feel better about ourselves as we cruise to Sainsbury's in a Tesla or a Renault Zoe. Now, full disclosure, I will not miss diesel in the long run. It was a catastrophic decision by the then Chancellor Gordon Brown to get us onto that filthy fuel when petrol is much cleaner. And petrol engines are now so impressive when it comes to their emissions that I think they should be an option for consumers for the foreseeable future alongside electric. Let the market decide. What about this beauty? This is my glorious 13-year-old Toyota Prius in astral black. There's some concern that even this type of model may be banned by 2030 or failing that 2035. How could you? This is a great machine that gets me around. It's a hybrid with a small, efficient petrol engine. There I am mounting it with enthusiasm. It's all I mount these days. No range anxiety. I love this car. It gets into a few bumps and scrapes, but so does its owner. ULEZ, 15-minute cities, congestion charges, petrol and diesel cars banned, 20-mile-an-hour zones everywhere, pay per mile, eye-watering parking charges, needing a second mortgage to buy a permit outside your own home. It is time to end this war on the motorist. Driving a car isn't a privilege, it's a human right. This policy to scrap diesel and petrol vehicles by 2030 is a car crash in slow motion for Rishi Sunak. I can tell that Biggins is jealous of my Toyota Prius. <laughs> Very. Much more, much more attractive than his Bentley. Listen, what do you think? <laughs> is Rishi Sunak right to end the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030? He would argue, the government would argue, green campaigners would argue that these cars are reliant on fossil fuels, which are linked to climate change, and therefore we've got to show leadership and end their sale. But let me know your thoughts, Mark, at gbnews.com. Let's hear from my top pundits, actor, comedian and absolute showbiz royalty, Christopher Biggins, TV personality and broadcaster Ingrid Tarrant and academic Dr Lisa McKenzie. So, Christopher Biggins, the EU have even pushed back by five years on this mad idea. What's your reaction? <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's a real problem. I mean, for instance, uh, our mayor is uh, to blame, I think, for all the cars, the, the, situ the car situation. Now, I think what they should do is completely ban every car in the country <laughs> and then see how much money they're going to lose. Yeah. Because cars make them a lot of money. Yeah. And they, 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 they're blasé about... Yes. It's ridiculous, these 20-mile limits are everywhere now. Another couple of cities I noticed this week have, have grown to be, be told rather to, to endure this 20 miles yes, an hour. Yes, all residential roads and streets in Wales. I know. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, what's going on in Wales? I can't wait. There must be terrifying drivers running around. But, I mean, it's, it's just appalling what they're doing. And, you know, everything. I mean, I've got an electric car. I've had two electric cars now. And I change them because I'm worried about the battery situation, mm. which is, that was appalling, that guy who wrote, the, Mr. Torban, yeah. who wrote in. I mean, I think it's, a, it's just 13 and a half thousand pounds for a new battery. It's ridiculous. Oh, and the worst, that's on an average car. You go to the bigger cars, it's even more expensive. Is it really? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it, I just think that we should get rid of every single car on this island mm. and, then, and then see how they work. And fair. to observe what impact it would have on the economy, yeah. because yes. people in their cars, delivering goods, getting Getting to work, doing deals, and of course domestic stuff as well. Mm. It's part of life, isn't yes, it? Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, you have a very good point there, old Biggins. Mm. Um, what you forgot to mention, though, is the fires. Yes, the reinforced car parks, the mm. uh, uh, charging points. We know we're very, very low on those, but the fires. You can't put the fires out of those batteries, uh, the fire brigade, because they, they've got their own oxygen, so you can't snuff out. Normal fires would be, would be fed by the oxygen, so you can just put blankets over them and mm. put the foam and everything. They just have to burn out. And there's a lot. Look at the ferry about a month ago. Yeah. That was carrying EVs and things. Also, in Norway, now, I have to mention Norway. I've just come back from there. And they are the um, have the highest um, uptake of um, EVs in the world pro capita. 
the statistics here, the sales in Norway have gone down by 80% in 2022. Now, they're recognising that there are problems there. My brother and my, my siblings, they live there. They're saying very often when there's a massive traffic jam on the road, there's one of two things that will be uh, an accident right. and one that they've got caught in a, an accident and the batteries have run out and now they're causing problems because they have to wait to be oh, towed yeah. away. Also, another thing is the cold. Now, we get colder climates here. Well, we get all sorts of climates, which is fabulous. <laughs> um, and it goes very often to minus 25 and more in the north of Norway. Even actually just on the outskirts of Oslo, it can be minus 20. And the batteries don't do well in that. They drain quicker. Yeah. So you've got enormous problems. And funny enough, and you're saying about Germany that they're, they're pushing it back by five years. But interestingly, China and Germany are the forerunners now. In fact, Germany scores the highest in terms of current customer demand. Isn't that interesting? Well, that is interesting. And yet they're going to... Um, they're, they're, asked, they're extending it by another five years. But then a story in, in, the, uh, in the mail this week, Lisa, that... that uh... Volkswagen are laying off workers in electric factories. I think 300 redundancies announced this week. Mm. That said, these cars are reliant on fossil fuels, you know, regular petrol yeah. and diesel cars. We've got to wean ourselves off the fossil fuel habit. Yeah, I mean, this is all great for people to say when you live in a city that's got uh, tubes, buses, trains, mm. DLRs and everything else, even a boat that goes down the Thames that can take you to work. You come out of the South East, and, you know, unless they're going to start putting proper public transport in, proper infrastructure, not HS2 that's going nowhere and doing nothing. I mean, do we trust these people that can't do HS2 to take away people's independence to get to work and provide them with public transport? Because I, I don't trust them. No, okay. but you know what I think is more sinister? Can I just say something? They, last year they were talking about power cuts, which didn't happen, but that's always been like a looming threat. So what they can do, because they do want to just close the stand and stop us going out and having fun, switch it off and just say, sorry, power cut. Yes. There you go. And, well, we're, that's and that's we are really That's stuck. a double solution from Ingrid Tarrant. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Are you ready to go electric? The majority of climate scientists think that getting rid of those petrol and diesel cars is a good way of getting temperatures down. They're worried, the majority are, but what do you think? Mark at gbnews.com. Coming up next, as Princess Anne's former all-girls school says gender is on a spectrum, and as the General Medical Council removes all mentions of the word mother from a maternity document, is gender ideology here to stay? Will this woke madness be with us forever? Will you put up with it? We'll speak to a top international columnist who is tonight's newsmaker next. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Rishi Sunak is to stick with his ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel engined cars from 2030. That's the topic of my big opinion. Strong reaction on email market, gbnews.com. Electric cars, says William. Think why we're being pushed to install smart meters. All new builds have smart meters and charging sockets. Government makes too much money through fuel duty. They won't want to lose the millions on that same fuel duty when we get rid of petrol. Think, as soon as you plug in your electric vehicle at home, the smart meter will recognize the connection and you will be charged all over again and once again hitting the motorist. Francis says, hi Mark, the green lobby must be stopped. Cars represent our freedom of movement. Sunak is a slave of the World Economic Forum, which seeks to squash democracy and reintroduce communism as a world government. Listen, Frank, I've got no evidence that that is the case, but you're entitled to your view, Mark, at gbnews.com. Jeanette, hi, Mark. It's madness, this EV malarkey. The country's gone mad. The mega-polluting countries must be laughing their socks off at us. Uh, and last but not least for now, Steve says, cancel all diesel and petrol car production one year from the day that they have the required number of charging points, whether it's 300,000 or more likely half a million. Steve, thank you for that. More of your emails shortly, Mark, at gbnews.com. But it's time now for the newsmaker. And one of Britain's top private girls' schools has said that gender is a spectrum and pupils can have lots of different identities. Benenden School in Kent, the boarding school formerly attended by the Princess Royal, Princess Anne, has said that while some people may identify as a boy or girl, others may find neither of these terms feel right for them and identify as neither or somewhere in the middle. These, by the way, are the folks teaching your kids. Um, this policy that they've got includes students who consider themselves non-binary, whatever that means. Meanwhile, the General Medical Council has removed all mentions of the word mother from a maternity document for its staff replacing female-specific language with gender-neutral terms like surrogate parent instead of surrogate mother. Its internal menopause policy has also been updated and is stripped of references to women. So does this prove that gender ideology is now here to stay? Has it taken root? Will this woke madness be with us forever? Let's ask tonight's newsmaker, spectator columnist, and the star of Alexandra Marshall Live on ADH TV, Alexandra Marshall. Alex, welcome to the show. Princess Anne is a woman that I hugely admire. She went to this school. Do you think she'll be questioning her gender identity now? No, because like the both of us, she belongs to a generation who realise and understand that biology of our gender is a binary, that there are only boys and girls. And uh, it'll surprise nobody that I went to a private girls' school. We had two boys' schools either side of us. And I can tell you, every child there knew exactly which gender they were and which gender was causing the most trouble. And it wasn't us, I promise. 
Uh, but for <laughs> this idea that we're going to lose the control of having single sex schools, just as one of the many problems that this self identification thing is going on, is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And it stuns me that this was not a question five, 10 years ago, certainly not when we went to school. I'm pretty sure that you didn't have non-binary and fey genders and all the rest of it. So it tells us this sudden occurrence of gender confusion is a social contagion. It's coming from somewhere. It's coming from activist politics. Kids don't wake up one day and go, gee, I can't work out what gender I am. That comes from parents, educators and people in the media. Indeed so. The indoctrination of children at school, Alex, is a worry for society, isn't it? Because these young girls at this very woke private school will ultimately be leaders in the next generation with power and influence. No, they won't be leaders and they will not have power and influence because if they can't work out what gender they are, they are not going to reach a position of power, I guarantee you. Uh, but I remember when we were at school, there were a lot of protections around the education of sex uh, as we were growing up in gender. I mean, teachers weren't allowed to teach us certain things, had to get mm. specialists in, and we never, ever discussed the private lives of our teachers. Um, and now it seems like this has become the obsession of a teaching class that doesn't want to teach maths or English or science or history, they'd much rather spend the day on activism and show kids how to glue themselves to the pavement or dress up in glitter and rainbows and do some kind of black armband version of history in Australia. It's, it's basically Indigenous politics wherever you go here. I don't know what it's like in Britain. But this kind of focus on activism is not healthy for kids. And this gender confusion has real consequences like medical interventions that will ruin their whole lives. Of course, you know, the people that have drawn up this policy at Benenden School will argue that the world is changing. Uh, plenty of experts do suggest that gender is an abstract thing. And all they want to do is make sure that all of their students, whether male, female or neither, feel included and accepted. Uh, you mentioned medical interventions. The General Medical Council, Alexandra, have got rid of the word mother. Uh, to cancel that word is a particular insult to women, isn't it? Of course it is. You don't inc you're not inclusive if you exclude women from motherhood. I mean, you can only be a mother if you are a woman. And we used to know this. This is an accepted biologic reality. And for a medical institution to be playing politics with biology is a new form of insanity. I mean, as if the NHS hasn't got enough problems without going down the path of we're not really sure what gender mothers are now. Uh, it's, it's a topic that startles people because they can't understand how we got here in such a short period of time. These are not conversations we should be having early in the morning or late at night for you. It's, it's like we're going back. That Actually, you know what? We're not going backwards because human civilization has never been this confused before. This is a new thing. Uh, you talk about this on your brilliant show. I'll give the details in a second. But briefly, if you can, how is this going to pan out, Alexandra? Will we ever get back to normal? Well, your country is, is actually leading the way. We're watching from Australia where the backlash against gender ideology, particularly the erasure of women and the language surrounding women, is causing ordinary people to say, you know what, this has to stop. We are walking back from all of this activist politics. We would like to see a return to normality, please, if at all possible. Um, and so I think what we're going to see is a rejection. It will be a phase like Gothics were a phase for a while and emos were a phase for a while. I think this focus on gender activism will start to fade out, particularly as the court cases come through on the gender reassignment and affirmation surgery. I think that will pull away the rest of the movement that surrounds it. Uh, Alexandra Marshall can be found live on the Alexandra Marshall Show, ADHTV, ADHTV on YouTube. Alex, we'll catch up soon. Thanks for an early start. Uh, live from Down Under. Uh, lots to come with the pundits. Has shoplifting effectively been decriminalised? First, the weather. That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's the increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to 5 degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern hours, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well. And low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Glad the weather's got back to normal. Coming up with tonight's top pundits. With offences through the roof, has shoplifting effectively been decriminalised? Can 16-year-olds be trusted with the vote? And are Marks and Spencer right to bring back paper carry bags? Hold fire. Slow down, everyone. Here's one. What do you think? Is this the future? We'll discuss that next. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wilson, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. 
We're proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Are you ready to go electric? Rishi Sunak is going to stick with his ban on new petrol and diesel cars from 2030. This from Tanya Highmark. This climate change issue is just another agenda being pushed by the elites and companies who benefit in some way and want to control the people and remove one's right to choice. Also, we've got Princess Anne's old school. It's a girls' school where they've got a policy now which says that gender is a very fluid thing and you can be gender neutral as a pupil at the school. Uh, this from Yvonne. Hi, Mark. I have a female relative aged 13 who was a full-on tomboy. I asked her, do you want to be a boy? And she replied, um, had I been asked when I was five or six, I would have said yes, but I'm glad I'm a girl now. I think that's a really important point, Yvonne. I say you can identify however you like once you are 18. But look, that's my view. What's yours? Mark at GBNews.com reacting to the big stories of the day. Tonight's top pundits, actor and comedian Christopher Biggins, TV personality and broadcaster Ingrid Tarrant, and academic and political commentator Dr Lisa McKenzie. Shocking story. This year, shoplifting has increased by 37% compared to previous years, with some businesses now witnessing two or three incidents a day. It seems the police are struggling to respond to the sheer volume of offences taking place across the country. With offences through the roof, has shoplifting effectively been decriminalised? Lisa. <sighs> I don't think it's been decriminalised, because obviously if you get caught, you will be arrested. But I think... Is that true? Well, I think you get a clip round the ear these days, don't you? No, I think I think if you're a prolific offender, you will get. I think you will get arrested. But I don't know. I, I worry about the sort of moral panics around shoplifting. Actually, I do worry about that because over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of moral panics about people are shoplifting and they're just thieves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do think that in a in a crisis that we've got and people are getting poorer and poorer, and there's things all over the place, everywhere. Um, it is becoming an industry now, you know, people are... And it, it, people aren't just shoplifting for their own, you know, because they're hungry, but people are shoplifting to order as well. And that's because, again, in the communities, people want cheap food, they want cheap uh, food. Isn't that an insult to people who are struggling to suggest that they are would-be criminals? After no. All, the, the, the boss of co-op said that most of the thefts that he sees are down to gangs who actually organise to yeah. go into shops and they, they take everything from, you know, detergents yeah, yeah. to jars of coffee. But where are they selling them? And that's and I think mm. that's what we've got. That's the end thing is, so where are they mm. selling them? Where are these who things going? Who are their going? customers? Yeah, you know, so... I don't know. I think we've got to rethink... Well, we've got to rethink our economy, haven't we? Well, what do you think about that? That's a big thought, isn't it? Yeah, well, Ingrid. shoplifting has been a big thing all the time and there's always been sort of um, um, shoplifting to order. But I do think it has been decriminalised, actually, because beforehand, if you shoplifted, you got either a warning or you got a fine or something. Now, you can shoplift up to the value of £200. The, the thing changed. Section 1 of the Theft Act... Sorry, I'm going to give you a fact, no, Sim, we want the facts. It's absolutely true. Um, 1986, the maximum sentence was uh, originally seven years. But if goods are less than £200 in value, mm. Section 176 applies and it comes under Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policy Act, or Policing Act. Well, that's actually saying, well, go on then, steal, steal for £199.99 worth <laughs> or £200 and you'll mm. be fine. You will get the slap on the wrist, end of. And even though people might feel compelled to steal food because they haven't got enough money to do it, it still doesn't make it right. There are lots of other ways. There's, there's help, there's food banks. I'm sorry, I, I think that it's, it's actually just sending out a green light, so, like, well, £200 is, is nothing. It's a hell of a lot, actually. Yes, and Biggins, you know, the vast majority of people who are struggling would never dream of breaking the law. It's certainly an insult to, to sort of cast them as would-be criminals. And look at America as a case in point, where in cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, where they've completely lost public order, people are walking out of Apple stores with iPads and are not getting pursued by security guards. I think it's disgraceful. I don't know how it happens like that. I mean, but I've, I've read those stories and I, and I know that it happens over there. It is a disgrace because 
But soon, there'll be, there'll be no... I mean, there's no businesses anyway now in the shops. No, quite. Yeah. There'll be, I mean, even now if you order online something and it gets delivered and they leave it in your porch or next to your rubbish, uh, you know, your dustbin, and they leave a note saying that's where it is, that gets taken. Yes, it gets stolen. You know? Yeah, I do think Shall you need we... to move out of East London. I've got... Shall, <laughs> we... Shall we be quite honest, though? Do you think, do you think Apple's really struggling? You know, are they a business that's... Is Tesco struggling? Is Marks and Spencer? They're not struggling. But, but do we want but a culture in which in, do we want a culture in which it's normalised to steal things? No, but we've exactly. also but we've also in a society where it's normalised for people who to go to work and be hungry and not eat, be able to afford food. But that's life. No, it's that not. That happened after that's the war. No, that what but that it doesn't is, justify. That's it. policy. We've got if you've got someone who's working a full time job and still can't afford to pet, to buy food, that is a policy decision somewhere, and, or and, and is we have it, to deal or with is that. Is it a lifestyle decision where they carry? on smoking well, drinking no. they've got it, their licenses they have all the all the pe you know luxuries. people you know people now are ch having to pay rent and therefore being left with no money for food so they are choosing to pay this bill and not being able to do this i think it's deeper than that i think there's a lot of lifestyle choices and people are choosing to smoke carry on smoking drinking and all, having all the luxuries, and they're not actually uh, uh, changing the way of their habits. And actually, it's the children ultimately that suffer where children are involved. Jeff has, uh, Jeff has entered this conversation by email, mark at gbnews.com. Uh, Lisa is very right. Sometimes we have people knocking on the door to ask us if we want cheap meat like gammon steak. Uh, Jeff, they're suggesting that will have been stolen from a supermarket. Now, if Labour win the next election, they will give children aged 16 the right to vote. A blueprint for the party's next manifesto confirms that it wants to lower the voting age from 18. They said they want young people to feel empowered and fully engaged in our democratic process. But can 16-year-olds be trusted with the vote? What do you think, Ingrid? No! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no, no, no. In 1969, the vote was brought down from 21 to 18. That was the Labour government, because they thought that they might get more votes. It didn't really work, because actually one of the um, Conservative MPs died, and they had a by-election, and that um, or oh, somebody died, and the, the Conservative <laughs> got in. Anyway, I don't know. But... The, the, and we were the first country to do that. Now, I think 16-year-olds, they aren't equipped to really know what they're voting for. And do you know what worries me more than anything now is what they're being taught in school? Because the more woke the teachers are and the mm. more tolerant they are of this gender fluid and having litter trays in the corner and allowing people to come in on a lead on all fours, and then you get a detention if anybody says, sort of like, you know, would stop being an idiot and stop being behaving like a cat. And the teacher condones... That and, and gives a detention to a child, and they're in their teens like that, and they don't know. They they haven't <laughs> got a grasp of what's going on. Well, look, if the child thinks they're a dog, that's rough treatment. But listen, <laughs> um, Lisa, do you know help what? me with this. I'll tell you what I think. I want to know why the Labour Party mm. are wasting their time on this when they've got no other policies, and the, that, the whole country is falling into a pit of despair. Nothing works from passport to driving tests, to the NHS, and they're talking about this. I don't know why... Well, there's votes in it. Yeah, there is, well... But the question is, can 60-year-olds be trusted is with the vote? Is he well, really going to... Biggins, you've got wisdom, you've got experience. Well, I think that... The, I think we're under... I think I agree with you, but I think we're undermining children. <laughs> because I think nowadays they know a lot more than they did 20 years ago, say. Well, have you spoken to a 16-year-old recently? All the time. Do they know who the Prime Minister is? Do they know the policies? Do they know what the Labour's manifest? So might be. <laughs> Labour doesn't know what the Labour <laughs> manifesto. Right. That's, that's <laughs> what I think. There, there, there is no manifesto. Biggins, Biggins, is this anti-democratic? Is this gerrymandering? the outcome of future elections by giving 16-year-olds a vote, because we know that young people are always a bit more left-wing, and then they learn about the world, and then they become a bit more sensible. Absolutely, a bit more right-wing. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right there, and that's exactly what the Labour are doing. But the Labour, uh, Labour Party, to me, are just trying to find different ways to get people to vote for them. Well, of course, and so they're yeah. going to go for the young and the stupid... But, I mean, if, if we do have that, that's... Uh, I don't know how many 16-year-olds we've got in the country, 16, 17-year-olds, no. but, but perhaps um, upwards of a million? 
uh, that's going to impact future it, outcomes. Well, yes. it may. I mean, it may do. But you know, when you think every time we have an election now, the turnout is getting lower and lower and lower. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, the lowest turnout okay. is between the 18 and 24-year-olds. So. Uh, can can 16-year-olds be trusted with the vote? Mark at GBNews.com. Next up. Are the left-wing American press turning against Joe Biden? I'll be asking the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, live from the US. That's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you And whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. After 10 o'clock, we will be dealing with the shocking allegations made about Russell Brand. That's a whole hour dedicated to that shocking and developing showbiz story. But first, it's time for US News with the Queen of American Showbiz Royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. And Kinsey, great to see you again. Are the predominantly left-wing US media turning on President Joe Biden? Well, Mark, thank you. It's, it certainly seems so. CNN uh, dedicating an entire segment to some of Joe Biden's most recent lies. You know, he talked about being uh, there for 9 11 and, and looking at the rubble. That didn't happen. He was located somewhere totally different. Witnessing a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh in 2022. <laughs> didn't happen. Said his grandfather died just days before he was born at the same hospital. This is, you know, these are documented things that people, anybody can look up. That's not true. A conversation with an Amtrak conductor who was already dead. Arrested during a civil rights protest. That never happened. Said he used to drive an 18-wheeler. Mark, it was a school bus. 
And he talked about visiting a Pittsburgh synagogue, um, the site of a 2018 mass shooting. He didn't do that either. Uh, so you're, you are seeing some of those Trump hating outlets starting to look at one another going, did we endorse the wrong guy? You have to wonder, don't you? Uh, there's pressure on Joe Biden, and politically, he seems to be moving to the left. Let's take a look at this tweet, which went viral this week from the leader of the free world. It's time billionaires paid at least a 25% minimum tax. Uh, how's that story gone down in America, which, of course, is a country that hates taxation in every, in every form? I saw the greatest um, Dave Chappelle tweet or video that's circulating on social media and somebody yells at Chappelle, what are we going to do if Trump gets reelected? And Chappelle says something to the effect of, well, I'll probably be taxed less. I mean, you're seeing these huge stars that have a platform say uh, what the Democrats are doing to us is robbing us. What you're doing is you're penalizing these people that have started small businesses and are trying to create jobs and opportunities for people. So it's not going over too well, Mark. Uh, no. Uh, does Biden make it to the next election? I don't mean, you know, health issues, which, of course, are a, a concern. But politically, do you think that he can survive? Is there enough support for Biden within the U.S. media and, more importantly, among Democrats? Uh, look, we're going to just uh, reconnect the line with uh, Kinsey Schofield very shortly. But I feel that the tectonic tape, uh, plates are starting to shift uh, and they are working against Joe Biden. Of course, Donald Trump is looking like an insuperable front runner for the Republican nomination. Uh, Kinsey, just asking you there whether, um, whether Biden politically can actually make it to 2024. Well, hey, Mark, I think looking at that CNN story, I do think that what you're seeing is perhaps the Democrats setting Joe up to fail so that they could slide in somebody else to replace him. It does feel interesting that all of the sudden, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that all of the sudden it's OK to be critical of this man who wasn't right for the job from the get go. So it does feel like they're setting him up, especially with some of the Hunter Biden stuff, to slide in somebody else because they don't think he's strong enough. Uh, meanwhile, this week, Prince Harry's birthday, but a quiet celebration. You know, I think this is kind of a nothing burger, Mark. You know, Hello Magazine recently said that it, the palace did confirm that they're no longer sending public birthday wishes to those who are not senior working members of the royal family. And as you know, Prince Harry certainly falls into that category. But a royal watcher did ask Prince William while he was at Sandringham if he'd forgotten Prince Harry's birthday. And Prince William sweetly replied, it is his birthday today. You're absolutely right, it is. No, I've not forgotten. Uh, so who knows what happened behind the scenes, but um, I'm not necessarily bothered by them not wishing them happy birthdays online. Meghan Markle got something she's not used to, a warm reception. She's in Germany for the Invictus Games, and her and Harry put on a loved-up display. I don't necessarily, because I've had several people reach out to me and go, you are wrong. See, they're in love. They're in love. Well, first of all, this woman is an actress. She's been an actress her entire <laughs> life, so maybe you know maybe she's better than what we what we witnessed in Suits. But I also think it's super <laughs> important, Mark, that they really nurture the Invictus Games because right now this is the only okay, credible yeah, project that these two it. have. Everything else has failed: podcasts, docu, docu series. So they have got to make sure that this works. They've got to nurture mm -hmm. this incredible event because it's the only time that they get positive headlines. Indeed, uh, there were a couple of fashion reporters saying that Meghan is dressing in a way to make herself more friendly and approachable. Is that your interpretation? Well, I'd say she needs to work a little bit harder because uh, I don't necessarily think uh, she looks very friendly or approachable, but maybe it's just because I know what goes on behind the scenes. Um, I think, you know, I loved how Kate Middleton would wear the Invictus Games polo, and that way she's not trying to steal the spotlight about, you know, what designer she's wearing. She's saying, I'm here to support a great cause, and I'd like to see more of that from Meghan Markle. To write briefly, if you can, Kinsey, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, is on his way to America. Will people take note stateside of his arrival? You bet. He's our favorite prince. He's the most handsome. We absolutely adore him. He's headed this way to announce the 15 finalists for this year's Earthshot Prize Awards. The one question that's off limits, Mark, is he's asked, <laughs> a, a, according to reports, 
the, um, the Sunday Times says he's asked American outlets not to ask him about Prince Harry. I think that's a reasonable request because he's there, uh, you know, to shine the light on the Earth shot prize. Uh, well, listen, great to have you back on the show. We'll see you in a week's time. Do check out Kinsey's excellent podcast. It's called To Die For Daily. And of course, that's the name of her website as well. Thanks, Kinsey. See you next week. Uh, listen, we'll be dealing with Russell Brand and those shocking allegations for the whole of the next hour. I'll tell you more after the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening, I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's the increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so there will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Can 16-year-olds be trusted with the vote? Clive on email, mark at gbnews.com. Evening, Mark. Most 16-year-olds don't know what they want for dinner, so they'd have no idea about voting for someone. This is just another stupid idea from Labour. And John says, Mark, are you kidding? Uh, not only do Labour want to give the vote to 16-year-olds, but they're talking about giving the vote to EU nationals as well, living here in the UK. Uh, John, Labour have gone quiet on that, so we'll have to uh, further investigate. Talking of investigation, after 10, I'll be dealing with an extraordinary and shocking set of allegations against the comedian Russell Brand. Allegations of a sexual nature which could destroy his career and shatter the world of showbiz. We're going to get reaction from key figures across the entertainment industry and we're going to bring you up to speed with the latest on this shocking and developing story. The whole of the next hour dedicated to these allegations against Russell Brand, ones that he completely uh, refutes, but we'll discuss all of that next. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. Now, a warning of flash images are coming up. This is Russell Brand arriving at a central London theatre venue, Wembley. Uh, not Wembley Stadium, but a kind of theatre nearby. And he's arriving to do a show for his many fans, but he is facing serious sexual allegations of rape and sexual assault, allegations he vehemently denies. Uh, those pictures exclusive to Mark Dolan tonight, we sent a reporter down and he was welcomed by screaming fans. And of course, Russell Brand, one of the best known people in the country, here addressing his growing online audience, six million fans. But how many will he keep based upon what is being said about him tonight? Coming up this hour, I will be dealing with this shocking set of allegations against Russell Brand. Allegations, as I say, of a sexual nature, they will be reflected in the papers. Plus, we'll get reaction from key figures in the entertainment industry and bring you up to speed with the latest on this developing story. Plus, reaction from my top pundits, and they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. But we're going to devote a whole hour of this show to the allegations facing Russell Brand, one of the best known people in the country, one of the biggest comedy stars in the world. It's a huge story. It's rocking the world of showbiz, and we'll discuss all of that after the news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark, and good evening. And as we've been hearing our top story tonight, the actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse in Channel 4's documentary Strand Dispatches. Now, a warning for those of you watching on television, the following footage contains flashing images. Mr Brand was greeted by cameras tonight as he arrived at London's Troubadour Wembley Park Theatre for his stand-up show amid the unfolding allegations. In Russell Brand in plain sight, four women alleged sexual assaults between 2006 and 2013 when he was at the height of his fame. Now, Alice says she was 16 years old when she started a relationship with Brand. A warning, some viewers and listeners may find the following clip distressing. He didn't care about hurting me physically or emotionally or any of it. He just was... It took me... I was like, I know that it shouldn't take you having to punch someone and to win them. To get them off you, it shouldn't be a physical fight. After that, I just said that I wanted to go to sleep. So I just, like, laid on one side of the bed. And then that was when he got on top of me and held like my mouth open and was just like drooling into my mouth and I was gagging and like try because like trying to fight him off me but he's laying on top of me so I can't like my limbs are trapped underneath him. 
Now, in a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted that his relationships have always been consensual. Midst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. Well, in other news, American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of the year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. And finally, a second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder. That's after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys, aged 13 and 14, are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. In response, Greater Manchester Police imposed a Section 60 order which temporarily gave them greater stop-and-search powers. This is GB News across the UK on television, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get straight back to Mark. Thanks, Ray. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Coming up this hour, I will be dealing with an extraordinary and shocking set of allegations against the comedian Russell Brand, allegations of a sexual nature which could destroy his career and shatter the world of showbiz. We'll get reaction from key figures in the entertainment industry, including a top agent, and we'll bring you up to speed with the latest on this developing story. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages, I've got no doubt, Russell Brand will feature. And live reaction in the studio from my top pundits, actor, comedian and showbiz royalty, Christopher Biggins, TV personality and broadcaster Ingrid Tarrant and academic Dr Lisa McKenzie. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. So a packed hour to come. Those papers on the way, but let's start with this. The comedian and actor Russell Brand has been accused of rape sexual assault and emotional abuse during a seven-year period at the height of his fame. The allegations were made in a joint investigation by the Sunday Times, The Times and Channel 4's Dispatches programme. Four women are alleging sexual assaults between 2006 and 2013. Here's one of Russell Brand's alleged victims speaking to Channel 4, and let me warn you that there is some distressing and sexual language within this clip. He's grabbing at my, my underwear, pulling it to the side. I'm telling him to get off me, and he won't get off. Like, holding me up against the wall, pushing himself in me. He grabbed me and got me on the bed. I was fully clothed, and he was naked at this point, and he held me down, and he was just aggressively trying to, you know, me. I was like, oh, my God. He raped me. He um, forced his penis down my throat, and I couldn't breathe. It was just choking me. I was crying, and he said, oh, I only want to see your mascara run anyway. Now, Russell Brand has denied the allegations and said his relationships have always been consensual. Here he is in a video he recorded yesterday. I've received two extremely disturbing letters, or a letter and an email, one from a mainstream media TV company, one from a newspaper, listing a litany of extremely egregious and aggressive attacks, as well as some pretty stupid stuff, like uh, my community festival should be stopped, that I shouldn't be able to attack mainstream media narratives on this channel. But amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. 
These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. During the years covered by the allegations, Russell Brand had various high-profile jobs at different times, including at BBC Radio 2 and Channel 4, and as an actor in Hollywood films. Other claims made as part of the investigation include allegations about Russell Brand's controlling, abusive and predatory behaviour. Again, let me stress, allegations at this stage. He is undoubtedly one of the biggest stars in the world, and this is a scandal that could potentially destroy his career and rock the world of showbiz to its core. So in the course of the next 60 minutes, we'll speak to top industry insiders and stars, and we'll bring you Fleet Street reaction when the papers drop at 10.30. But let's now speak to the highly respected entertainment journalist, a regular pundit on Mark Dolan tonight, and someone that's been across this story for a couple of days now, Stephanie Tetchy. He's Stephanie, uh, I wish we uh, welcomed you under happier circumstances. Um, can you give us a sense of the scale of this story, A, in terms of the scale of star that Russell Brand is and the allegations being made about him. Well, Mark, you know, a storm has actually been brewing for the last eight days for Russell Brand because that's how long he's been sitting on these allegations and knew that it was about to be made public. For the Sunday Times and for Channel 4 for Dispatches, they've actually been working on this story for a year. So, as you can imagine, they've gathered all this evidence and now they've dramatised it, yeah. where, as, as Russell said, it's disturbing, these allegations. And to watch these allegations from these four different women is also harrowing to hear all of the accusations they've brought against Russell Brand since 2006. He's always been a controversial character. So it's no surprise, when we're talking about rocking the worlds of showbiz, we've had more squeaky, clean-cut characters mm. who we did not expect this from. Russell Brand has always been open about his sexual addictions, his addictions to porn. But what this, what these accusations have done, they've taken it to the next level where we're hearing the other side of the story for the women who have felt abused, raped, assaulted. That's where the shock factor has come in with this story. Uh, do we know whether at any point the police have or will get involved? Well, Mark, the latest which I've heard is that police are going to have to get involved after this, the finishing of the airing of this film. Mm. Because as you, this drama, should I say, or yeah. documentary, um, um, because there's so many accusations there. We've had accusations of grooming. We've had accusations of rape. These women have been... Their lives have been destroyed about what's happened through Russell Brand's supposed and, and actions yeah. and alleged actions. So mm -hmm. police are going to have to investigate. And like with the Philip Schofield story, Mark, there is that question of duty of care. From what I've seen so far, we've had young women who've worked on production sets with Russell Brand and they've been abused or according to their reports. Mm. So that's stuff where we're going to have to look back at the media landscape and be like, if it is true, why was this allowed to happen? Who turned the blind eye in such situations? Indeed so. Uh, Russell Brand has denied the allegations. Of course, yes. he's got a massive following. He is one of the biggest stars in the world, well, isn't he? It's business as usual for Russell Brand. He's mm. in Wembley right now, yeah. performing to an audience of 2,000 people. He very much sees this as an orchestrated and coordinated media attack mm. on him and his lifestyle. He's made a transformation over the past few years. He's gone from being Russell Brand the sex addict to becoming Russell Brand the cultural activist. He's been very clearer. He's been controversial speaking about the vaccine mandates, COVID. So for him, he feels like his freedom of expression is why he's now being silenced by the media. As we've seen in many cases recently, Mark, it becomes a big witch hunt. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted to say that Stephanie is with us for the hour. She's across this story and gathering more information as it comes in. So you won't miss any aspect of this story and those shocking allegations that are coming in thick and fast. Will others step forward? What are the implications for Russell Brand's career, even if proven guilty or not guilty? Now, let me reiterate at this stage that Russell Brand refutes all of the allegations. He's done so on his own show. He's got six million viewers on an internet site called... I think it's called Rumble. And, uh, look, the guy has an audience, he's got his fans, but these are worrying allegations. And certainly, I think you'll agree, based upon that clip we've just seen from Channel 4, very, very distressing testimonies about these alleged crimes. Uh, let's now speak to actor and presenter Christopher Biggins. And, Christopher, just a shocking story. 
It is a shocking story, and it's it's very worrying too, because I think you know, accusations uh, are, come very freely nowadays. It seems, and the interesting thing is, why have they taken ten years to come forward? Surely this is something they should have discussed and talked about when it happened, if it happened, because it is disgraceful. I mean, it was very distressing listening to those girls talk about it, but that was only their side of the story, and he obviously in that clip absolutely refuted says no this didn't happen well, well indeed so i mean sometimes crimes happen and it does take victims a while sometimes there's a legal process there can be injunctions not necessarily in the case of russell brand but you never know what the legal or, or indeed criminal background to, to these allegations are. Um, but, 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 you know, you, you, you do wonder, don't you? I mean, Russell Brand's uh, main defence seems to be the, that uh, really he's dropping truth bombs on the internet and therefore, uh, you know, they're out to get him, as it were, that he's made himself unpopular, made himself a target. He's had some supporters online, including Michael Barrymore, who just quote tweeted his video refusing the allegations. And Barrymore said, this is what they do, I suppose, in relation to the media. Well, I mean, especially if you've suffered like Michael has. I mean, they, th th his career was completely ruined. And he was one of the, he really was a huge star. And uh, that was unbelievable that his career could suffer that much from what happened. I mean, he made a big mistake, which was running away from the scene of the crime. Uh, which, but that we, we, you know, the whole thing, a man died. I mean, it was awful, but I mean, you you know, it, it, there are so many things nowadays that are happening. The Cliff Richard thing, you know, which was disgraceful. When the BBC sent helicopters to his house, yes. invaded his privacy, yeah. uh, and of course the guy was guilty of nothing. Absolutely. And when it comes to Russell Brand, I think that people getting online and, and either defending him or attacking him are missing the point. What we need now is, is legal due process. And that's what, what needs to happen. Don't you think the authorities need to step in, the police need to step in, look at the allegations, investigate, and give Brand a chance to clear his name and give those alleged victims justice if they are victims. I mean, also, absolutely. And do, do, we, do we need to know that Russell Brand's name at this particular junction? Mm. I don't think we do. Uh, quick one before we get to the break. Uh, if, if Russell rides out this storm and is able to disprove these allegations... Uh, does his career recover, or is the damage done? No, I think his I think his career will recover. I really do, because I think nowadays people are are aware of what goes on with the public and with celebrities. Christopher, thank you so much, and delighted to say you're also with us until eleven, reacting to the papers and this exploding bombshell showbiz story: allegations uh, of a deeply sexual nature in relation to Russell Brand, allegations of rape, sexual assault, and also uh, manipulation, grooming and other alleged crimes. Uh, so look, we'll get to more reaction uh, across the political and entertainment spectrum. So much to get through. I'm Mark Dolan, and this is Mark Dolan Tonight. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK, and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. 
The show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever, and that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. The papers drop in about 10 minutes' time. We are reacting to bombshell allegations about one of the biggest comedy stars in the world and actor Russell Brand, accused of rape, sexual assault uh, and uh, bullying, grooming, lots of other egregious alleged crimes. Russell Brand denies them at this stage. But let's get reaction now from a man that knows him well, top comedy agent and writer Paul Dudridge. Uh, Paul, you've worked with Russell in the past, haven't you? I have, yeah. Let, let's on this evening. Let's not say I know him well. No, I um, <laughs> I have worked with him in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Uh, first of all, your reaction to these bombshell allegations? Oh God, it's such a mixed bag, isn't it? Look, it, it's it's terrible, terrible stories from women, and the, the, you just can't make light of those. I'm slightly concerned. My big bugbear is with these broadcasters. These are state-controlled or state-funded broadcasters. They're not only allowed this, even in this own documentary, they're not responding to freedom of information requests. Mm. It, it, but they have po-face narration where they literally were the platforms that are being discussed. You know, there's the, so much um, reference to Big Brother uh, and Big Brother's all the spin-off shows. These are Channel 4 shows. This is Channel 4 dispatches, and yet they're merrily kind of going, yeah, we can't, we can't <laughs> share information. We can't. Absolutely absurd. This has all happened. This has all been on the rates, basically. We've all paid for this. If you don't like this mm. prurience, the very fact that we are paying for it and now where everybody's clutching their pearls and these broadcasters are coming out and saying this is a terrible thing. It's like, you know, everybody knows everybody's peccadilloes in this business. Yeah. You know, we only have to be around this business for five minutes. And yet everybody then is astonished when it comes out. I just think that there's such a double standard. This ha you you brought up the the I think the correct point. These things now, hopefully, these files are not just for salacious gossip. They're going to be passed on to the police and the in on both sides of the Atlantic, so that these things can be truly investigated. So he does get his actual uh, day in court, for want of a better expression. But yeah, there's something. There's something that, like I said, there's something hypocritical about this broadcaster being the whistleblower on this, if you like, after everybody has ha heard these rumours for years and then they're, they're acting as if that this is some great revelation. I think it's a disgrace. I really do. Yeah, I mean, you're a comedy writer now and a commentator and broadcaster. You were one of the country's top comedy agents. And I understand, Paul, that these dispatches investigations and the Times and Sunday Times could potentially go beyond Russell Brand. Do you think that... Other such allegations uh, could be lodged against other comedians. Is there more to come, potentially? Yeah. 
Now, unfortunately, we've lost the line to Paul Dudridge, but let me put that to Christopher Biggins, who is, of course, a showbiz legend. And, Christopher, you have to wonder, A, whether others might step forward now, because we saw that with the Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein, that sort of, that sort of thing. Uh, but also, you wonder whether there's a spotlight on comedy at the moment. Well, I, I, one thing, I've never been a comedian. Uh, I, I think I'm funny. Comedy actor. Comedy actor, a very good way of describing it. And I think that I would hate to be a comedian now, because I think comedians can't do anything. They can't say witty things. They can't be uh, on, on the moment of news items. They can't, they, they can't say anything because they're going to be criticised, whatever they say. And I think then there will be a lot of sexual claims coming up mm. because we know that comedians, you know, love life. And th what gets me is there's this thing somehow we've got in our lives now where having sex is a dirty thing, you know, and it's, it's a natural, normal thing, which okay. we all have loved and okay. enjoyed. Well, I think you and I will both agree, you know, a huge difference between consensual sex and, and, and the kind of allegations being lodged at, oh, at, at Russell Brand. Absolutely, and, and I don't agree. But, but what you're saying to me is you, you're kind of going beyond the Russell Brand allegations and you're saying that comedians are afraid to say boo to a goose. Absolutely, and it's going to get worse. And it's, it's not going to get, get any better. Uh, uh, worse, and I, and I totally agree, which is why comedy these days on telly is so bland. Totally. And it's so vanilla, and why ratings for shows like Live at the Apollo have gone through the floor. Um, you have met Russell Brand. Uh, tell me about Russell Brand, the man you know. Well, he's charming, he's witty, he's uh, extremely pleasant, very, very nice, humble. Um, I really have nothing bad to say about him. I think he's a terrific comedian and a marvellous performer, and he's had a great career. Yes, and it's really difficult to achieve what he has achieved, isn't it? Because a comedy actor uh, in, in Hollywood films, stand-up comedian, and now an online star... Uh, absolutely. ..big political commentator talking about COVID pandemic response and uh, health advice and all sorts of things. Six million followers online. I haven't heard him personally, but Ingrid was telling me just a few minutes ago how witty and how funny he is and what a brilliant pod it is. So there is, there, he is a great, great comedian. And I just don't know what's going on because I, it, it worries me that these things have taken 10 years to come. Head and I agree what our, your friend said abroad mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing that they should suddenly go against these TV companies, someone like, you know, like him. I find it very uh, bizarre. I indeed. So uh, how do you think this will be going down in the, in the world of showbiz among agents? Because, we, he, for example, in the last 24 hours, he's now been dumped by his literary agent. Is that a little rash, given the fact that he hasn't had a chance to clear his name? Well, I think uh, uh, very rash. I mean, you know, and I, I, I hope that when this is sorted out, he goes to another good agent, <laughs> and another good literary agent. I mean, I think you can't... Why do people make these statements now, immediately, there's something... something has happened. However, uh, I wonder whether it's appropriate for Mr. Brand, when faced with these allegations that he denies, whether it's appropriate for him to appear on stage in Wembley this evening in front of 2,000 adoring fans. Is that appropriate? Was it appropriate for him to go on AES today and do a video about these allegations? Don't you think that he should just get a response from a lawyer? Has he handled this correctly? Well, I, th I take my hat off to him for going to Wembley tonight and performing in front of his fans because they paid good money and it's a job and he's, he's, he's fulfilling that job. And he's not hiding away. I think if he hid away, I think we'd all be very worried. More from Biggins uh, when the papers drop in just a couple of minutes' time. Let me reiterate that Russell Brand denies these allegations, but these allegations come from top journalists uh, and it is actually a triumvirate of media brands, it's Channel 4's Dispatches, it's The Times and The Sunday Times, uh, and they believe they've got enough evidence to back up uh, those allegations that Russell Brand, and serious allegations, uh, has been guilty of rape and sexual assault and other uh, quite significantly and uh, outrageously egregious uh, crimes. So he denies those allegations, but they stand. I think the answer, by the way, is for the police to step in and address this and for legal due process to take course. OK, folks, here's the weather. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night. Two to 5 degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern hours, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well. And low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. You're watching Mark Dolan tonight. The papers are next. And those allegations in relation to Russell Brand, allegations of rape and sexual assault, they are allegations that could destroy his career and that would certainly rock the world of showbiz. More on that next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Delicious. your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Well, it's just gone 10.30. Let's have a look at tomorrow's papers. And we start with The Observer. Actor and comedian Russell Brand accused of rape and assault is the headline in The Observer. Also, Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. Ties with Europe a top priority, says David Lammy. It's time to play a lead role in world affairs. Sunday Express Brand denies rape and sex assault allegations or claims. Uh, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. Almost a million patients will have turned to private health care by the end of the year as waiting lists hit record levels. The Sunday Telegraph, Russell Brand accused of rape and sex abuse. Trust to criticise Sunak's £35 billion of overspending since being Prime Minister. UK fails to prosecute Chinese spy suspects. And GMC removes word mother from staff maternity guidance, a topic I raised earlier with my pundits. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. Four women say they were assaulted by the comedian. One claims that she was raped. Another of the women says she was groomed at the age of 16 after the star picked her up whilst she was out shopping. Now, this is a story, a set of allegations uh, put together by The Times, The Sunday Times and the Channel 4 Dispatches show, which has been airing earlier this evening. Um, Brand <laughs> strenuously denies the allegations, say The Sunday Times. He argues that all his relationships have been consensual. Um, a second woman has alleged that Brand assaulted her when he was 31 and she was 16 and still at school. She said he sent a car to her school to pick her up and referred to her as the child during an emotionally abusive and controlling relationship that lasted about three months. Uh, some of the other allegations are so egregious that I don't think I can really quote them to you on this programme. Uh, but Russell Brand denies these allegations. Sunday Mirror, TV show bombshell, Brand accused of rape and sex assaults. Woman alleges he raped her against a wall in his L.A. home. The Sun on Sunday, bombshell TV allegations, Russell Brand raped me. Woman's shock interview, Star denies very serious claims. And the Daily Star Sunday, workers skiving off in fear of the apocalypse. <laughs> the end is nigh. So I won't be working in the morning. <laughs> Sorry, boss, I can't come in today. I'm scared of the apocalypse. A study claims youngsters are staying home as they fear the end of the world. Whatever happened to having a dicky tummy? <laughs> well, someone that's never had a day off work in his life is comedian, actor and show... Hey, by the way, know where this comedian comes from. You are a comedy actor, <laughs> broadcaster... Yes, thank you. ...and a serious actor as well and showbiz royalty, Christopher Biggins. TV personality and broadcaster Ingrid Tarrant and academic and political commentator Lisa McKenzie. Uh, Lisa, your reaction to the Russell Brand story? I mean, obviously, what we can't do, can we, Lisa, is indulge in trial by media. No. We can't sit here and speculate, is this guy guilty or no. not guilty? But we can react to what is a yeah. huge story. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sort of trial by media. I think, mm. this, I think every time one of these things happen, I think the public... You know, the, the sort of trial by media is quite... It's unfair. And um, I think perhaps, you know, it's a business. The newspapers are a business. This is a business. So we're all sort of jumping on it. So I would say where I am at the moment is I'm just standing back, watching, um, and knowing the world as I know it, where there are powerful men and there are spaces where powerful men have a lot of power that these things tend to happen. And so, therefore, if this is something that's happened, then what we need to do is, is look at, you know, why is it, why is it so... Why is it always happening? Yeah. Especially, especially in the, this industry, in the celebrity TV industry, why is this... Why, why is this constant? Because in the last few months, it's been one person after another, after another, after another. And... You know, I, I do believe that people are innocent until proved guilty. Mm. And this sort of worries me, all of this. You know, this sort of trial by media. I don't know if he will ever come back from this, actually. 
Well, I wonder, because that's the issue, isn't it, Ingrid? Whether or not he clears his name, it could be that the damage is done, just in terms of, of how showbiz works and reputations. Funnily enough, um, I think people will question this aspect of it um, and maybe kind of it becomes a head-heart thing because his um, uh, pods, his rumble, are, they are brilliant and, and I know that I was saying that to you and you, re yeah. and you repeated it to, to you just now, can you, get, can you tell us about those videos? So, wh What is it that he gets up to online with his six million followers? He um, looks at... Issues at the time, so it's climate change, it was the COVID jab, um, EVs, Ukraine-Russia war, whatever is a controversial subject of the now. And he is right on the button as far as I'm concerned, but he gives a fantastic take. He's got, he's so well informed, his research is incredibly thorough. He makes you think. He puts things out there that you hadn't quite considered. So you can then make a balance. You don't have to agree with him, but he's, he's giving, he's offering a, a, a viewpoint like we do here. Do you think, Christopher, that he should come off air from his online show until he has addressed these allegations, perhaps spoken to the police and cleared his name? Well, like earlier, I, I, I would say no, because I think he, he, then it looks, if he goes into hiding, mm. it looks as though he's hiding something. When we earlier in this programme, we talked about the lack of money in the world, that people going shoplifting, you know, huge bills, what have you. At the end of the day, this is all to do, in my mind, about money. Now, for instance, Prince Andrew had all that scandal, and that woman was paid a huge amount of money. Virginia Dufresne. Yes, by somebody. In the, within the royal family. I'm not going to say any more than that. But there was a huge amount of money went to somebody because of the accusations they made Did against him. Do you mean him. the settlement made in court when she pursued Prince Andrew in an American court? Yes. Mm, yeah. Well, look, uh, the bottom line is that it is a complex story. We do hope uh, that justice can be achieved for any alleged victims uh, of these alleged crimes. The Channel 4 Dispatches show has aired. It was an hour and a half long. Stephanie Tetchy, our brilliant colleague here at GB News, has been watching it throughout. So she'll bring the latest on what's been said about Russell Brand, what allegations have been lodged, and she joins us in just a few minutes' time. So that's Stephanie Tetchy with the latest on these allegations surrounding Russell Brand. But let's now move on to my pundits' nominations for headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. Christopher, nice to get onto a different subject. Who's Please, your headline it, it is. And I, I, my best headline is, is, is this week is Prince Harry and the Invictus Games. I think it's been fantastic. And it's what is so wonderful. You know, the poor boy, whatever you may think about him, has been through it. I mean, he's yeah. given a lot of things he shouldn't have done, but everybody seems to be against him. And yet you see all those people there treating him like a hero because he created these games for the, all those people who are having a marvellous time. People with no limbs, people with, you know, broken by war. And it's just fantastic what he's done. And also, I think it was wonderful that she's there. You know, I mean, your American uh, uh, girl earlier Indeed. said, you know, that she's, she's there and she's She's not wearing the right clothes. I get fed up with all of this. And she's a good actress. She is a good actress, but, you know, she, I think she's really done an awful she lot. She's not good in suits, though. <laughs> well, I quite like her in suits, funny enough. But anyway, but I do think, you know, she's making an effort. I think their relationship, is, as far as we can see, it seems to be good. She's there supporting him. They're clapping along with everything, enjoying, you know, giving the medals out. I think it's a marvellous story for the week. There you go. Nice positive note to end on. How about you, your headline hero? Oh, it's Jim Carter, uh, the actor that was in Downton Abbey, and he's married to Imelda Staunton. And he wants to um, bring gardening into the curriculum. Mm. And I think that is such a super brilliant idea. During lockdown, a lot of people started getting into gardening. They were growing their own fruits and vegetables, and they were really... Um, thriving on, it's like you reap what you sow, so they were getting that back. And I think it's so important because kids have lost that. They do it in nursery school, absolutely wonderful, then it all stops. And they need to get in touch with 
with life, with nature, and it's very therapeutic. There's a lot of kids that are suffering, not just children, a lot of people with men mental illnesses for, for various reasons, and lockdown really certainly didn't help. And I think this is a form of therapy, and I really, really hope he succeeds in getting that through. Which is why allotments are such a good idea. Yes, yes and they're brilliant. so loved. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Lisa, who's your headline hero? Uh, a year ago today, uh, the young woman, um, Martha Amin, uh, was, or di was died through uh, the Iranian um, police who were yes. the, the modesty laws. And she died a year ago. And her family today, and so it's a, my front page hero is her and her family. Her family, it, despite this absolute terror state, are still trying to get justice in, in her name. And even though her father was taken away this morning for four hours, they still went to the, and did a service next to her grave. And I think that is incredibly great, brave in such a country where you can disappear. And this one family is just standing against all of that. Most definitely, we salute this remarkable woman, her family, yeah, yeah. And, and her legacy of courage and, and standing up to a, a truly evil regime. How about your back page zero, Christopher? Well, it has to be with Libya and the flooding, uh, which has just been disgracefully handled. I mean, there are two companies who should have looked after the two dams that broke, uh, and they're hopefully something terrible will happen, or not terrible to happen, but they will be held accountable for what's gone on. And I also think that they, they, they could have given some warning to those poor, poor people who've died in such huge numbers. Numbers. Most certainly, uh, they've handled it in the way that the normally Chinese authorities handle. Absolutely, sort of you're right. Obfuscation and cover up and incompetence. Yes. Mm. Your back page zero, Ingrid. It's the whole Labour Party. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to get off that fence, Ingrid. <laughs> what have they done to offend you? Well, <laughs> everything. Well, yeah, everything. The whole Labour Party has done everything to offend me. But funny, it, I didn't know this was going to be your topic, but it's, it's um, yeah. the age of voting coming down to 16. Mm. And I'm so opposed to that. And all the things that they want to do with trade agreements with Europe and everything. And they're just trying to push us back, back, back into that. And I just think, do you know, what just get a life give us the life back that we want and and stop making these stupid half-baked idea policies and that's it so is, I've is just, this, I'm just missing the whole lot is the flirtation with the EU by Labour political suicide I think it is but the, the weird thing is he has always said and it can always be churned up over and over again that he said he's absolutely not going to go back into the EU mm. but I do think it is political suicide because it's so smudged. It's not clear what his in intentions actually are. Fine, have an EFTA agreement. That's a very easy thing to do without getting sort of back in bed with, um, with Europe again. But he's not making it very clear. He's such a wishy-washy man. He doesn't know the difference between Arthur and Martha and if it's, you know, and stuff like that. And I just can't bear the man. And, I, and the people okay. behind him, I just don't want to support. <laughs> End of. Well, there you go. She's saying it like it is. Uh, but many would argue that we need a Labour government the Tories have had 13 years, they've botched it up. They would argue that it's time to reconnect with the European Union. It would be good for our economy and for the country as a whole. It's all about opinions. Uh, Lisa, your back page zero. Well, connected to you, Ingrid, it's Angela Rayner. Um, she's this week been appointed to the Levelling Up Shadow Secretary. I live in the East Midlands. We desperately, desperately need to be supported in that part of the country. Yeah. And Angela Rayner, I think she is a puppet that Keir Starmer has used, and I think she's allowing herself to be used as some sort of working-class token woman and a puppet. I don't actually think that she is going to focus on levelling up. I think Lisa Nandy, who was in the previous... Mm position. I think she was more serious about it. I don't think Angela Rayner is. And where I live in the East Midlands, we have been left behind for 40 years. So do you think that Angela Rayner is really John Prescott 2.0? Yes, uh, yes. Exactly, oh, yes, that is exactly what... I, and I have said that. I've been saying that for a few months now. I think that she is Tony Blair's... John. She's, she's Keir Starmer's John Prescott. Fascinating, uh, yeah. Well, well, look, uh, that's an interesting debate. Uh, another quick one before we get to the break. Marks and Spencers 
have been equipping customers with new paper bags. Uh, I've got one here. And look at that, very patriotic. Mm. Other brands are available, Sainsbury's, Aldi, Morrison's, you name it. Uh, but what do we think about these paper, these paper bags? Is this the future? Um, this one from M&S is apparently uh, water resistant, tear resistant, and can be reused. Are you happy with her? Yeah, and you, you... How, much is it, how much is it does it cost? You, That's you can... 40p. And you can... That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. And you can carry uh, four four pints of milk, apparently. I don't believe that. You don't believe no, that? No, I don't <laughs> believe Get the milk. That. Apparently, <laughs> apparently it's, uh, it's 15 kilograms, yeah, you can carry. Yeah. Uh, but is it, is it time to go back to paper bags? Because Biggins, that's how it used to be back in the day. Absolutely. I'm all for paper bags. I think I agree with you. It's very expensive <laughs> because, of course, plastic bags are terrifying. Are yeah. you, are you, are we, do you think we should bring back the shopping trolley? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. what, on the wheelie thing? Yeah. Oh, Don't yeah, that would be lovely. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, one of those. Yes. Yes. OK, you know... like, like the old ladies. Yes. OK, well, yes. listen, I'm, I'm going I agree. to... Uh, I'm going to try to break this bag uh, during the little ad break. Uh, but next up, we've got Stephanie Tetchy in the studio. Uh, a much more serious issue. Those allegations about Russell Brand. More developments after this. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Well, more now on this Channel 4 Dispatches documentary. It came off air at 10.30. It's been in uh, coalition, if you like, with the Sunday Times and the Times newspaper in relation to allegations uh, about Russell Brand, allegations of rape and sexual assault, allegations which he strenuously denies. Somebody that's been across this story for several days now is top showbiz journalist Stephanie Tetchy. And, Stephanie, you sat through that whole 
documentary. You popped yeah. out for a few minutes to talk to me and you've seen the rest of it. Mm -hmm. 90 minutes. How tough a watch was it? It's very tough because you're actually hearing the stories of these women and the, you know, their allegations of rape, of abuse. One was just only 16 years old when she met Russell Brand. So for her to experience how her innocence was robbed, apparently, and allegedly by Russell Brand, that's quite hard for anybody to hear, any woman or any man. You've also had allegations of rape from one American woman who says that Russell Brand allegedly raped her in his house house in LA. So to go through these journey, the journey with the people who have gone through this abuse is quite hard for anybody to watch. And, you know, for many years, as I've said, Russell Brand has been a character who's been quite honest about his flaws. It's nothing new there. But I think now hearing this and knowing that this has been, as he said, a coordinated attack where the Sunday Times, the Times and Channel 4 have worked this on a year. How, how unusual is that for more than one media organisation to, to work together? It's unheard of. To be honest, Mark, I think this is now going to be a new launching pad mm. for when people want to break these Me Too cases. You know, there's been so many stings this year. Usually it's just the media, the newspapers will sit on this. But we've had Channel 4 and we've had The Times go hand in hand with this. This is something where, you know, it makes me think, and what I've heard is that in the future this could be more comedians that will be coming out well, in well, such well, situations. Is that right? Because so, the idea that this dispatches investigation mm -hmm. by Channel 4 could go beyond yep. Russell Brand. What well, other famous comedians potentially I, implicated? I think so, because there's been a whole look at the comedy industry after mm. this. There's been a lot of female com comedians who've spoken about how they felt uncomfortable Catherine in the Ryan, industry. I think. Yes, Sarah yeah. Pascoe. There's been many people who haven't felt comfortable to name names and to open up about their experiences. And when you've got a format like this, where even the people who have accused Russell Brand, they still have an anonymity. They're anonymous, yeah. so we don't know their identities. Uh, others could come forward now. We saw that with the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be other accusers of, uh, of, of Russell Brand that could, could appear. Yes, at the end of the documentary, they've asked dispatches of asked more people to come in if they have been right. abused by Russell Brand. But I've actually heard from a woman myself who has apparently been with Russell Brand, and she's actually saying the opposite. Yeah. So, you know, I think for Russell Brand, it's going to be both a bit of a good and bad, where people will be coming out the woodwork maybe in support of him as well. He's innocent until proven guilty. And on that, we can fully agree. Stephanie, it was really brilliant to have you in the studio. One of my favourite journalists, top showbiz journalist, of course, but a political commentator as well, Stephanie Tetchy. Now, on tomorrow's show, I'm looking forward to moving on to some other topics. Anne Widdicombe will be with us with her no-nonsense newsmaker slot. Also, Keir Starmer's biographer, Nigel Cawthon. Let's find out more about this guy that would be our Prime Minister. Plus, the leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton, and former top BBC newsman, Michael Crick sparks always fly. Uh, and I can give you a little sneak preview, one of my monologues tomorrow. I'll be dealing with Theresa May, who thinks she's woke. All of that's tomorrow at nine. Headliners is next. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. 
Loads further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well, and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening. Headliners is up next. I'm Ray Addison with our latest news headlines. Our top story, the actor and comedian Russell Brand has been accused of rape, sexual assaults and emotional abuse in Channel 4's documentary Strand Dispatches. A warning for those of you watching on television, the following footage contains flashing images. Mr Brand was greeted by cameras tonight as he arrived at London's Troubadour Wembley Park Theatre for his stand-up show amid the unfolding allegations. During the show, he told audience members there were things he could not discuss. In Channel 4's Russell Brand in plain sight, four women alleged sexual assaults between 2006 and 2013 when he was at the height of his fame. Alice says that she was 16 years old when she started a relationship with Brand. Now, warning, some viewers and listeners may find the following clip distressing. He didn't care about hurting me physically or emotionally or any of it. He just was... It took me... I was like, I know that it shouldn't take you having to punch someone and to win them. To get them off you, it shouldn't be a physical fight. After that, I just said that I wanted to go to sleep, so I just like laid on one side of the bed. And then that was when he got on top of me and held like my mouth open and was just like drooling into my mouth. And I was gagging and like, try I was like trying to fight him off me, but he's laying on top of me, so I can't, like my limbs are trapped underneath him. 
Well, in a video posted online last night, Brand preemptively denied criminal allegations and insisted that his relationships have always been consensual. Midst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. Well, in other news, American XL bully dogs will not be culled. That's despite the Prime Minister's promise to ban the breed by the end of this year. The UK's top vet says an amnesty would be in place for those who already own the animals if they follow certain rules. A similar approach was taken back in the 1990s when pit bulls were banned. And finally, a second teenage boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder. That's after 14-year-old Nathaniel Shani was fatally stabbed in Manchester. Two boys aged 13 and 14 are now in custody. Police were called to the incident last night on Tavistock Square. His family has described him as very kind, caring and always thinking of others. This is GB News across the UK on television, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now it's time for our headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, the show where comedians talk about tomorrow's top news stories while trying not to get sued. I'm Nick Dixon, the People's Host, and I'm joined by two comedians you won't see on Channel 4, which turns out to be a good thing. It's Josh Howey, there he is, relieved, and Cressida Wetton in a very nice red dress. So, Don't what? what are you oh, doing? yeah, what am I doing? What am I thinking? Gee, have you not learned uh, Oh and, Josh is in a, and Josh is in a very nice whatever he's wearing. OK, that's it's completely fine. completely equal. Thank you very much. Phew. <laughs> Got away with that We're one. Be all right. It's going to be a perfectly <laughs> fine show. Mate. Are we both well, apart from just every, the stress of live TV? I don't find it stressful. <laughs> Do you find it stressful anymore? No, no, it's, it's working with you. Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> let's have a quick look at Sunday's front pages then. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse, which, of course, he has denied the Observer. Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. That's a quote, of course. The Sunday Express, million-ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. The Daily Star has The End Is Nigh, which is to do with skiving off work by citing the apocalypse. And those were your front pages. So we have the big story about Russell Brand, of course, but all we can really give at this stage are the facts. So what are those, Josh? Well, Sunday Times and uh, Channel 4 have sort of joined together to uncover... So, what well, uncovers? So there were some interviews with former people that he was in a relationship with, it seems like. And, um, and yeah, uh, with a bunch of different claims, one of them um, being rape, but uh, someone, a 16 year old who was in a relationship said he groomed her. And um, this is all between 2006 and 2013. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, there's a lot, it, there's a many, many pages of information. They, I believe the documentary is literally, whilst we were Prepare. here, mm -hmm. the documentary went out, so I haven't seen it yet, but it seems to be somewhat of a Rorschach test to people's reaction to this story. I see what well, you mean. Well, and importantly, he's denied all the allegations, hasn't he? I mean, like, yeah. I saw the video that he put out, um, and he's... He uses his hands adamant, very, very well. Yeah. Absolutely adamant that... He's denied it on his own uh, YouTube channel. All right, so what's the next story? Do you want to do this Liz Trust one? Yeah, uh, Trust to criticise Sunak's 35 billion of overspending since being PM. So I really don't feel like Liz Trust should be just getting involved. I think she should have just sort of sauntered off and take whatever her... Um, retirement would be and, and take her pension, pr Prime Minister's pension, for a month's work. Uh, but now she's criticising and basically saying that Sunak, over the two years that he's been Prime Minister, or were expected to be Prime Minister, will have spent £35 billion more. But Tory, other Tories have come out and said, well, if we'd followed some of her plans, like a flat tax, that would have basically cost us £41 billion. Let's just not forget that she cost us about £6 billion just 
in the few weeks by going with the policies that she did in terms of the, the, what happened to our guilds. So, I... Well, some people don't blame that on her, actually. Some people say it wasn't actually her fault. Some quite economic expert people, I, I don't know. I don't She's know the one it. who kicked it off, uh, and it was under her watch. She started that policy that then massively backfired. Well, some backfired. claim that it was already due to... It would already have gone that way from things that the Bank of England had already done. Though everyone seems to agree that she certainly didn't communicate very well, the, the oh, budget. Whatever. Anyway. Anyway. But the point is, why she's getting involved is ridiculous. And also that she's sort of saying, I wouldn't spend any money on anything. I'd do all these cutbacks. <laughs> it's like, well, guess what? Things happen. Like, suddenly we've just discovered... 12 years ago, that uh, there are all these schools that are falling apart and need to be rebuilt and hospitals and whatnot. They, the government has to spend money. The question is, how do they spend money? And more importantly than that, do we get good value for it? Yeah, OK. Well, Josh saying that she shouldn't be getting involved, Cassie, but she's got to do something with her time. What, what well, do you think? Well, that's it, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's like when you go to a comedy club and there's no one there and the promoter says, oh, it was full last week, you should have seen it. It's like, <laughs> it's competing with the dead, isn't it? Um, I don't know. This says it's going to reopen wounds within the Conservative Party, which is just what they need, isn't it? Um, they already seem quite open as well, don't they, at this stage? They do, so I don't know. I don't know what difference. This isn't her trying to stage a comeback, is it? No, I mean, she, she's just sort of in, she's involved with this sort of growth group, so her thing is always to talk about growth and a more thatch right approach. And the crit criticism of Sunak is always that he spends too much, but then he says, well, I'm just being fiscally conservative, and you look all unrealistic. And that's basically the debate. Probably yeah. done enough on that. Let's move on to the. Let's go back to Russell Brand. Let's do the, uh, let's do the Observer question there. Uh, Labour wants new EU links in a reset of British foreign policy. Uh, so, ties with Europe are a top priority, says uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy. Well, we sort of know that, don't we? Um, that, that Labour would like to uh, have more to do with Europe. Um, he's suggesting regular meetings, uh, and he thinks that the international community wants us back. They're missing yeah. us. Do you think Lammy's going rogue here? Because Lammy said that closer links with the EU are the number one goal, as you say. But this was before the election. Do you think Starmer's was like, wait till after the election to tell them we're going back in well, the EU, he, David? He's been very, very clear here. They're not, we're not talking not. About, about joining the EU. And all the way through the whole referendum and Brexit and all of that side, everyone, all the Brexiteers have been very clear. We're not saying that we don't like Europe. We're not saying we don't want to be friends with Europe. So it makes sense to... We're not part of Europe. We're not going to rejoin the EU. But we certainly should have good strong ties with our closest economic partner, and that's all he's saying. Economic, uh, security, and various other things. There's sure. nothing wrong with that. As he says here, uh, what, what kind of Britain are we? Are we the Britain, this little England looking inwards, or are we part of uh, global stuff? Well, we're trying to sort things out with <laughs> India, aren't we? We're busy. We've got lots, yeah, good of, old India. lots of meetings to have yeah. at but, the but moment. Be, let's be very honest, though. Do you think he will try and rejoin? Maybe, maybe it's over 10 years, because a lot of people in the what I call the extended blob uh, people I speak to in various positions, I won't reveal, but they, 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 a lot of people believe, hardcore Remainers believe that he will take us back, and it's their religious narrative. It's, it's wishful will, thinking. They, you think they, so? Absolutely. They won't. They know it's a toxic issue. It's happened now. Best we can do is make the best of it. No one, the Tories certainly haven't been able to do that. Let's get Labour in there and see if they can at least mend some fences, get some economic back and flow, and get back to some level of what we were before, if, without the EU controlling us. Over the long term, I can see the argument. I can see the argument of Labour saying, look, it didn't work. We're the people that got you back in. Meanwhile, the EU can say, look how badly they did without us. And, and then yeah, they but we never, go, we never get offered the same... We had, the deal that we had was yeah, phenomenal. So we never, we never get that one day. We I'm not saying I want this. This is what I think will happen. OK, well, let's move on and have a look at the Express then. Yeah, uh, Russell Brand denies rape... Oh, no, not that one. OK. Uh, million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. Patients forced to spend life savings to avoid record weight for treatment. Now, this is, of course, damning. Damning to the Tory government that's been in control now for 13 years. Uh, having a million people basically going... Having to go to private health care when they have paid into a system through their lives, paid into the NHS, because, they, because the queues are, are too long, people are waiting up to a year... I think is is disgusting. But there uh, is that sorry, there's, there is that argument that if you try to stop private, all you do is actually punish the NHS. You know what I mean? Because it's probably better to accept. I'm not that saying that we need to stop the private, right. but I'm just saying the fact that it's got to this kind of situation yeah. is is ridiculous. What do you think, Cressida? Well, yeah, exactly. It, it illustrates the point that we've had time and time again on this show, doesn't it? The, every, the waiting lists are longer. And, and also, you know, we've, it's this thing about the ageing population, isn't it? We've got more technology to fix more things, so the budget is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more old people to spend it on. And people aren't always looking after their health. Mm. So mm. The solution, We've got an obesity, I think. Solution, you sound like you went a bit conservative there, Cressida. You were saying the solution is personal responsibility, I could hear. No, you well, sort of, I yeah. thought you were sounding like Logan's run. 
<laughs> you just want to, people get to 39 or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they need to be killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, right. That would be. We've agreed she's going pretty far, right? Can I just say. Far right. I'm saying. Can I say, Chris, that's a beautiful dress? <laughs> And a great, uh, whatever Josh is wearing, the suit, the shirt. Um, OK, well, let's get to the really important story tonight. What have the star gone with, Cressida? Workers skiving off in fear of the apocalypse. Um, obviously, I work with Lewis Schaefer, so I thought that was quite a reasonable position um, to take. Mm. Uh, but no, apparently, apparently people, youngsters specifically... Oh, youngsters. Uh, the youngsters, uh, they're staying home because they fear the end of the world. I've had enough of these youngsters, Josh. I don't know about these <laughs> climbing off work, uh, pronouns. What are they up to, these Generation Zs? Well, that's it, Zs. They're scared of zombies, they're scared of whatever, mental they health scared issues of zombies, and whatnot. Yeah. It is a great new excuse. I have heard it. We did a story on eco-anxiety, didn't we? And mm. they're all scared about the environment, which makes sense, because the fear's been drilled into them relentlessly by yes. the mainstream media. But zombie anxiety is a, is a new one on it's me. It's a new one, yeah. But, I mean, first of all, it's good that they have jobs. Maybe this is a good way of keeping people at home. And maybe also it's a positive sign that people are more religious, that they believe in the apocalypse. Why would you want to keep people at home? Well, I wouldn't like to, but, you know, your lot always go on about it, innit? The 15-minute no, cities no. and whatnot. No, that's not my lot. No, no, oh, but, like, oh. the, the dangers of it or oh, that, that oh, people okay, are pushing yeah. it. OK, yeah. OK. I, yeah. I knew I was being insulted, but I couldn't figure out how <laughs> for a second there. All right, well, that's the Daily Star. I mean, I think we've got, given that on probably enough time. That is pretty much it for part one. But coming up, well-managed dogs and poorly managed borders. See you in two minutes. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with Josh Howey and Cressa Wetton. All very glad we're on GB News and not Channel 4. It's the best place to be. So let's continue with our stories. And the eye has 
Amnesty will let owners keep well-managed American bully dogs. But do we really need well-managed owners, Josh? I've heard that's the debate. Is it the owners? No, it's not the owners. It's the dogs, because it yeah. turns out... Let me read the headline. American XL bully ban. Chief Vet says Amnesty will let owners keep well-managed dogs. Now, this is... There's going to be a year... Um, Amnesty period, basically, where during that time, if you have a dog and you treat it well, and it's well treated and behaves well, it, 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 you can get it neutered and muzzled, and then it'll be fine. After that, um, it's it's. Go but I say that out of control dogs obviously should be well, out of control dogs should be killed now. But um, I, I just don't know why they're waiting the year. But the point is that they're saying that fifty percent of all the dogs in this country come from a dog called Killer Kimbo, who was so inbred. And it had li was linked to, and, and its offspring are linked to multiple deaths. There's just no need for this I dog. I completely that... disagree. I think this is such a sensible it's thing. It's killed ten, do ten people in this country yes, in the last they're year. They're not saying let's have this dog running around the public. They're saying because a lot of these dogs will be beloved family members. Don't pets. care. Well, I mean, this beloved is an violent excellent... family members. Yeah. I think this is a really good solution because it gives the people that genuinely want to look after their pet a bit of time to get it neutered. So I guess it means it's the end of the breed. But nobody's going to be heartbroken and trying to tell their seven-year-old the dog's gone to a farm in the sky. Um, it's, I mean, it, I, and I love regulation around pets, right? Because dogs are a luxury product. You know, some of these dogs cost a fortune. So if you can afford to have a dog, you can afford to look after it properly. And when you get regulation, you get the end to what we call greeders, who those of us that like dogs, breeders that are breeding for money. Mm. I think this is great. It gives it it's giving it a bit of exit time and, and then. So kill them all now. Yeah, you're so you're full coal now, and Cresta is like amnesty period of a year, which is what they're saying, then an outright ban. That does seem reasonable. Yeah, that's reasonable. I'd say I don't got care. I just kill them all. And, okay. and five Literally. children yeah, and, and all that lovely stuff. But some people are very emotionally dependent on their pets. And the idea that you just take them away, I mean it's a bit it's a bit much, isn't it, to take away a well behaved I don't I can't understand why people bought these dogs in the first place. Yeah. They're killer dogs, literally. It makes is, yeah. no they're sense not, to me. They're, well, they're on, for the most well, they are part. literally. This, and they're from killer, do, uh, killer, killer, Kimbo. killer Kimbo. Killer Kimbo. He was a killer. Killer it's in Kimbo. The name. But yeah, no, it, 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 I mean, I do see the point. And some people are squeamish about sort of government involvement, but there is a libertarian yeah. case for it, which is you're not supposed to harm other people. And, you know, even with your freedom can't encroach upon other people's freedoms. Yeah. So the freedom to own a dangerous dog obviously encroaches if, if it's hurting and killing people. Of course, yeah. of course. And, and these dogs that are in... I mean, I've watched some of the clips, because I sort of made myself, because I'm a bit sort of, oh, I can't imagine. And I watched them and, OK, yeah, I mean, the dogs come from nowhere. I totally accept that. Um, I'm not saying it can't be dangerous. No. And I think muzzles in public is a great idea. Yeah. Why yeah. don't we just get into that culturally? It's a brilliant idea. Muzzles for people, in well, some cases. Some <laughs> of the people yeah. that attack us yeah, on yeah. Twitter. And I, but I like that dress. Muzzle them. <laughs> and it's a nice uh, jacket. So, thank you, thank you. That, let's leave the <laughs> Telegraph then. And Labour's private school's tax raid will make education more elitist. Doesn't it sound like Starmer's Labour, Cressida? Um, no, it doesn't, does it? Uh, <laughs> Labour's private schools tax raid will make education more elitist. Um, so Starmer's talking about adding VAT, basically, to private school fees, which would raise £1.6 billion, and he's saying he can put that into state education. So he's mm. robbing the rich to pay the poor. Um, but, of course, all the schools are panicking and saying, no, don't do that, we'll lose all our pupils. Everyone will, or some people will leave. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know... I, I suppose the point is that the, the really elite people won't leave however expensive. If it is. In fact, they'll probably quite like it if it gets a bit more expensive. Ooh, um, yeah, good point. And that's yeah. it. And these people aren't necessarily rich. They're not fabulously wealthy, as it says here. It puts more pressure on comprehensives. I mean, a lot of things Labour have done have been well-intentioned, but been disasters. Like, for example, the whole comprehensive school project that replaced the grammars was done by lefties. One of them was a Communist Party member. And it was... A, it, it, it's, it's, I wish the grammar schools had never been destroyed, but, hey, I've always gone about that. What do you think of this, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a strange hill for... He's not... It's not that he's dying on it as such, but... To I just think neon. To really... Yeah, to, to fight for, because he's also saying, but I really support independent schools and what you do, but arguably it will harm them. But then at the same time, some of the fees, if they're 6,000... If you can afford the £6,000 a year, imagine you can afford seven and a half or whatever the difference would be. Um, so I, I think it's like, I'm not going to feel you're either wealthy or you're very wealthy. Mm. And well, I'm he's not, talking I about the people in the, in the seam, isn't it? Whenever yeah, you but raise they're, price they're wealthy. Of they're, you know, if you've got that kind of, uh, some of these schools are £13,000 a year or something, if you've got spare 13k a year, and you've got to pay 15 I've instead. Got, I've got that, but that's because I have no children, so that's <laughs> yeah, the paradox. That, that, there we go. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it, they need money from somewhere, and it's an easy win for Labour because it's private schools, and yeah. someone hears that on the Labour side and goes, yeah, private schools, let's take that money. But right? it is, it's a contradictory message. I don't think it's the fi finest movement. I don't think it's going to solve the country, So I, they, and it'll get a lot more publicity than it should. 
Um, and I think there are a lot of things that need to be fixed before that. OK, um, they should run with that slogan, Labour, solve the country. But, yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't think they will either. But um, OK, let's do the times then. And the number of benefit claimants too ill to work has passed a million. Why couldn't just one of those been Lewis Schaefer just spotted <laughs> <laughs> the million? <laughs> not saying I want him to get ill, I'm just saying... I just want him to not be around me. Just kidding, Lewis, really? we love you. Really? Right. I, I, love, um, I, love, I love his dresses. He's brilliant. Uh, number of benefit claimants too ill uh, to work past a million. Uh, it's jumped 300,000 in a year. So this is quite interesting because if you are unable to work, and there are some very serious conditions as to why you wouldn't be able to work, which are things like incontinence, um, and uh, not being able to be around people and mental health issues and whatever. Now, some of them are obviously medical, some of them might be. And this is, this is the interesting part, is the government seem very unwilling to go, call them skivers or anything. But the fact is that if you have this inability to work, or you, and 80% of people who go for this claim get it, you get double the amount of money. So there is a yeah. massive financial incentive to go down that route. But like I said, the government's been very clear they're, they're trying to be like, no, it's not about strivers and whatnot. We're just but trying to get... But halving your income would give you a mental health problem, wouldn't it? I think that's that a would. fair... But what they're, so what they're trying to do instead is, is sort of say, no, we don't think you're strivers, but you know what, you could work from home. You could do... I think that's yeah. how it's, the problem yeah. started, sending everybody home for two years. Well, yeah. Lockdown, drinking more, not running around. Not, I mean, no wonder everyone's got depression. And their solution is work from home, which is... Yeah, I would never call them skivers. They're scroungers is the word. It's scroungers, <laughs> everyone knows. No, I mean, look, I, I know what the benefit system's like, and it's terrible. It, the, the problem is, it is a perverse incentive, as you said. They should just make work pay. No-one's been able to crack it, ever, how to just make work pay. There was a scheme Labour had at one point where you got paid... For the first year you returned to work, you still got your benefits, and that was scrapped. Mm. Because when you're going to punish people, if, if people are in a tough situation, then they're in a kind of survival situation, of course they're going to choose what gives them the most money. It's not reasonable to expect people to go for less money. But the, but the only thing, to give the other side, I am a bit suspicious that it's, it's so many people. Can mm. that many people really be ill suddenly? That's the question. I don't well, know, but the lockdowns can't have helped, can yeah, they? But, Adding uh, body weight to people and... Yeah, no, absolutely. And what, but it's very clear, they, they don't know what, what these extra people are ill from. Particularly, long is, is it that they've expanded the definition of mental health illness, or is it, is it actual physical illnesses? Well, it includes. Well, it actually both says of us. they don't know. They don't okay. know. Yeah. They oh. don't know. They don't is know. the answer. But they've got to stop. Yeah. But it, I do sympathise with people on the benefits trap. Let's do another one in the Times and Labour are doing a deal with the EU on free movement. I feel like we've been here before, Cressida. <laughs> See what I've got Labour right would bring child refugees to be with family. So Labour are suggesting that they would offer to resettle child refugees in the EU with families in the UK as part of a migrant returns deal. Um, but Yvette Cooper is specifically saying we are not proposing joining the EU's asylum quota scheme. Because mm. um, I think we'd be looking at 120,000 people then. Yeah. And that's not good. Yes, um, and they're not looking at doing that. Now, what um, people have said is it's similar to the Dublin Convention. And actually, Darren was talking on this channel earlier tonight about the Dublin Convention. Apparently, we tried to get about 8,500 people, more than that, over to the EU. They took 105, while we took almost 900. So the, the argument is we're going to get into another similar mess like that where we actually can't get rid of people. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, conversing very small numbers, really, here. The two big things that you take from the story is, first of all, that, that as, as opposed to the Tories going, that means we're getting 100,000 people coming over. That's just not true. As, they, as the Labour said, that's just a lie. What they are talking about, and I think there's actually a clever idea, is particularly children who have family members over here being able to come over here and then allow some kind of reciprocal relationship. And the reason why that is good is because if they have family here already, it's going to cost taxpayers less. They're going to have homes set up for them. They're going to have a certain amount of support already built into because mm -hmm. of coming through their family. That makes sense. I'd rather take people who have connections to this country already and send back the people who don't, who we're having to pay for everything, that but makes more financial you, sense to me. How are you picking out the people that are going back? Well, that's not my job, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... Where, I'm going to get Leo Curse. <laughs> He's just going to get there and point at people. He would love that. Where yeah. does this uh, 120,000 figure come from, then, when it says it will require some member states to resell up to 120,000 migrants from elsewhere in Europe? Tories. But, the <laughs> <laughs> but where are they thing. getting it from? Are you saying it's like a side of the bus? Well, they're NHS looking at thing? existing EU policies, whatever, but that's not what Labour's talking about signing up to. Okay. They're talking about this very specific thing. 
Do you uh, trust that, Cressida? Because I think this is Josh, well, Josh Labour mean... propaganda a little bit. I'm not sure. It might, <laughs> it might, well, that's what the article... Right, I'm just saying what the article says. OK. Yes. Well, but the Times is also fact. Josh propaganda. It's all... It's all pop- OK, everyone's no, propaganda. I'm just telling you both sides. OK, but I, I, I didn't know where the 120,000 came from. But OK, I think we've... I think there was quite an adult discussion on that one, which is good. Okay. Let's do the I. And Iranian women are continuing to defy the hijab rule, Josh. Yeah, we won't back down. Iranian women defy the hijab rule despite arrests, beatings and rape. Uh, it's been a year since um, Nadar, uh, f- uh, d- uh, the Kurdish Iranian woman, she took off her um, uh, hijab yeah. and she was murdered, uh, then inspiring uh, a lot of protests and bravery from women in Iran. And even though those protests, even though the, 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 the onslaught that they've received from uh, their government, they are still fighting and they are still protesting, and it's incredibly inspiring. And um, it's really moving, isn't it? Yeah. Hearing some of the and you know, like she, she's talking about taking off her hijab and walking down the street and the fear that she felt. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I remember when I started to say I'm not wearing a face mask anymore, and I felt very self-conscious on the tube. You know, in the beginning when it was kind of just kicking off. And I mean, that's nothing, is it, in comparison? I'm not going to get put in prison and, and attacked for it. Um, and and eventually... nasty looks in Sainsbury's. Well, exactly, mm. exactly. That's about the limit of it. And she says, you know, we, we felt fear, but we've no other choice. And I, I just think it's really moving, and we've got a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. The only thing I've never understood is this is obviously brave, but that weird thing where people say the hijab in the West is uh, is celebrating diversity and multiculturalism. It's great, but over here it's obviously bad. I mean, it's pretty much isn't it the same everywhere, or is it context dependent? No, it's context, isn't it? It okay. Depends. Well, they have a choice. I guess it's about choice, isn't it? Yes, and over there they don't thing. have a choice. And I say, sorry, it's Mahasa Gina Amini. That was a woman who was killed and, yeah. and started all of this. And just uh, respect to these women, some of the bravest women in the world. Absolutely. That is it for part two. But coming up, mothers are erased. Women Women force their way into male spaces, and a comedian is forced to make up stories about racism. See you in a minute. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's the increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. For Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The northern hours, parts of the highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes, and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio, and online, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m., only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Sorry. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with the Times and a radical new plan to actually catch shoplifters, Cressida. Sounds like it. Uh, scan faces of every shoplifting picture, police told. Uh, so, uh, do they need to do it? I thought all these kids were putting themselves on TikTok when they were shoplifting. Um. Can't you just download that? Um, but anyway, police have been told uh, to scan every shoplifting CCTV image reported to them um, because only one in seven uh, shoplifting uh, occasions are, are being charged at the moment. So, the, the, this is the drive to investigate more crime. Um, but yeah. wouldn't you have thought that this is what they do anyway? If you had any images of, of yeah. this suspect... It's weird, isn't it? We've yeah. sort of been just letting people get away with shoplifting. Two-thirds of cases are thrown out. And then now we're going the other way, and we're just going to scan everyone's face. It's like, isn't there a happy medium? But, yeah, we already have so many cameras anyway. Yeah. I mean, what so do you think? One they use to do something with it. Yeah, sorry, police is charging someone with 4.5% of these cases. So... Uh, what were you going to say? Cumbria managed 24%. Hey! Oh, get in. Yeah. Wow. Winning again. Uh, but, again, number one is, <laughs> why is this not already in place and secondly you know why has it taken so long to even just get to this point discuss it it seems like a no-brainer of course that's what you would do is you would have these things we have all this technology now of course I appreciate there are freedom concerns um, and privacy concerns uh, but at the same time these are criminals it's usually comes down to a handful in terms exactly. of committing 90% so of these crimes a database it yeah. might help and the thing about the face is, I don't like having my face scanned when I'm in the supermarket because I haven't done anything wrong yet. Right. That's the yes. do. Why do you say yes? Well, because who knows? Um, oh, no, yeah. but I'm not planning to, but, I, yeah, these people... I mean, come on, don't you give up your right to privacy when you nick people's stuff? That's the thing. You yeah. feel... It's this kind of a narco tyranny people talk about. The innocent citizen feels constantly harassed and punished. Those mm. ridiculous cameras... Yeah, they shouldn't really have a camera when you're just buying your stuff. I don't know what that's all about. It's, they shouldn't be able to do that. But then again, we, like you said, we, London's one of the most surveilled places in the world, and yet we're not managing to get any, any yeah. shoplifters. And the, the other weird thing is now, is you, you've seen these scenes in sort of South San Francisco and places like this, people People just looting the entire store yeah. and now as we saw with this recent case if you do anything that you, you get in trouble for it the, the shopkeeper gets in trouble there's been a few cases where shopkeepers have rebelled and mm. then they're the ones that get in trouble and told they've overreacted yeah no, it's crazy and yesterday we did a story about the uh, the Iceland boss who said that they weren't allowed to share normally that's what they used to do they would have like a billboard of photos and say watch out for this person and now they supposedly yeah. are not allowed to do that because of these privacy concerns it seems ridiculous they're criminals i'm from a small town and we used to do not we not me but the pub landlords if you're a badly behaved person in the pub they'd bob you which means behave will be banned and all the landlords would have access to these photos and you couldn't drink in any of the local pubs unless you're wearing a very bright dress yes
Um, I take back what I said about Zest, but I've learned and grown since then. It was, uh, I've changed as a person, it was wrong. You said I was being sexist, right? Y yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, but I've learned and changed and grown since 10 minutes ago. All right, yeah. let's do the times. And the last male safe space is about to be violated, Josh. Yeah, the law that could get women into the Garrett Club after 98 years. So, because within their founding document it says something like, he must, if someone must, he must be proposed by another member, a lawyer who, who's obviously a member there has sort of said, well, it lays it all out, essentially, and also because uh, part of it is also they calls for gentlemanly accomplishment and scholarship. This member, this lawyer, lawyer member has um, since then, sort of, because it turns out there's some legal thing from 1925 where he could be she within contracts, they've changed their opinion and said, actually, legally, this could open us up to be sued. Um, one of the interesting things to come relating to the whole trans debate is I have come very much pivoted on this thing and think, yeah, there do need to be men's spaces. Oh, wow, I thought you weren't going to say that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I don't think this is about legal loopholes at all. Mm. It's just... It's just a cultural thing, isn't it? Eventually, it probably will... There'll be no more male spaces. And we hear lots about women's spaces, don't we? But I don't think... I don't, the, why, I mean, are, why do women want to get into male you know, spaces? I've been thinking that, reading this, I thought, who are these women and why do they want to be in there? Well, no, I mean, they want to be in there because a lot of them, it's, there's con connections, business, a lot of shady dealings or whatever it is, and women want to be part of they that. They think I it's access I think, to I think, power, yes. Yeah, and that's fair enough. There is an argument that male spaces are healthy and men don't want to go into women's spaces with some very high-profile exceptions, but the, mm. these high-profile exceptions become global talking points because mm -hmm. they're so controversial because some creeps want to get into women's spaces. Yeah. But in general, why do we want to get into each other's spaces? Men need to have their own spaces. Yeah. Play football, do whatever it is men do. Yeah. I have a football team. Men no, need to be... Know. I play football every yeah. week. There's, it's not an official ban on women in the game, but there are no women in the game. That's no, all and, I've just, and there is a difference when women aren't around. That's all it is. But I understand yes. that for women's spaces, obviously, the need is much greater because we are talking about um, sexual assault and safety, yeah, personal yeah. Well, that's space. that's interesting whatever. that you said that about power. I hadn't... I'm so daft, I hadn't made that connection. Well, we had a um, meeting about it, Nick and I, with the other blokes the other day. We did. Uh, yeah. you're, we, you're we, absolutely we right. You Warren yeah. Farrell writes about this. Men need places to go and do men's stuff. Yeah. Thank and you. And we're worried about men's mental health until it's inconvenient, aren't we? Yeah. And then it's... And that's yeah. what me and Josh were doing in the cupboard before men's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our space. <laughs> when you walked in on us, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the telegraph, then. And the General Medical Council has removed all mention of the word mothers from a staff document. So, basically, women should be allowed in men's clubs, and yet they don't exist, Cressida. Is exactly. that right? Exactly. Mm. Uh, GMC removes all references to mother from maternity documents. So yeah, you've pretty much you've pretty much just said it. And and the GMC are the General Medical Council, and they serve as the independent regulator for doctors and aims to improve medical education and practice across the UK. So that's that's reassuring, isn't it? They're the people saying that uh, that we can't use the word mother. They don't want gendered language in these documents. Mm. And but the fact is, yeah, sorry. What, well, but they're documents about, you know, women's health. About so. particular, yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. A maternity. I mean, only women give birth. That's just a scientific fact. The fact that these documents were changed in May of this year, when arguably the wheel has turned, when other NHS organisations and 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 other company, and companies as well have been criticised and been told off for make for exactly. bringing in this kind of language. Timing. It's like. How captured are these institutions that it's still happening when they when other people get exposed when it's on front pages of newspapers and they get criticised and then they still go on and they do it? I know, it's shocking. And we've had it with the menopause. It says the average age for a person to undergo the menopause in the UK is 51, so I look forward to that. Yeah, a person, you... yeah. But also it does say here people will be affected in different ways. And to be fair, men are definitely affected. We are affected. Uh, but, but it's about a... men, yet again. Yeah. Husbands. Let's, let's do the <laughs> Sunday Telegraph again. And the EHRC... It admits it was wrong about LGBT, Josh. It's a lot of anacronyms going on here. I did it. Uh, well done. Uh, trans guidance for teachers was wrong, says Watchdog. So there are two things in this article. The Equalities Regulator is basically saying, first of all, get on with it. Teachers need guidance. Publish what you have. Publish what we... They, they advised the government. They said you need to put that out there because it's very confusing for everybody. So that's the first thing they're saying. The second thing that they're saying is that they had previously advised wrong that if you weren't to affirm a child who's basically... a boy who says they're now a girl. If, you ha if a teacher hadn't gone down with that, then they could be open dis to discrimination claims under the Equality and Human Rights Act. Turns out that's not true. 
They've made that very clear now, and that was advice from 2014, but things have changed and there's been a conflation between gender and sex and whatnot, so they've been very clear now um, that, that actually you wouldn't necessarily be open up to these discrimination claims, although you would have to maybe explain why you might be doing it. Yeah, and but what's not clear to me is what the new guidance will be. I'm saying they need to rush it, it needs to go through, but I'm not quite clear what it will actually be, but it will be not that, but what will it replace it with? Cresta, what well, do you I think? think it might even be that they're going to say you can't, you can't socialize, so, what's the right term? Socially transition. Socially transition at school. So it's actually going to be banned. It's a complete 180, isn't it? That's well. I think I don't. I don't think they're going to go that far because there's a bit of infighting amongst the Tories about who's on the right side of history on this matter. Right. But certainly, parents should be the people who have control over what's going on here what's with their own me? children. So yeah, this came from the Labour Equalities Act, and no one's ever, it's always been in 13 years. They haven't undone any of these acts, and this idea they want to it seems to be a fiction. We want, they might finally, before they get out of government, do this one thing. Yeah, but this, but this one, because most of it is actually. A, a good act, but it's this, it's this conflation of gender and sex because at the time there wasn't this big issue of the... OK, well, let's quickly, before the break, do this one. The Mail, and a comedian has admitted making up stories of racial discrimination for his Netflix special. Sounds like the race grifter industry needs some, needs some new material, Cressida. Would have been a good joke if I didn't ruin it, ironically. <laughs> He's an industry all on his own. Uh, comedian Hassan Minaj admits to making up stories of racial discrimination for Netflix special, including daughter's exposure to a white powder. It's mm. pretty dark, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit like the Jesse Smollett uh, case, but it's not quite as serious. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's just having a laugh. So, essentially, uh, they've, they've looked into some of the claims he makes on stage, and obviously all comedians could embellish the truth. Some, you know, or if you're like a, a one-liner like Tim Vine, presumably it's all made up, isn't no, look, it? I don't have five kids. I'm not Jewish. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Yeah. And, like, I mean, yeah, there's comedians like Theo Vaughan. He's very good. I supported him on tour. He struggled to follow me. Anyway, he's good, but he obviously is embellishing his stories and you sort of know it's part of the joke. But the problem with this is some of them are quite serious, They're like about Jared Kushner sitting on a yeah. seat that was reserved for sort of the Saudi delegate or something, but it actually we all didn't happen. No, an imprisoned Saudi activist, but it didn't happen. And, and there's also the element of, is it adding to this racial grievance culture where he's making up instances of racism that didn't happen. Yeah, that's exactly it. He's saying that he's been a victim of racism and his excuse is, oh, well, it reveals some emotional truth. But he's talking about being sort of going up to a, um, to a girl on prom night, uh, to a house and her not being there, assuming for ra racist down. reasons. But actually, turns out they were good friends. She'd rejected his advances before that day, so he didn't turn up to us. And also, she was then engaged to an Indian man. So the idea, and it ruined her life, because yeah, of her been docked, yeah, docked, docked by this, whatever. So yeah, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound moral. But I, I, look, all comedians embellish and exaggerate and whatnot. But when it's about this kind of very serious stuff and you're holding it out to as truth. Yeah. in today's world, as reflective of today's world. I'm sorry, emotional truth doesn't cut it. Right, yeah, there's definitely a line there. All right, good stuff. That is it for part three. But coming up in the final section, the bravery of Jonathan Ross. Shoplifters film themselves stealing. And can humans survive on Mars? See you in a minute. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get into it with the mail. And Graham Minahan has praised the bravery of Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross for backing his new book, which probably means we can expect their apology in about the next half hour, Josh. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they're going to back down. Graham Minahan praised bravery of the IT crowd, Richard Ayoade and Jonathan Ross, for backing his new book about being cancelled uh, for criticising trans rights movement. Uh, Graham Minahan is, is in Ireland at the moment, uh, attending the Let Women Speak uh, event uh, with lots of um, anti uh, gender critical people oh, there protesting them and whatnot, and was asked about this because it's been a big for He released the cover of his book, and on the cover are these two very complimentary quotes from Jonathan Ross and uh, Richard Ayoade. Uh, and uh, am I pronouncing that right? Ayoade, I believe. Ayoade, sorry. Uh, I just know him as Richard. And um, a very nice man. And very funny. And but basically, yeah, that's just kicked off. And as soon as he did that, the, all these sort of trans activists are like, oh, well, he was never funny. Oh, he, he's rubbish. <laughs> I, I can't stand him. And all that. I'm very disappointed and stuff like that. And it's like, what are you do? But the but the good thing is that the more that this happens, the more that normal people see this kind of censorious behaviour. This basically this fascistic shutting down. Uh, the more and the more it doesn't affect people like Roshi Murphy, her album going to the top of the charts and whatnot. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think you know, we're, then, we're then the wheels to that turning. point, are we? Yeah. The tipping point. And uh, you can't cancel Jonathan Ross, can you? I've, I've tried. He was semi-cancelled, ironically, about the Russell Brand incident in 2008 when they with the mm. Saxgate thing. But yeah, yeah, but he didn't get cancelled, did he? He's no. here, so he's here. He knows what he's doing. I, I agree. It might be a turning point. It's so interesting because Graham has been treated so appallingly mm. Mm. that now he might be the hero because he's now is coming around. Big people are praising him, yeah. and he treated some people badly as well, which he's admitted when he was sort of a bit ideological. Mm. But but he's, yeah, he's but sort of a fascinating. He's become a pivotal yeah. figure in the like, culture war. If yeah. we can have the beginning of people being allowed to apologise and it being accepted, that's quite yeah. revolutionary. I mean, obviously. A lot of people so, know Graham from being on Headliners twice. What was that? They would know Graham Linhan from being on Headliners yeah, exactly. twice. Yeah, exactly. That's his main work. That's his main work. He also he did, did like Irish some IT some and yeah, some other stuff. But being on Headliners <laughs> twice is the big, the big one. That's the pinnacle. Well, well done, Graham, and I look forward to reading that book. Let's do the mirror. And a treasure hunter who's been looking for a gold mine for 23 years says he's getting close. I mean, you'd hope so, Cressida. You would hope years. so. But you'd also hope you wouldn't put it on the internet. Uh, treasure hunter getting close to unearthing mythical lost gold mine worth billions. Um, so this guy, Adam Palmer, for He's been searching for Slumox Lost Mine in the Canadian wilderness for 23 years. Uh, and he thinks he's getting closer and closer because he's found a sort of an abandoned old gold mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that would do it. There you go. It, might, it, might, <laughs> it might not be the one. It could just be a rubbish gold mine that didn't do very well. Oh, I see. Um, okay. He's looking for this particular one that supposedly got nuggets, nuggets of gold as big as walnuts. Tell you what, it's a gold mine. This story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, but we, we've got to cover it, apparently. Um, Josh, any thoughts on this guy? Does he also believe in a lot less monster, this guy? He, uh, pr probably, but yeah, that's been his life mission. Maybe, maybe he will turn up this gold and everyone will have the last laugh. 
But, uh, it's the, a big risk when it's 23 years of your life, isn't it? Yeah, but well. I like it. You get to the end of it, it's the Sunday Mirror, and then you get to the end. Uh, Mr. Palmer's Hunt has been televised for this documentary, soon to be released the second season. It's like, oh, so the whole thing was basically an advert. It's a puff piece, it's a yeah. doc, it's a little loud. OK, let's do the mail then. And the police are to start tracing burglars' digital footprints. You can file this on the stuff I thought the police were doing already, Cressida. Yeah. What are they doing? Of course what are they, they doing. What are they doing? Uh, High-tech police are on the trail of burglars' digital footprint that they leave behind at the scene, yes. We can't yeah. believe they're not doing this. But it, it turns out officers, uh, they, they've been told to track offenders by tracing the property they steal, such as mobile phones and cars. Oh, my. I mean, we've got a system for that, haven't we? Cars have got number plates. That helps. We can record them. What's your number plate? I'm... Oh, I do have a number plate, but not on a car. Um, oh, okay. Will they digitally not show up at your house still? I mean, they... <laughs> what's the... I mean, what is this, Josh? Well, did you know that if you visit a home that has a router, your phone will get picked up and they, the well, information... I know this because I watch lots of true crime stuff oh, on YouTube and, and these people, they murder somebody and then they go and bury them in the woods and, and all the cell phone towers are pinging okay. and that's... It's always how they get... Always caught. turn your... You, hear, you heard it here from headliners first. <laughs> turn your phone off. Yeah. That's... The, there we go. Of course, Chris, you live at sea, so it cuts off all signal and that's how you escape. Genius. But the other thing is, oh, that now they're going to make it policy where they have to turn up every time to the house. And the other thing is that they, if there is a reasonable lead, because you hear all these things or you see these things online, sorry, that quick say, um, oh, we have a picture of this guy or someone was on the bell camera or whatever it is, and then the police don't follow up. Now, if you have some tangible evidence for the police to follow, they have to follow it. Okay. Above all, they just ignored it. All right, now let's do the mail very quickly. And NASA makes enough oxygen on Mars for humans to survive, brackets for a few hours, Josh. This is huge. This is, this is like terra mm -hmm. terraforming, you know? Uh, you ever see, like, in Aliens, you, they've got those big machines when they arrive on that planet, and it's basically turning in an inhospitable, oxygenless envi oxygen environment and creating oxygen. So now they could do that. Their little uh, rover Moxie instrument there, it created enough oxygen to, for a human to survive for a few hours. But if they can do this and show it in concept that they take in the, the Mars, the gas, the carbon monoxide, and they turn that into oxygen, that's terraforming, well, essentially. So you've still got to have the stuff, the raw material. Yeah, I you've thought, got to send the stuff, I but thought this still. was big for the Titan subtypes who could go... But that wouldn't work underwater. They need to... Uh... No, but the idea is, the point is you could send these machines on a different scale to these planets it would take the indigenous air or whatever the gas, well, gas in the environment and turn it into oxygen. That's huge. Okay. See amazing. you next year on Mars. And also, there's I... a board game I play called Terraforming Mars, which I love, which is all about this. Sorry, I got very excited. Okay. I just think it's funny no. that it's such a specific no. amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But... All right, speaking of a specific amount of time, we have to go. Fair. Great oh. dress, Cresta. We've got to go. <laughs> the show is nearly over, so let's have a quick look at Sunday's front pages again. So, the Sunday Telegraph has Brand accused of rape and sexual abuse. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, he's, he's it, of course. The Observer has Labour wants new EU links in a reset of foreign policy. The Sunday Times accused Russell Brand, the sex predator who hid in plain sight. The Sunday Express has million ditch crisis hit NHS and go private. And the Daily Star with a very important story, The End is Nigh, which is about skiving off due to the apocalypse. That's it for tonight's show. Thanks to Josh and Cressida. Not Josh all the time, but at times. <laughs> Headline is back tomorrow at 11pm. And if you're watching at 5am, then stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's good night, good morning, and God bless. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry, who have your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. There's some increasing threats of some heavy and thundery showers as we move into the second half of the weekend. First, Saturday evening, though, generally lighter showers on the cards for southwest England, Wales, generally pushing towards Northern Ireland into the early hours of Sunday morning. The cloud building across the southern two thirds of the UK, so it will be a relatively mild night here, particularly across the far south of England, high teens holding up, but across the far north of Scotland, a much chillier night, two to five degrees Celsius quite widely, if not some frost in rural spots. That cloud and rain will continue to steadily progress its way northwards. The Northern Isles, parts of the Highlands are seeing a good amount of sunshine, but we'll start to see those heavy thundery showers pushing into southern England, Wales, as we head throughout the day. Some local disruption and flooding is possible. Generally, temperatures will be a notch down compared to Saturday for the southeast, thanks to an increased amount of cloud, but maybe slightly higher for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
Into Monday, this cold front will be swinging its way through. Behind that, we'll see some fresher air filtering in behind it. So still quite muggy and mild ahead of it, but eventually seeing those fresher conditions swing in. But on the cold front itself, again, really quite unsettled with heavy showers, thunderstorms and rain in the mixture and quite a blustery day for all of us on the whole. There's further unsettled weather as we head throughout the rest of the week as well, and low pressure looks like it will be staying in charge. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Good morning to you. It's six o'clock on Sunday, the 17th of September. Today, a defiant Russell Brand performs to fans at Wembley just hours after being accused of sexual assault as media bosses face questions over their handling of the allegations. The comedian denies the claims. Amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely more 20 mile an hour speed limits coming to a road near you. Wales is expanding its network of slow roads. Senior politicians say it's absolutely insane. The weekend could be ending with a bang for some of us as heavy thunderstorms and downpours move in. Join me later for the full weather details. And Aidan's got the sport for us this morning. Indeed, Manchester United booed off at Old Trafford after losing 3-1 at home to Brighton, leaving him 13th in the table. And in rugby, Wales labour to victory over Portugal in front. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Anne Diamond. And this is Breakfast on GB News. Uh, you may have noticed I wasn't here tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow. <laughs> Get it right. God, one of those mornings. You were not here yesterday. Did you not? Know? sorely missed. Oh, was I? Of Thank yes, you very much. Right. I'll what tell you where you, I was. You I was, um, I had to set the day off because I was coming, heading into London a little bit later on in the day to go to Ruth Maddox's memorial, oh. which was yesterday. Very privileged. Uh, that me and Mr. Dixon were invited. What, to was that. it? I mean, were there many stars from like Heidi High there? Yeah, there were some stars from Heidi High. One of the eulogies was given by Sue, Sue Pollard. Oh wow! You can imagine that was. It's a straight. It's it's the naughtiest stuff I've ever heard read out in a church in, for a eulogy. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, but it was a lovely celebration of her life. And the nice thing was, I only got to know her you know, in the last few months of her life, and she said she was going to come on the show. Did, and, yeah. um, so it was a, it was a, a real shame, that obviously, that, that never happened. But, but Sue, it was Sue, lovely. Sue Pollard, you were telling me earlier, she sort of fumbled in her handbag for her notes Conf and they went yeah. all over the place. They went all over the place. Yeah. So she, she filled, like a professional, mm -hmm. with, um, with a very rude little poem. The only thing, I, I suppose, when you say goodbye and, and you pay your respects to somebody who is known for her wonderful comedy acting, mm. Um, a humour is allowed, isn't oh, it? Yeah. It's not out of place. Yeah. I mean, Ruth Maddock would have wanted you to have a good time, actually. And it was lovely to, to have also a sense from her children and the grandchildren there, just how, what a wonderful mother and grandmother yes, she was. That's and how the, the real family aspect. So that's why I wasn't here, but it was a lovely thing to be invited yeah. to. Well, it's well, there you go. Nice to celebrate. Lovely so. to have you back. Oh, thank mm. you very much indeed. I was up late last night watching this dispatches program. And frankly, I should have just gone to bed. Yes, well, it's uh, across all the papers this morning, as you would expect. The comedian and actor Russell Brand uh, has been accused of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse during a seven-year period at the height of his fame. Four women have alleged sexual assaults between 2006 and 2013, whilst he was a presenter for BBC Radio 2 and Channel 4, and then, of course, an actor in Hollywood films. Others have made a range of accusations about his controlling, abusive and predatory behaviour. Well, the findings come from a joint investigation by the Sunday Times, The Times and Channel 4 dispatches. The allegations include crew members on his Big Brother spin-off programme claiming they were made to feel as though they were working as a pimp by approaching young women on his behalf and claims that he raped a woman at his Los Angeles home. Their interviews are voiced by actors in the Channel 4 programme and you may find some of this content a little bit distressing. He's grabbing at my my underwear, pulling it to the side. I'm telling him to get off me, and he won't get off. Like, holding me up against the wall, pushing himself in me. He grabbed me and got me on the bed. I was fully clothed, and he was naked at this point, and he held me down, and he was just aggressively trying to, you know, me. I was like, oh my God, he raped me. He um, forced his penis down my throat and I couldn't breathe. It was just choking me. I was crying and he said, oh, I only want to see your mascara run anyway. 
I phoned and somebody asked what it was regarding and I said, that's regarding Russell Brand being a sex offender. Well, on social media, Brand has denied utterly the allegations and said his relationships have all been consensual. This is what he said on Twitter on Friday evening. Midst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. Well, let's talk to our showbiz reporter, Stephanie Tetchy, who's here. Morning, Stephanie. Morning, Stephanie. These are very yeah. serious claims being made. It is. As Russell Brand said there, he's always been transparent about his, his attitude towards sex and the amount of women he's seen over the years. That's not a shock. What has been shocking now is hearing the side of these four women and the claims that they are making against Russell Brand. Having been in the showbiz industry for a long time, I've never seen a sting like this, an operation where we've had a newspaper and dispatchers come together because they've been working on this for the past year, gathering all this evidence. Much Not many people knew about it. So they've definitely done it in a different way. Russell Brand rightly so came out with this video because he had right of reply, but he's known about this for the past eight days. So he knew that there was going to be a storm brewing in public. But for Russell Brand, it's been business as usual. He performed out a sold out gig in Wembley yesterday, arrived a bit late. He was an hour later. Some people say he was a bit flustered on stage more than usually he might be. Um, so for Russell Brand, he's determined to fight these allegations. But they have been horrific to hear the side of the story of these women. Yes, and of course, we have to remember innocent until proven guilty. Yes. Um, and last night will have felt to some people like trial by media. And I think... And it sort of reminds me of the time... Oh, pardon me, I've got a squeaky chair. <laughs> it, it sort of reminds me of the time when the BBC sent helicopters mm -hmm. to spy in on Cliff Richard's house mm -hmm. while it was being raided by police, in that people are going to make up their minds. But actually, what we heard last night was only one side of the story. It was very one-sided and it was very dramatised. You know, I think usually there's a bit of respect if, if the newspapers are going to break, break such stories where they might put it in the newspapers and leave this. This was coming into people's homes and they've been working on this, as I said, for the past year. So they've had a very long time to present a very well put together case. Um, but Russell Brand is not someone to take these things lying down. Um, he's been very, very transparent about all of his addictions. He's very much a dark character, but over the past few years, he's transformed himself. He's become almost a cultural activist and he's actually been someone who's actually been supporting women's rights. So this is why it's at odds, because I feel like they were portraying an old Russell Brand between 2007 and two, 2006 and 2013. But these are still accusations oh, yes. which people are going to... Maybe police are going to have to investigate. Well, I was going to say, this is, this is where it, it does become difficult. As Anne said, trial by media in mm. that, you know, the, these are very serious allegations, but what we aren't seeing at the moment, at least, is a police investigation. Well, I can imagine that they were watching last night and, you know, we've had some damaging claims of rape, grooming. One of the accusers is just 16... was 16 years old when she met Brand. So for her to be talking about that turmoil, people are always ask, why now? Why do you want to speak now? Mm. And she feels that no 16-year-old should be managed to be groomed by a man in, her, in his 30s. So she's calling for changes to be made. There's accusations of when Russell Brand was at the BBC where, and when he was at Big Brother having these kind of control over women. So there's going to be questions about duty of care, which we've seen previously on yes. the Philip Schofield case <clears throat> and on the Hugh Edwards thing. So beyond these cases, there's always that bigger question of duty of care and who knew what. Yes, because yeah. it's one thing uh, for him to say these relationships were consensual and they happened at home mm -hmm. or something like that. But then there's a whole other issue yeah. of things that he is alleged to have done absolutely appalling behaviour yeah. that he's alleged to have made mm -hmm. whilst he was at the BBC, yeah. in studios, whilst he was at Channel 4, yeah. in studios. And that brings in a whole new, as you said, yeah. the question of duty of care of those particular um, institutions. 
And I think, you know, from watching last night, it was almost Russell Brand was portrayed as a martyr. And that's the problem with these kind of situations. You realise, how did someone get away with this kind of behaviour for so long? But it's not surprising to the public. I think, as I've said, Russell Brand has written it in books extensively. You know, he's had a very abusive past. His father used to take him to brothels to sleep with prostitutes. So what? he's always, you know, he's a dark and sordid mm. character. So it's not a surprise, and that's why I think maybe 